Hello. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Can you see my screen just fine? It should be showing you and Bindi right now. Yep, I can okay. see it. Mm -hmm. Bindu should be joining shortly and then we'll start opening the actual webinar and we can begin very soon. Sounds good. Hey, Kim. Hi, Peter. Hi, Good morning. Morning, hey. Thanks for coming. Kim, can you hear us? Yes, I can. So we're in a practice session. What does that mean? No one's allowed in, but it's right now. I'm just setting up everything else. Okay, you probably should start allowing people in. Yeah, doing it right now. I'm just making sure everything's up. You're seeing my screen, live stream is up, okay. Yeah, because people try to, you know, we need five minutes otherwise to get started. Get starting. Okay. So thanks again, Peter, for joining. And, sure thing. Uh, so uh, see so you, you I know you do your podcast so um when does that happen usually uh, which day because I want to I want to refer to it We're in season 2 now and we release episodes every Wednesday Wednesday okay got it Thanks everyone for coming. We're going to be starting in five to 10 minutes. We've always debated what to do at this like phase. Should we like play some music or what have you? But it, you know, there isn't anything obvious to do. Yeah, depending which time zone people are sending in from, they're all still busy grabbing their coffee and so forth. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, I think in the mornings we have quite a few people from both Europe and India, and I think as oh, the, time goes on, oh, then it's we'll later in the day. <laughs> it's later in the day, exactly. Here is a nice mix. Somebody's actually recommending that we play some YouTube. <laughs> Maybe we should. Opening a random link is dangerous. <laughs> so
So which part are you located in? In the Bay Area or uh, I guess you're in Berkeley, yeah, so I'm, Berkeley here, right? Yeah, I'm in Berkeley. And Covariant itself is in Emeryville. Ah, close by. Are you guys back at, in the office? Um, mostly. Okay. Um, I mean, a lot of things can be done from home, but a lot of things with <laughs> real robots can not oh, be done true. from home you have either. To have it. Yeah. So yeah, you kind of need to run real experiments <laughs> a lot of the time. Oh, yeah, and these industrial robots, you can't just put them in somebody's home. They're just <laughs> a little too big and powerful. <laughs> How big is your robo? Home. Like, uh, is there a warehouse or something? Or like some sort of, a, what is it called, a lab? Well, our office has a lot of robots, yeah. I mean, okay. I think at this point, close to half of our office footprint is robots. So, yeah. Wow. So the engineers are interspersed between the robots or, or in a different, <laughs> different like room? Well, I mean, it, it's actually, it's one big space. So I it's see. good because you're always aware that we're working with robots. You can never uh, forget about it. <laughs> oh, wow, that's pretty but, cool. But um, there's still like a zone with robots and a zone with people. I mean, it keeps it, uh, I mean, the robots do make a good amount of noise, it turns out. I see. Like, if you sense. have it robot with suction cup which is quite common for, for many applications suction cups are you know i wouldn't say they're super noisy but you know they do generate a decent amount of noise so um it's nice to be not right next to it at all times so i guess it feels like a factory space that's really cool yeah so hey everyone thank you for joining we're going to be starting in two to three minutes How about you, Bindu? What, uh, are, are you we? located in San Francisco or? San Francisco, yes. And we're, uh, you know, we're all software. We're all fully remote at the moment. And we started as a, a, a San Francisco only company. We are now, I think, in six locations. Got it. Uh, and the most interesting one has been Athens. We just had someone join from Greece. And, uh, you know, oh. I, I was never a believer in remote work. And now I've become religious about remote work. <laughs> Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, yeah, I personally think, I mean, it depends a bit on what you're building with robots. I think it's just, it doesn't well, that's really not possible. work, yeah, but I mean, yeah, if I it's all software only, I think, you know, it really depends on the type of people, honestly. And I think it's nice to have some companies be remote, some companies be non-remote and different people can really, you know, find, find the culture. Whatever works for them, them, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Okay, I guess maybe we should get started. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I know you guys are uh, dialing in from various different places. So thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, coming, especially the ones who are coming in from uh, you know, other parts of the world. I see Argentina, Canada, India, Pakistan. So fantastic. Uh, uh, let's get started. Uh, so hey, uh, my name is Bindu Reddy. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the CEO, co-founder of Abacus AI. I think a lot of you have probably come to one of our events in the past. So if you are coming back, welcome back. Uh, if you're new to one of our events, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, State of the Art is a conference which has a handful of sessions. Uh, we, uh, we hope to talk to kind of uh, thought leaders in the industry uh, and in academia and talk about some of the interesting kind of, uh, uh, you know, the topic du jour um, in some ways with various different people. Today, uh, just to kick us off, we have none other than Peter Abiel. I'm super excited to have him. Uh, I, uh, you know, I, I got to know about Peter Abiel uh, the first time when I actually got interested in um, how deep learning can do multiple different uh, tasks. Uh, he, along with another person, Sergey Levine from Berkeley, as probably some of you know, wrote the seminal paper around m model agnostic me meta learning. So, uh, Peter, welcome. Thanks for having me, Bindu, and uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. That's great. Okay, so a little bit more of an intro uh, uh, to Peter. For those of you who don't know him, he's a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at Cal. Uh, he's also uh, the director of, a, of the Berkeley Robo Learning Lab and the co-director of Berkeley AI Research. Uh, he's 
also found time to actually uh, start a company, which is a pretty interesting, innovative company in the space called Covariant AI. I'm sure he'll tell us a lot about uh, his company as well. Uh, so, uh, Peter, let's uh, kick us off with uh, telling uh, telling us a little bit about how you decided to choose this career. I know you wanted to uh, uh, like kind of drop out after your master's, but you chose to stay on and do a PhD. Peter also happens to be the first PhD student coming out of Andrew Ning's lab. So tell us more about what got you here hmm. yeah so actually i grew up in belgium and uh towards the end of my undergraduate in belgium of course as anybody when you're about to finish your undergrad you got to find out what you're going to do next in in your life and and for me it became pretty clear that artificial intelligence is what i wanted to do that to me just seemed like the the most interesting possible topic i thought other topics were very interesting too like neuroscience but it just felt like Neuroscience was so hard to make progress on, and AI seemed just like more amenable to making progress. And so I thought AI, the combination of amenability to progress and how interesting it is, that's what I want to do. And so I started looking around and I found that, at least at the time, there wasn't so much going on in AI in Europe. Uh, as I started looking around, I saw you know the places where it was really happening at the time, and, and luckily it's drastically expanded since, but at the time, it really came down largely to just a handful of places in the US. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to, to get to do my master's at one of those places at, at Stanford. And so I did my master's there working with uh, actually Daphne Kohler, um, who was my master's advisor, who has had quite the illustrious career in, and um, currently is working on AI for, for drug discovery. And towards the end of my master's, I, when I left Belgium, I thought I'm going to do my master's. I'm going to learn a lot of things about AI. And then I'm going to come back to Belgium, do my PhD in AI here, because I'll have seen all the different things. And, and then, you know, I'll have the context to do it here. But after I had been at Stanford for, you know, even just a couple of months, it became pretty clear that just the, the energy, the dynamic, the kind of people present there uh, that work in AI was just, it was just a different world. And it was just very clear that if I, you know, if I were to go back, I, there's no way I could achieve the same things. Like it, it's just the environment at Stanford would be just so much better to to achieve bigger things in AI than if I were to go back. And then I had this really lucky coincidence because as I transitioned from master's to PhD, Andrew Ng just finished his PhD at Berkeley and he joined Stanford as a professor. And so, I mean, this is just a fresh professor. Yeah. You might think like, why would you work with a, with a fresh professor, a very little experience? But I knew from all the professors at Stanford and other places that I had seen interact with Andrew, talk about Andrew, Andrew was the next big thing. It was just like, he, he was, you know, the most important person graduating with a PhD in AI in, in a long time. And I thought, well, you know, this is gonna be amazing. This is clearly who everybody thinks is the big next person in AI, and I can see them build their lab from zero to, I mean, it, it's just, I mean, I think nobody could imagine how <laughs> everything he would be he would be doing. It's absolutely phenomenal. But to me, that was just so interesting to get the opportunity to work with him from, from day one, first day he arrived at Stanford, I could, I could start working with him. And actually in the first year, there was only two or three students working with him. So actually we, we, we could get time with him Anytime we, we, we wanted to chat with him about something, it was just absolutely amazing. That's great. Fantastic. I mean, it feels like uh, you had an eye for picking the right things all the while from Stanford to Andrew to uh, AGI. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so, uh, you know, I, for those of you who don't know, Peter actually was at OpenAI. I mean, everybody is always curious about OpenAI for so many reasons, as you probably know. So tell us a little bit about like the inside story there. Like what made you go there? What made you then decide to leave and then join and then start Covariant? Yeah, so to, to connect the dots here a little bit, during my PhD at Stanford with Andrew, it was a time where I would say, the core of machine learning wasn't making as much progress as it was making today. And so most people working in machine learning, including myself, would work on a combination of machine learning with something else. So Andrew and I, together, we worked on machine learning in the context of robotics, combining machine learning with 
state-of-the-art advanced control techniques. In our case, we applied it to, to helicopter flight to do extreme helicopter acrobatics. But that, that was that was kind of the, the, the style of work we're, we're doing at that time. I think around, and, and that was quite general that, I mean, that work is also what got me to professorship at Berkeley, um, where I started the robot learning lab, which in the early days was really all about a combination of what can machine learning enable in robotics in combination with existing robotics techniques to together achieve something that neither can do alone. But I would say around 2012, the, there was a real shift in the field. And for some people, that's maybe even before they got started in the field. But for me, that feels like quite into my career. All of a sudden, 2012, a big shift. There was a big ImageNet moment. Jeff Hinton and his students at Toronto showed that, hey, all what people have been doing in computer vision, which was also combining computer vision expertise with machine learning, can actually be superseded mm -hmm. by pure machine learning, a new type of machine learning, deep learning, training very large neural networks. And the idea and the reality was that with deep neural networks, the data can speak for itself. You don't code things in by hand. The data tells you what it is. And if you have enough data and enough compute to process the data, set up a large enough neural network the right way. And back then that was hard to do, very hard to do. I mean, nobody could do it except for <laughs> Jeff and his students at that time, of course, then they shared how they did it and so forth. I think that was a real tidal shift for me at least in terms of, okay, it seems like there is an opportunity here to really advance the core of machine learning, specifically deep learning, to take it to a whole other level. And that, that is very different from saying, what can we do by, by combining existing machine learning and existing optimal control and so forth to get new results? And so that was the big first shift for me, 2012. And in my lab at Berkeley, we shifted to essentially revisiting reinforcement learning. We had worked on reinforcement learning a lot before. We'd actually been pretty quiet on it in the last couple of years leading up to 2012. But then we're like, okay, with these deep neural networks, maybe that allows us to revisit reinforcement learning and get it really right or, or more right than we could before. And so that's of course the field of deep reinforcement learning, which at the time DeepMind in London was working on very hard as well as my lab at Berkeley with Sergey Levin, who you mentioned, John Schulman, Chelsea Finn, Rocky Dwan, and so forth. And so there was these two relatively small groups, my lab at Berkeley and then DeepMind, which was small at the time, obviously big now and, 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 and so forth. But at the time it was you know, 10, 20 people. Um, and there was these two places where we're both thinking we can actually get deep reinforced learning to do things that were not possible before, before we, we understood maybe how to get deep learning to work. And so what happened from there is that there was this progression where there was these two places where a deep mind largely focused on games at Berkeley, largely focused on robotics to get agents to learn from their own trial and error. And that progression um, led in some sense to a very, I mean, it was, re it was really fun because it was just like very rapid progress compared to anything that was happening before. And the same thing was of course happening in computer vision, natural language processing, there was this you know, real acceleration in progress across many domains. And so to your question about open AI, of course, so what happened is um, at the time, you know, DeepMind had their, their big results, first Atari in 2013, AlphaGo in 2015. And so at the time, there was some talk about, you know, may maybe a new lab should be started in Silicon which is not Valley, Google, so, right? <laughs> say it again. I said, which is not Google. <laughs> not, not, not Google, yeah. A new lab yep. that is really focused on making sure as AI is progressing that it's for the for the good of the world. And of course, this 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 turned into you know open AI, but before it even existed, I mean the the founders of OpenAI were talking with each other about what is it that you know, we need to do how to make sure AI is going to be for good if it's going to be so powerful. And this, of course, was uh, Greg Brockman, who was the CTO of Stripe at the time, left Stripe to do this. Um, Ilya Siskiver, who was one of the students of Jeff on the original result and many of the big results since. Um, he was at Google at the time. Sam Altman, the, the president of, of Y Combinator at the time. Elon Musk, which, I mean, need no introduction. Um, I mean, 
that was the, that was the the leadership in some sense but from the early days they, they said okay we, we need to somehow recruit experts in the space and today there are more experts still it's, it's scarce but back then the number of experts is very small because deep learning was so new yeah. and there was only a few labs in the world where phd students had been working on this and so one of the things they did they came to berkeley right and they said, okay, well, they want to understand, you know, what's going on at Berkeley, who, who are the people doing interesting work and so forth. And one conversation leads to the other. But actually, one of my students, John Schulman, who was the, the main driving force between most of the deep reinforcement learning work in my lab, he decided to become a co-founder of OpenAI as he, as he was about to graduate. John, and then same thing, Andre Karpathy from, from Stanford, Wojcik Zaremba from NYU. Dirk Kingma from Amsterdam. And so those were the founding researchers. And, and John being my student, and we've been working together for five years at that point. I mean, he was like, he, looked, he told me about it. He says, you know, th this is what's going to happen. We're going to found this new company. This is the mission. And we're building this, this team that's really um, an amazing team, you know. And, you know, he said, essentially, look, you know, probably would be really fun for you to, to, sp to spend some time here because this is going to be such a, such a dynamic, you know, yeah. creative place. And I went to visit a couple of times and I was like, yeah, John, you're right. I mean, I cannot imagine, like any time I visited in those early days before I was even, you know, officially announced even, like any time I visited, I was just like, okay, this place is just the amount of creative energy here it's hard to imagine spending my time anywhere else. Like th this is where the best ideas are being created. And I, I just want to be part of this. And, you know, there was just a really good fit be between my expertise and, and what, what they were going for. So from there, just, yeah, spent two years there. Girl, oh, fantastic. I mean, that is a really great story. It almost reminds me, this might be an exaggeration, but I don't think so. It's like the founding of the country or something, <laughs> when all the founders of the country got together. Like, you guys are all very famous, right? And then imagine all of them coming together. I no wonder OpenAI is what it is today. Uh, but uh, that sounds super exciting. Uh, and uh, also, it also speaks to how kind of close-knit the community is right and how collaborative everybody is which is fantastic i find you know i find that that's one of the greatest things about uh, what has happened over the last few years has been that uh, companies even aren't like so closed i mean everything gets published things are like you know things are actually much more collaborative uh, so tell us a little bit about you know uh, i at least have been very fascinated about the idea of uh, actually models doing multiple different things at the same time you know we over at abacus uh, do some deep learning but all our, our models are very kind of task specific we train a model for a particular task and then that's what uh, that's what happens today right and everybody is thinking that okay in the future sometime there is going to be this fantastic human like ai and the humans of course can do multiple different things i feel like uh, you and a couple of others uh, in the industry have been pioneers when it comes to this universal ai sort of thing so tell us a little bit about that what do you think uh, uh, about the technology today how far are we for uh, from something like that it could be that we're already there so tell us more hmm? yeah i mean I'm obviously fascinated by by systems that are ever smarter and smarter and smarter. And I think as you look at the spectrum, you start from, especially if you think in the context of robotics, you start from robots that are pre-programmed to do a fixed set of motions, right? Or maybe pre-programmed to react to a certain sensory activation to then do a, a specific motion. From there, you can start introducing learning to have, I would say, specialist robots that know specific tasks really well, that now, let's say, can see. Yeah. And that's actually, I mean, that's a very recent thing. And, you know, the vast majority of robots in the world doesn't have a camera, right? They, they are just blind robots. I, I would say probably 99 point something percent of the robots in the world are blind. They don't, they don't see, they just repeatedly do the same thing. And so it's super clever what people do to make that work, but it's very limiting. I mean, when you think about robots building cars, you're like, wow, that's amazing. I mean, they do amazing things, super precise and so forth. But it's kind of pretty much, if you look at the where the robots are, that's pretty much where they are. They're doing these repeated motions to build cars and electronics, and they don't really go anywhere else because they need to be able to see. And so that's the big new thing, robots that can see, 
But initially you could think about, well, a robot I can see to solve one specific task, but the real future of course is robots that are very general and more general AI systems are very general that can pick up on a new task quickly and acquire that new skill almost instantly. Because to me, when, when I think about, when I think about AI, I kind of think about two big things for my own motivation. One of them is just this fascination with, you know, humans have this thing, this intelligence that is so flexible, so general, you know, how is that possible? Can we understand that? And can we understand it by engineering something that's, that's similar? And the other part of course, is if we can do that, the impact is, is tremendous because it can come help out in, in so many different places. Yeah. And so when I think about, you know, the, the gold standard of, of building AI should be something really, really flexible, even though many applications today, you know, something specialist might just be the right thing to do because ultimately you're building an application to help somebody today, right? But research-wise, I think the generalist version of AI is, is the most exciting. And it's also most challenging because you, you somehow have, your system has to absorb a much wider range of things. It can't just like absorb this one type of data, one type of concept and, and call it done. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really excited about multitask learning, meta learning. And especially, I mean, uh, as, you, as you see some of my, my recent papers, I'm really excited about starting with self-supervised or unsupervised learning on very open-ended data sets. In my case, it often be visual data sets because I think of robotics as a natural application, but you see similar work happening, of course, and, and happened actually earlier in language where, you know, train on so much text out there and actually open is the pioneer of this, train on so much text out there that you have this general base of knowledge and then you can learn something else quickly for me the counterpart, when I think about robotics, the future of robotics is you train on so much video that your, your robot just, by having been trained on so much video of what happens in the world, just starts understanding how the world works. Because the only way you can understand what's happening in those videos, if you're forced to predict possible futures, you have to understand that there are objects, the notion of objects. You have to understand that there is a 3D in the world and that things can get occluded, but then become visible again when they come out on the other side. You have to understand so many things about how the world works to be able to predict possible futures that by forcing the neural net to do that, I believe, and we're seeing a lot of preliminary results for this, of course, even though there is no, I would say there is a home run result yet like GPT two or three has been in, in language, right? I don't think there's a counterpart of that yet, but I think we see signs that, you know, we're making progress towards having a video version of that, which you can turn, can really empower a lot of visual and then for me, especially robotics applications from there. Wow, that would be fascinating, a GPT-3 for video, and I have no doubt it's coming. I mean, also, I mean, generally in terms of the science behind this, it, it you know, what is it telling you? Like you, you know, you, you're you obviously deep in this. And to me, I mean, I'm not obviously someone uh, who's reading this, but uh, uh, not as deep as you are. It feels like things are collapsing, meaning like the pattern, I mean, the same kinds of technologies can be applied for language and video and so on. So it almost seems inevitable that we're gonna have this GPT-3 for video and that's gonna be like very aha, right? How do you think about that? Hmm. I, I think I think it's real interesting the way you put that. It's, it feels like things are collapsing. Of course, collapsing can have a negative uh, oh, connotation. Right. In a positive way, hopefully. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I would maybe think of it like things are converging okay. onto on the same kind of um, the same kind of tools, which is which is a really good observation, right? And I think deep learning really started that, right? Back yeah. in 2012, the original versions of deep learning, of course, were not as converged as we are today. Back then, the deep learning for NLP was wildly different yeah, from the deep learning for vision and for speech, for reinforced learning slash robotics. It was all quite different. And now you're absolutely right. Um, what we're seeing is that these new architectures, the transformer architectures, mm -hmm. seem to be more general. And to me, that's super fascinating because th there are these, these studies, right, of, of the human brain where um, a blind person I mean, when, with, with most people, when you go from person to person, you can find that roughly the same region in the brain does the same things, right? 
And so roughly the same region for you and for me, we'll do our visual processing. But then for a blind person, that region might end up repurposed to do other types of processing. And so that's a proof of concept in some ways that our brains, or at least the brains of the people that, that they observe this with, but, but likely it's, it's, it's true for other people too, that our brains are very flexible, right? And so to me, it's really exciting to see this happen with, with the transformer architectures, because what you see is a single architecture, and this might not be the final one. I'm not saying this is the final one, but we see that we are now with an, we found an architecture and we, I mean, obviously the original paper was out of Google. I'm not including myself into, into figuring that out, but as a community, we, we found an architecture that is really general. Um, and it's, 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 it's fascinating that, that we've gotten to that stage. Um, and who knows where it goes from here, but it's definitely this, this coming together of, of all the different fields. Um, and actually it also gives me a lot of confidence that we can actually combine a lot of things. If you think about, you know, learning video prediction models to aid robotics, well, we can actually learn language prediction models to aid robotics because at the higher level of abstraction, you maybe don't need the video. The video is to get the details, right? You know, if somebody says chop vegetables and then put them in the pot, that's the higher level recipe that you can actually just get from language as long as you also have some video somewhere that tells you what it means to chop vegetables and what it means to put them in the pot. Um, but then once you have had enough, of, enough of that video, you don't need to see every sequence of activities. Language is essentially the compressed version of that once you understand wow. the visual motor part. Wow, okay, I, I'm, we're, uh, I'm sure uh, lots of exciting things happening. now. You run a company, Covariant, and I'm sure mm -hmm. at Covariant you have what I'm going to call revenue pressure, at least a little bit. We've got to make some money, right? Uh, and uh, uh, what, what about the practical applications today? I mean, I know the Covariant AI or the Covariant brain also, you know, the intention there is to use things like deep RL or deep imitation mm -hmm. learning. Uh, it seems like, I mean, like, so for someone like me starting a robotics company, I'd be like, okay, what can be applied today pragmatically in the world? And that's probably very specialized, right? So how do you balance those two? And first of all, um, I mean, are, are you guys thinking, no, we're not going to do specialized learning. We're always going to think about something in the meta learning context or the generalized learning context. Huh? Yeah. Th I mean, those are exactly the kind of questions we, of course, uh, asked ourselves as we're getting going. Um, so what happened is, in late 2017, um, for me, it became kind of clear that this, this was the right time okay. to start transitioning all this research progress, actually in many domains, <laughs> a lot of research progress in AI could be transitioned into applications, right? And it was a really good time to think about starting companies. Of course, I, I didn't want to start multiple, but you know, it was a good time for people to think about starting companies rather than just continue to stay focused on pure research at all times. And so to me, of course, having a long history and, and passion for robotics, to me, it was the right time to say, okay, this is the time where we can take all these recent advances in deep learning for robotics and start building applications that are completely different from the existing robotic automation that's out there. And so at the time, actually, you know, I actually sent, sent a note to all my students. Um, I said, hey, I think it's, it's the right time to you know, transition some of these things. Of course, keep inventing. We can't just transition. We need to kind of keep pushing forward, but the time is right to, to build on what's there and, and then push with a, an application in mind. And turns out two of my students replied to me, uh, Rocky Dwan and Peter Chen, who ended up being uh, you know, co-founders of Covariant. Peter became the CEO and Rocky the CTO. And they said the two of us have been talking about that among the two of us. Like we, we've been talking, okay, this seems the time to do it. So we're curious to compare notes. What do you think would be you know, the, the right way to build a company? What would make this you know, the thing that, that you want to do versus what we want to do? And it turns out we were just really well aligned. Maybe no surprise because, I mean, PhD students get to choose which professor they work with. And typically you work with a professor you're, mm -hmm. you know, you have a natural alignment with and so forth, but you know, they replied. And, and I mean, I was super happy because I mean, they were just absolutely phenomenal PhD students. In fact, they were in parallel to doing their PhD. They had been recruited into OpenAI 
Peter, before he even started his PhD and Rocky, and you know, a couple months into his PhD, back when OpenAI just had 10, 15 people. So it was just like top recruits across the world in even the early days of their PhD. So absolutely phenomenal. I'm like, wow, that one, I think it's the right time. Two, I get this opportunity to do this with these two just best possible AI researchers that I can imagine working with. We just, we just got, got to do this, right? And so when we started thinking about the questions you're talking about, right, Bindu, it's, it's like, okay, building a company means thinking about bring it into the real world. And so the first question is, what does that mean to bring it into the real world? Bring robots into the world. Um, what can it do? Like if you think about a general robot, it could do anything. Like if you had a purely general robot, that could, you know, it could do any physical thing anywhere in the world. But we're not there. We're not there that we can deliver on that kind of capability. N nobody is, obviously. I mean, yeah. if anybody were, we would see the robots all know around it. us. They'd be yes, you know, know loading and unloading our dishwashers. They'd be cleaning our houses. They'd be maintaining our yards. They'd be doing everything for us, right? So th that that's that's still the future. But we're thinking, okay, what can we do in, in the near future to build a business around? And so the first thing we did, actually, we said, let's just spend time investigating markets. And so in the first half year of Covariant, I met, together with Peter Chen, two of us together met with 200 companies. Okay. Listening to them, understanding if you could get a smart robot. So not a repeated motion robot, the kind of you know, existing category of, of robotic automation, but a smart robot, one that can see, react to what's in front of them, do the right thing. What would you want that robot to do? And we talked with car manufacturers, um, hotel chains, uh, farming, uh, you know, equipment companies, um, construction companies. Um, we thought about home applications, like literally anything you can think of. We had conversations with the relevant people. And to us, it was very clear. After those conversations, logistics and warehousing is where there's the combination of people are asking for things that we think we can deliver. And they want it now, not in the future. It's not something where they're like, we'd love to get a demo set up in our innovation lab. And then we'd love to show it to our CEO and inspire our CEO. And they would be like, if you can deliver this, Today, yeah. we want it now. And so that was a very different feel we got. Now, of course, everybody would say, you know, if you can have a complete human level like robot, you can deliver it today. But they were asking for what seemed to us very advanced yet realistic things for us to deliver and they wanted it sooner rather than later and so to us after three to six months of investigating the space it was clear that's where we're going to go at least as, as the first place we always kept in mind once we go to one place if we do really well we can of course expand but we want to focus on one area first and then very interestingly we were we, the first thing we thought about okay we we see all those facilities and e-commerce is growing so fast and that's a big driver. And we're like, okay, we should probably do, let's say returns processing. That seems pretty hard. Nobody else is gonna come <laughs> get anywhere close to being capable of doing that. And they'd say, yeah, if you can do that, that's great. But they'd also say, well, actually, um, if you could do a pick and place, that's the first thing we need. And we'd be like, oh, pick and place. You know, that, it seems other companies that already exist that are, are thinking about this. Um, you know, wh why another company doing that? But then something really interesting happened at GTC in 2018. So four years ago, GTC was, is happening this week, actually, NVIDIA's GTC. Knapp was there. Knapp is a big warehouse automation company. They provide conveyors, robots that do the transport of things in the warehouse and storage and retrieval and optimized storage and, and so forth, right? And their some of their engineers were there and they came to me there after I gave a talk about progress in, in robot learning. And I said, if you can do all this, can you do pick and place? And I said, you know, I think, yes, we, we could do pick and place, but there are other companies, you know, we, we want to do something that other people are not doing yet. Andrew, yeah. And, and they said, they're trying to do it, but we've, we've tried the solutions that exist on the market right now. And this might be a harder problem than you think. Um, if you think you can actually do it at the reliability that's required to deploy in the real world, which is very high reliability, I mean, show us and we want to partner with you 
because we can't find it anywhere. It, it's just not reliable enough. It, it's good enough to do demos. Okay. It's good enough to have it's a 30 second video. Consistent. Yeah. But it's just like self driving. You know, yeah. we've seen yeah. self driving demos for 10 years longer, but seeing a 30 second, five minute even demo doesn't say anything about the viability. It says that, you know, it's at least not really bad, but it doesn't mean it's viable. And so the same thing here. And that conversation really drove us into concluding that, okay, we should prove out reliable pick and place for any kind of item in a warehouse. Take it from one bin to another or from a bin, scan into a shelf or from you know a conveyor belt, scan onto another conveyor belt, but a very general solution to pick and place. That's what we need to focus on. And that's what we've been focused on. It turns out to be a very, very rich problem with so many applications in the real world if you can do it reliably. And so doing it reliably is really, when, when I think about you know what makes Covariant unique, is the level of autonomy that we're able of achieving mm -hmm. in pick and place. Like we're capable of doing this at a level that is so high that it creates real value for our customers. And I'll admit, it took us longer than I thought it would. Like we had a demo up and running pretty quickly, but to get to, we put 99.5% as the level you need to be at to, to call it viable in terms of autonomy. To get there, I mean, it took us a couple of years to get to that level. We had to do a lot of internal research that we don't share the details about because it's our secret sauce that we know how to do this better than anybody else. And, you know, it's a hard problem. And it's so funny because a, a three-year-old can do pick and place, um, but, a, you know, and a three-year-old cannot You're beat the world champion and go. Yeah, but somehow yeah. the pick and place is so much harder because of, the wide range of scenarios you end up encountering. Everything's always different, always different items, different packaging, different situations. And you need to handle every version of this to create value. Fascinating. I mean, I think the demo slash research to the real world gap is a really a real one. <laughs> it's really big oh, yeah. one, and it's uh, it's very interesting because I think it applies in all all areas of deep learning, right? All the way from something as simple as like say I won't say simple because we do forecasting. It's actually quite hard from something like forecasting to like you know like what OpenAI is doing and what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about. So I think there are two approaches here that I've seen taken, right? And I I I don't intend for you. To to give away your secret sauce but the question is uh it feels like like say someone like uh, av like waymo is memorizing these nuances a bit i mean one of the biggest knocks that you see even with gpt3 is everybody's like oh these are just like you know memorization models they memorize everything and therefore they see mm -hmm. something again and you know they just you know spit that back to you versus learning right where you're like looking at enough scenarios kind of in some ways deconstructing it maybe and then therefore mm -hmm. applying it to new scenarios which potentially feels like how the human brain works so what is that trade-off there i mean do we think we're still kind of mostly memorizing uh, uh you know are all most of our models in the memorization world or more kind of in the learning world or beginning to move there hmm? i i think that that's actually a question i often see end up seeing debates about how much yeah. are deep learning models really learning versus memorizing Obviously, right. there is some kind of learning, right? Yeah. I mean, so, yeah, there at a certain level, yeah. you, you can show it an image that it's never seen before, right? And it'll recognize what's in that image, right? And but then at the same time, it's that image will be quite related to a set of images it's seen yeah, before, it's and and so there is there, there is some kind of generalization for sure, but at the same time, the generalization that we're seeing with our current deep learning methods has not been at the level yeah. that humans generalize. And then often the question is, you know, what does that even mean? I mean, maybe humans just generalize so well because they have seen so much data in the past. And I maybe see. actually I we've see. seen it all yeah. ourselves yeah. too, or maybe not. And I think that's a pretty big open question there. But to bring it back to the practical reality that, that you're alluding to, um, a covariant, when we think about how do we build what we call covariant brain, which is the, the, the software powering our robots, right? There is a key philosophy that we've gone with from day one, 
And that has been that anything you hard code is likely going to come back to bite you. Thank you. Because anytime you hard code something, you are making assumptions. And these assumptions could be violated. And then you could say, okay, if they're violated, you know, then you, you, you just hard code some more things. But that's essentially, that's where things go kind of crazy in practice because you have an if then else, if then else, if then else. And, and some people might say, oh, it, it's inter it's interpretable uh, way of programming the robot. But actually once you have a hundred or a thousand if then else statements, I don't think too many people can actually reliably gauge what this you know spaghetti code would be doing. And so from day one, we've said, look, we, we can't go down that path. Like the way we can build long-term, most capable robot brains is how we think of it, is by always being learning and data-driven. If something doesn't work today, we have to be able to fix it by collecting more data of that type, training our covariant brain, which is large neural networks, mm -hmm. um, to absorb what's in that data. And now some people would of course say, hey, aren't you, wh why are you throwing things out? Could, couldn't you, for some things, you, you just know what it's supposed to be. Well, if you know what it's supposed to be and you could hard code it, you can do, use that as a data generation engine, right? right. You can use the data and generation according to the okay. process that yes. you know. And then learn you from all data. that data. You yeah. learn from that data, you internalize that concept. But if then ever there is a violation of that concept, because pretty much, I mean, it's like, you know, the good old school AI things, right? Like birds can fly, right? But then you run into a bird that can't fly. What does that mean? I mean, you know, is a bird that lost their wings still a bird? Is a penguin a bird or not? I mean, it's, it's just like, it's, it's, it gets complicated very, very quickly, right? But if you're data driven, you just have an ex you have just a new type of data. You add it to your existing data, and your model internalizes it. So that's one big part of our philosophy. Got we it. need to be able Got to it. improve things with data and learning. A related part is that the hard thing with building AI for the physical world is the long tail. It's the fact that there is so much, so many things that don't occur very often, but together. There's a lot of it. It's a big mass. It's a heavy tail, not just long, but it's also heavy. There's a lot of probability mass in it. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that we believe strongly, and we've found this so far to be true, and I think it, I'm pretty confident it's going to be true forever pretty much, but that you want to train a single model for everything you do. You don't want oh. to have a separate covariant brain for picking groceries and a separate covariant brain for picking electrical supplies and a separate covariant brain for picking maybe apparel, yet another covariant brain for picking, you know, health and beauty items and so forth. You want a single brain. And in terms of things that a lot of people more naturally think about, let's say cell driving cars, it's the same thing in my mind as saying, you don't want a separate system for highway driving versus city driving. City driving. Um, okay. Because there's actually shared things. And by making it separate, you're splitting your data, you're cutting your ability to generalize drastically. It's by sharing all that, by having a single brain that has to be able to do everything, that sharing is actually going back to what you asked about initially, Bindu. I think that sharing is what leads to the ability to generalize better. Yeah. And so that's been our philosophy from day one. We, we, we still run with that. We'll keep running with that. Yeah. Um, it's a hard now, philosophy to follow, but the right one, right? I mean, that's the, that's the mm -hmm. trade-off. In the short run, it feels like, let's just split it. It's easier to build two models good at two different tasks. But in the long yeah. run, this is mm -hmm. the right way to go. Fat and this goes fat. back to your very initial question about multitask, right? Yeah. Um, multi this is multitask in some way, but we're saying, actually, we should consider it a single task. Single, we shouldn't yeah. think of it as multitask, even though naturally you could maybe say it's multitask. But we say this is a single task if you want to do it maximally well. Even if all you care about is, let's say, health and beauty products, by also training your brain on all these other things, you become better at health and beauty products also. Fantastic. You know, I love your uh, tenants, the philosophies, uh, basically saying, hey, while we want to build for one particular, like, 
problem or solution, we're building that in a very generalized way. We're not like kind of hard coding things. Uh, I totally agree with, I think across AI, all the companies, uh, of course, ours is, uh, you know, I would say a little bit more kind of real worldly, meaning we're tackling, mm -hmm. tackling simpler problems. Having said that though, the same tenant applies to us as well. Like don't, don't do something which is very hard coded for a particular customer, like do it, you know, right. do it in a general way. I think that that philosophy actually builds kind of like uh, inherent intelligence, which is valuable for humanity, right? Just much more and, and sometimes bigger than the company itself. I think that's uh, absolutely wonderful, uh, fascinating. But tell us a little bit, I don't know how much time we have, but I'm really curious about imitation learning. So maybe a minute about that, deep RL versus imitation. You think imitation learning hasn't, I mean, it seems like it's not as buzzy, <laughs> for the lack of a better word, than RL is. Um, what do you think about the future of imitation learning? Yeah, when I think about RL and imitation learning, imitation learning, I think is 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 just as important uh, okay. as reinforcement learning. Absolutely, if we think about the practical, um, I think the reason reinforcement learning gets more attention and and more buzz is because it's it's more mind boggling, right? In reinforcement learning, the agent learns from scratch. Initially, it's just struggling, and then over time, it figures things out on its own, and it's it's just beautiful to watch that in action. You know, all of a sudden the robot can walk or can get up and, and, and so forth, right? Um, but the truth is reinforcement learning is, is not very sample efficient. Um, I mean, the upside is that the robot or agent collect their own I samples, see. but the downside is that it tends to require a lot of samples, right? So the beauty of imitation learning is that very often by giving a few examples, a system can directly learn to imitate. And this could be in the context of robotics. This could be in the context of other things like Maybe a support agent that's having a dialogue and you know has seen past dialogues and matches the, the behavior in those past dialogues. And so one of the reasons I think you don't see as much about imitation learning in the research world is because I would say that it's, I mean, I wouldn't say it's an easy thing, but it has less complexity than reinforcement learning. And so th there is less maybe things to directly improve upon, right? So with reinforcement learning, there is, should you ex explore, should you exploit? What's the best way to explore? Um, how do you internalize all this information? Are you gonna build an internal model of the world? Or are you just gonna you know, do model free? There's so many choices in reinforcement learning. Of course, there, there's a lot of connections between all the different algorithms. There's so many choices and it's still so sample and efficient that it feels like there's so much room for improvement, right? On the other hand, in imitation learning, when I look at it, the methods are quite similar um, hmm. over the last 10 years um, because you're essentially doing supervised learning yeah. with a little bit of extra, typically because you need to do well on a rollout, not just on a, on a one-off decision. But so there's less room for maybe innovation is maybe the way okay. to think of it. Okay. But there's a shift in that. And so the way I see the shift is one shift is how well can imitation learning do when you have massive pre-training? I think that's a really interesting question that we see more attention to now. You pre-train a lot of video, mm -hmm. then you imitation learn okay. on a few examples. What's the effect of the pre-training? And then related, can you find representations that can handle multitask imitation learning or that can do few shot imitation, quickly adapt to new demonstrations? So there are a few research directions, but and sometimes all of these also exist in reinforcement learning. Also in reinforcement learning, you can say, how much, what is the effect of pre-training? What is multitask reinforcement learning? What is few shot reinforcement learning? And the complexity is higher in RL. And so- I see. Therefore I that's challenging practice, and people are gravitating. Yeah, yeah. I think in practice, you, you might see a lot more imitation learning than reinforcement learning, at least today. But in research, okay. you're gonna see more reinforcement learning research. Okay, sounds great. I mean, we're almost on time. Uh, I guess there were a few questions. I, I think we can run over a little bit. Uh, I guess one of the questions we have was, uh, uh, use any, uh, okay, do, do your robots use any, I mean, this is an easy one. Do your robots use any tactical feedback from an item in addition to video stream? Probably yes, but <laughs> yeah. Well, so one of the things that we noticed is that a surprisingly large amount of tasks in pick and place uh, can be done with suction cups, okay? Now, so suction cups 
No, when they have a seal or don't have a seal. So that's one time. It's I, I mean, tactile is, of course, depending how generally you think about tactile, but that, that's a, a physical feedback mechanism. You can also install um, force torque sensors on, on essentially the, the connection point between the arm and, and the suction cup attachment. And so there is feedback like that. There's no, we don't use tactile feedback the way you might think of like human fingers tactile feedback, that kind of level of sensation. Um, that's not something that actually exists as a product. I mean, if it were to exist as a product, we'd probably be looking at it, but that, that's a really important current research direction to build really good tactile sensing. And I hope it'll come into existence and I think it'll open up a lot of new opportunities when it does. Fantastic. Okay, one last question. What techniques would you recommend for debugging introspection for RL models? Deep learning models are always hard to debug. But anyway, for example, if the model works very well 98% of the time, but then performs terribly in 2% of the time, how do you find what's wrong? Yeah, um, I think, you know, it, it remains tricky, especially for RL models to, to, to debug them. Um, the, there is actually a a really nice tutorial that my former student and then co-founder of OpenAI, John Schulman, put up a while back, and it's called The Nuts and Bolts of Deep Reinforcement Learning. And he gave that talk a few times, I think once as a, at NeurIPS, once at a, um, um, a deep learning um, day that I co-organized with Andrew Wing at the time. Um, and I would recommend checking that out because honestly, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot to it. Uh, it, it, I think the, the 45 minute talk is actually the it's right answer <laughs> to it. So check it out, try to find John Schulman nuts and bolts of deep reinforcement learning. Uh, and if you somehow can't find it, drop me an email and I can, I can see if I can help you dig it out. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a really fascinating talk. Thanks for coming to our, uh, uh, you know, a little virtual event and hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you so much, Peter. Yeah, thank Have you for hosting Bindu. For everybody who's online live right now, I see there are more questions. I know this the, yes. the event will roll over to next thing, but I'm happy to stick around and type some answers to the questions yes. that are in the Q&A. So I'll, I'll, I'll go do that right now. So yeah, the, yeah. Your, your you question so will be answered. <laughs> yes, uh, there are quite a few questions. I figured we didn't have time for it, but thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bindu. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, kicking off our next session is none other than, uh, uh, I don't know if Colin, you want to introduce Ganesh. I mean, I will stay, uh, say that uh, uh, I'm an IITB alumnus, so I'm very, very proud to have Ganesh here, but Colin, go for it. Hi. Yes, uh, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Ganesh Ramakrishnan. He's currently an Institute Chair Professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Bombay. His areas of research include human-assisted human AI, uh, AI in resource-constrained environments, learning with symbolic encoding and domain knowledge in machine learning, and, and other areas of uh, efficiency in machine learning. He's a uh, Ganesh has received awards for his research, such as the uh, IBM Faculty Awards and other awards from Qualcomm, Microsoft, as well as the IoT Bombay Impactful Research Award. And uh, at Abacus, we've been very lucky to collaborate mm -hmm. with Ganesh recently, and so I'm very excited to hear this talk. So Ganesh, please take it away. Um, thanks, Colin, for a very generous introduction. Um, thanks for hosting this talk. I'm just going to screen share. Um, can you please confirm that you're able to see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Thanks. So uh, I'll give a brief overview of a platform that uh, myself and my colleague uh, Rishabh Ayer at the University of Texas at Dallas have been building so with a whole bunch of our students, both at IIT Bombay and at UT Dallas. Um, the idea behind this platform is to make it possible for people in resource constrained environments to be able to build models, both in data efficient and compute efficient manner. 
So the talk uh, is meant to present our open source toolkits and you'll really like to encourage the audience here, the community at large, build upon our toolkits in two ways. Either you can integrate new algorithms or we'll be very happy if you could use tool these toolkits in your applications. Um, we are all aware that deep learning has achieved near human performance in multiple fields. There's a strong growth in the, both in the complexity of the networks as well as the number of networks. Um, and uh, the issue then is, has deep learning been solved? Yes, deep learning has reached human performance in several tasks. But the problem is that you need large data sets and massive models. Um, in addition, there could be issues of fragility uh, owing to biases in the data. There could be massive label skew. In addition, the process of labeling data itself is very expensive. Just to uh, give you an insight into the kind of cost incurred in the computer intensive deep learning models, for example, to train a bird model in Wikipedia and book corpora data set, you could uh, incur 200,000 USD. Uh, whereas for a single deep model for NLP uh, with network architecture search, you'd incur 237 million. And, I mean, this is INR Indian rupees, but $3.2 million. So um, the you can also measure the impact in terms of carbon footprints. Um, the other aspect is labeling cost. Um, the labeling cost, of course, increases as you go from image to uh, text where the cognitive load is high. Um, and we also presented representative numbers for other labeling tasks. So overall, um, there is need for data preparation, model training, model validation, and model deployment. And at each stage, there's cost. Could we be both data and compute efficient uh, across this pipeline? Um, the constraints are that you would you like to reduce your labeling or be if efficient and effective in your labeling, and uh, also be robust in the process to distribution shift. A common framework that we would exploit through all our modules is subset selection. Um, you have a ground set B. This is the ground set B of all the data points. And what we seek is a subset of points that's as good as the ground set with respect to an information function F. Now, what kind of subset selection are we after? So we could look at selecting subset of a labeled data set so that we could reduce the training time. And this is typically what happens when we have a cold start setting where we don't have, I'm, I'm sorry, when you have a warm start setting, when you have lots of labeled data, but you also have the cold start setting where plenty of unlabeled data, very little labeled data. And in such setting, you'd like to reduce the labeling cost. There are other settings like, um, you know, you like to select subset of model parameters to reduce inference time and so on and so forth. There's been a lot of research in these direction over the years, of course. And here's a bunch of keywords, a representative of the approaches used in this area, greedy, representation learning, meta learning, semi-supervised learning, streaming, submodeler, and so on. But uh, the issue is that there's been a lack of good toolkits and benchmarks in this space. So what we're going to present is uh, Decile, Data Efficient Machine Learning, uh, which has several modules. I'll begin with Submodlib, which is a, at the heart of all the other modules. Submodlib is um, a library for summarizing massive data sets using submodeler optimization. What is um, submodeler? Uh, what's a submodeler function? Here's a simple representative example. Consider f, the function, which is a number of distinct colors of balls in an urn. On the left hand side, you have the set A, 
and on the right hand side you have a set b a superset of a you have a ball which is v the blue colored ball the marginal gains of adding the blue colored ball to the smaller set a is greater than or equal to the marginal gain of adding the same ball to the larger set such a function is a submodular set a submodular function and some modular functions exhibit this diminishing returns property um what we have in submodlib is extensive documentation and several submodular functions and their maximizations all implemented um installation is as simple as a pip install described here um what are the different classes of submodular functions broadly three representation diversity and coverage but you could compose these with queries queries that seek information or queries that try to hide information <clears throat> so in this first case you see the query person seeking information on person as a representative diverse or high coverage summary and uh, therefore you like to ensure that the selected subset has people but then um they must have people in different poses or different people on the other hand in the second case you would like to hide the person information we'll see how both query and privacy could be slapped on each of these classes of submodular functions so let's look at the broad um outline of instantiations of set functions representation functions include facility location graph cut diversity includes dispersion functions de de determinantal point processes coverage functions include set cover probabilistic set cover and feature based importance functions are largely modular functions they are basically submodular and uh, the negative is also submodular the information functions uh, which i alluded to in the previous slide to the example of queries and privacy preserving set these are encapsulated in mutual information and conditional gain and these could be used in conjunction with all the others um there are a bunch of others which we won't talk about today discounted cost functions and complexity functions some of these become more interesting when you're looking at submodular minimization so um we'll next next look at information functions uh which we would invoke once we outline examples of each of these three classes information functions have traditionally uh been very popular through entropy we are aware of discrete entropy the joint entropy of variables indexed by s in this case and this discrete entropy turns out to be a submodular function but what you see here is the conditional gain the gain on adding e to a um because discrete entropy is submodular obviously there's diminishing returns um now this conditional gain itself has some interesting properties that's what is highlighted here in yellow but you could also have mutual information um now it turns out that mutual information and information and conditional gain could be composed with any other submodular function in place of entropy so this is a more generic definition of submodular mutual information um ifa comma q is the function applied to a plus the function applied to q minus the function applied to a union q and basically it's measuring how relevant is this set a to the query q on the other hand the example of conditional gain now generalized to some model function classes uh, is measuring the irrelevance of the privacy set p uh, irrelevance of the set a to the privacy set p and what you see below are instances of both mutual information and conditional gain applied to the different classes of some model functions so uh, sub model Uh, presents a unified framework of extractive query and privacy preserving subset selection where you could look at 
abstractive uh, you you're trying to maximize some modular function identify a sub constraint in the query sensitive subset selection you're trying to maximize a mutual information function for uh, any reasonable choice of f the sub modular functions uh, the recipe that we have provided and uh, you could do the same with conditional gain <clears throat> Finally, you could also put together the query relevance and irrelevance to the privacy set through the conditional gain mutual information CGMI functions here. Of course, we have uh, some degenerate cases um, which correspond to when the query is the entire ground set or when the privacy is the entire uh, privacy is the empty set. <laughs> so let's look at representation functions. Um, a canonical example is of facility location. You want to identify some K facilities such that these facilities cater to the market at different locations, also possibly raw material supplies. So the points here in red are the facilities, but there's a cardinality constraint you typically have. You, you would want to locate K facilities. Now, Underlying the choice of those facilities is the similarity, similarity between any two pair of points I and K. And the facility location problem is to identify for every point I in the ground set, the most similar facility K. Um, and overall, you like to say maximize the facility location function, identify a subset X that maximizes the facility location function. You could likewise have a saturated coverage uh, where you you are looking at coverage, which we'll talk about a little later. But then you are also clipping the value based on an alpha i or graph cut. We are looking at a combination of similarity between the subset and the ground set while discounting for self similarity within the selected subset. Uh, and what would uh, representation functions do they would try try and pick representative samples from each of these clusters while possibly leaving out outliers because they are not really worth representing. So effectively, these would pick centroids. Now, what happens if you apply information functions to facility location? So you see here um, the F A is a max, and when you now look when you put in the conditional gain on B, you're basically now discounting for the max similarity of uh, uh, every element in B from the, the max similarity of every element in A. Okay. So on the other hand, uh, if you look at mutual information between A and B, you're looking at the min of those max similarities. Um, the next class is coverage functions where you're trying to cover a bunch of concepts, maybe keywords here, cat, dog, bird, man, beach, and you'd like to identify a subset of documents that cover these concepts. Um, or you might be trying to cover objects, male, car, greenery, etc. And that process identify a relevant subset of images. So the basic idea is to select instances which cover all the concepts. You could also have a probabilistic version where you have the probability PIJ of an image I covering concept J or a document I covering word J. <clears throat> yeah, this allows for probability of covering concepts. Um, and you could again have mutual information variants. Um, as well as conditional um, gain variants for weighted set cover um, and probabilistic set cover. Finally, you could also have feature based functions where you're looking at coverage through the feature space. Um, and typically, you would use a concave or modular function. So, the total contribution of feature u in the set of images s could be a modular function, and concave or modular gives you some modular functions. Um, and you could also have now a composition of these uh, through deep submodular functions. Uh, final class is the diversity class. We are all 
uh, aware of how you would capture the volume of the points through the determinant, right? The volume of the um, polyhedron that uh, encapsulates points through a determinant. Now, in the case of DPP, you're looking at similarity between pairs of points, the log dit LS, the, the sub matrix spanning the subset of points uh, through the similarity kernel. This turns out to be a sub modular function. Uh, there are, of course, other diversity functions as well. Uh, you not expect or diversity functions to be monotone in general because as you keep adding points, you would not necessarily you know, expect the function to itself increase. But uh, yeah, several of them are submodular or exhibit some modularity like properties. So the idea here is picking items as different as possible. And, and you notice that in this process, the outlier has been picked, which was left out when you when we consider the facility location or the uh, the representation class of functions. Uh, you could likewise also do uh, you know dispersion min, dispersion sum, dispersion min sum, sum and dispersion min sum uh, min are not submodular. Dispersion min sum is. Um, so as a summary, we have a bunch of submodular functions. Uh, several of them are monotone. As I mentioned, the log dit is not a monotone submodular function. Likewise, graph cut and mutual information aren't. Uh, but there are also non submodular functions such as disparity min and disparity sum. Um, now, for you could slap the info, mutual information, conditional gain, and uh, combination of these on all of these functions. Uh, this is uh, a table not necessarily meant to be parsed in such a short duration, but uh, sufficient to highlight that all of these have been implemented in submodel lib, uh, rather, the maximization of these functions. So, what are we talking about? In terms of maximization, we get to that now. Um, the master optimization problem is that you want to maximize this function f, which could be either uh, the submodular function, mi function, cg, or a cg mi function, subject to some cardinality constraint. Um, let's uh, get some glimpses into variants of this master optimization problem. <clears throat> the most intuitive algorithm is a greedy algorithm. And uh, the idea here is just pick the next element E, which leads to the maximum gain. Um, how good is a set SK composed of the first K greedily selected elements? It turns out that it's not that bad at all. Um, this constraint, of course, is the cardinality constraint. Um, and it turns out that SK has an approximation. I mean, this, this entire algorithm has an approximation guarantee. In practice, of course, it's very good. So you can see that uh, for a problem of that of self sensor placement, um, you're trying to place sensors to cover field. Um, the greedy choice is almost as good as optimal. In theory, uh, it turns out that the function evaluated on the greedily selected set is at least one minus one over one over E times the function evaluated on the optimal set S star. And this is uh, quite encouraging, though, of course, as I said in practice, uh, the results, uh, the, the greedy algorithm often does as well as the, um, uh, the brute force. <clears throat> However, it turns out that no polynomial time algorithm can do better than this in the worst case. So this is pretty reassuring. Um, you could also have budget constraints. Instead of giving the equal weightage to every element, you could have a CE. And uh, in which case you do a, a greedy as well as a modified greedy, where you are accounting for the cost of the element while looking at the conditional gain. Uh, and it turns out that it has halved the previous approximation factor. Um, but there have been, of course, uh, several other investigations into this space. Um, summarily, the greedy algorithm framework uh, could look at a 
cardinality or a weighted cardinality or a weighted cost constraint and you could look at maximizing either monotone sum modular functions um, in which case you have you know, the, the the encouraging guarantees we talked about or in many cases sum modular functions without monotonicity and this is the overall greedy algorithm uh, it turns out that sum mod lib makes this entire space um, which could be somewhat uh, intimidating to a newcomer um it makes some some mod lib basically makes it very easy just a few lines of code here you see um you could use facility location to identify this diverse set of points in purple here um you could use flmi where you have this query here in green uh and that has influenced the choice of the subset of the same cardinality and you can see that the green has drawn a couple of points close there's a couple of the selected points close to the cluster where it belongs on the other hand you could also have a conditional gain uh, all you need to do is just specify this red point as the conditioning query uh, conditioning privacy set and suddenly you find that the points are uh, selected points are all pushed away so very easy to visualize as well um now we look at a couple of other modules in decile where we have leverage sub mod lib uh, or built significantly on top in a very non trivial manner the simplest extension is trust um targeted subset selection to mine rare events personalization fairness and i also kind of uh, divided the remaining part into the cold start the that is trust and spear and subsequently the warm start setting the cold start setting we we basically are struggling with label data uh, so we don't have too much label data so what can you do in the case of uh, less label data so imagine that you have a large unlabeled pool and you you know your target domain for example you might be looking at anomalous behavior your target is all nighttime images whereas your unlabeled data set has day and night both so the uh, use of mutual information based functions could help you identify a targeted subset that is aligned close with the target that should be labeled in order to do well on the target domain um and this is enabled through trust again uh, extens extensively documented and very easy to play around with um there are many use cases for example if you may have um you may want to tune your model based on the behavior of the confusion matrix where you would like to identify target classes through the diagonal elements or you would like to condition or guard yourselves against the confusing classes based on the off diagonal elements so um you can do performance based data selection um as i already mentioned you could do rare class enhancement selecting and labeling rare events to improve the model performance like in the case of the nighttime images or you might do targeted selection for personalization such as hand handwriting personalization yeah more about that in our uh, uh, recent paper at triple i 2022 but uh, all this is available in trust and yes trust uh, not only has the sum modular functions and the mi functions but also combinations of mi and cg functions um and yes there are there are some uh, representative results on how uh, trust helps improve performance on rare class and performance based selection in the interest of time i think we are already running very late um so um i'll i'll refer you to our paper where we have more detailed experiments and couple of actually follow up works which are also on archive uh, where we talk about the use of such a setting in um, you know semi supervised settings for medical data sets as well where the problem is really of finding a needle in a haystack and you'll find that the, each of these functions are uh, contributes in a very different way for example log dot mi which is uh, meant to get you diversity now you can see a uh, uh, very impressive performance uh, in terms of gain in accuracy with respect to the budget <clears throat> um spear is another slightly different dimension to the cold start setting where you don't necessarily identify the label set through a uh, initial exemplar set but you may also have rules or programs so uh, spear leverages data programming through and subset selection 
um i'll i'll illustrate now through a natural language example so imagine you were trying to classify questions such as in the trek data set if the text contains how you would uh, think of the question as being a description question on the other hand if it contains how long you would think it's a numeric question um now obviously you can see this conflict between these labeling functions and therefore it becomes important to aggregate across these so the la is a label aggregator uh, of course these are simple examples you can have more complex examples where given pairs of entities barack michel etc you like to identify whether they are spouse or not and in text it's not it's often not very difficult to write simple rules uh, labeling functions um which may not be uh, extremely robust but it might form excellent starting points and the idea is once you design these uh, weak labeling functions you can apply them on data through label aggregators and therefore generate your label set and that's been a typical paradigm a spear allows for that again it's uh, very well documented and very easy to use you could also do this through images in the case of images you could um you know in the case of google album you are organizing uh, the photos into al into folders and uh, um you, you can add photos to an album x when the photo contains a particular person name and then um you could therefore identify other images which look similar to that initial image which could act as an exemplar um now uh, this way you could create albums and rules through exemplars to automatically add photos to the album um however there could be um issues for example you get incorrect classification this image uh, is of the wrong person being tagged as maybe a sundar the scene turns out to be uh, one folder um so what we allow in spear is multiple aggregators aggregators that would allow you to uh, you know weed off the wrong signal you're getting through spurious uh, incorrect uh, classification through exemplars um we use uh, uh, we've implemented some of the ag aggregators from snorkel from stanford but we have our own aggregators um, beginning with cage from triple ai 20 where where we bring in priors associated with the labeling functions so when the when the person writes a labeling function uh, often the uh, the the designer of the labeling functions is able to uh, associate some confidence at the least saying that the labeling function 1 uh, is more plausible than labeling function 2 and which is more plausible than labeling function 3 so simple insights of this form could lead to significant st stability in a an extremely unlabeled setting that we are dealing with uh, unsupervised setting that we are dealing with um however in, in more recent work we have graduated beyond that beyond that so unlike the conventional data programming approach which lets you generate the label data and learn discriminative models subsequently more recently we been working on joint approaches which are also reflected in spear the idea behind joint approach is that not only are you gi given the labeling functions but you also may have small amount of label data which could be identified through something like targeted subset selection and eventually what you have is a jointly trained model a model that doesn't just take the output of the generative model and threshold on the probabilities to get a discriminative model but which jointly learns on the label data set as well as the labeling function model <clears throat> so here are some of the state of the art algorithms that are implemented in spear It, uh, some of these are ours but uh, um, several of these which i am marking their their uh, other state of the art approaches which are implement implemented and the basic idea is semi supervised data programming where you have a feature model um, could be any deep feature for a feature it could be the bert uh, based representation which operates in conjunction with the labeling function model which is marked in blue out here and the idea is you would like the feature based model to agree with the ground truth labels on the label data have low entropy on the unlabeled data 
a thresholded version of the labeling function model should agree on the feature model on the unlabeled data um, and you may not want to threshold but rather make the probabilities of the labeling function model and the feature model agree on both the unlabeled and labeled data now it's not necessary to have all these components uh, and you know we report very interesting combinations that work with intuitions um, this the last component is this precision guide i i, I gave uh, this example of how you could maybe prioritize labeling functions over each other the person designing the labeling functions very well knows um, intuitively how good the uh, one labeling function is in comparison to another labeling function so these precision guides play a very significant role in bringing stability um, and these can be also tuned uh, or, or set on validation data <clears throat> so uh, the other comp or component here is that the label data itself which appears in a couple of places here does this label data have to be identified in an ad hoc manner well no this label data could be also intelli intelligently selected and uh, uh, here's an example you the machine could come back to the human and say well you seem to be uh, your model seems to be confusing between these two people are they the same or different right so this kind of proactive data subset selection um, could be with the goal that the selected subset should complement and not necessarily subsume the labeling functions um, and that's exactly where our uh, work on you know conditional gain or privacy preserving uh, variants come handy um to give another very simple example you see these labeling functions lf1 and lf2 um which seem to be fairly um, uh, confident on examples s1 and s2 lf1 says that s1 is a spam lf2 says that s2 is not a spam and they tend to also tend to agree with each other however on s3 and s4 the labeling functions seem to be totally confused and they are actually contradicting each other as well so this is the subset that would be worth labeling because this subset gives you insights beyond the labeling functions um and that's exactly uh, what we've been uh, also looking at how we could combine different subset selection schemes in conjunction with the labeling functions and here's one simple example that our approach performs significantly better um, i mean the, the than even hand pick so if you were to hand pick the labeled examples um, you would not necessarily be making the wisest choice instead if you um, if you let the the model pick the labeling uh, the labeled exa examples to be labeled uh, you would benefit the labeling function model as well um i would now very quickly present an overview of the other two settings uh, one is and both of them operate in the warm start setting when you have sufficient amount of label data but i must tell you that this notion of warm start is also a bit relative i mean as you keep growing your data you would also need to make sure that they don't you don't have model drift so we talk about that in distal frequently for deep interactive such data subset selection the goal is the deep models um i mean all of us familiar with support vector machines uh, would know how the support vectors can make a world of difference um in you know like in box settings can be obtained through core sets um or that sorry uh, did you lose me i uh, we can hear you now just fine oh, it was just momentary i hope yeah yes okay thanks um so um, um in, in cards we present a whole bunch of core set and uh, efficient training mechanisms um th these are some use cases of cards you could do efficient robust supervised or semi supervised learning 
um you could also do efficient hyperparameter tuning by using small subsets of the label data and uh, we are very happy that you know there's some investigation on network archi architecture search that we are doing uh with colin and the abacus team <clears throat> so the several algorithms implemented within cords um the, the list keeps growing uh some of them are our own works i'll talk about uh, a couple of them i'll specifically talk about uh glister and grad match because they do in some sense also subsume some of the others so uh, let's begin with glister what's the idea of data subset selection in glister um you given a training data set u on which you can measure your log likelihood <clears throat> typically would estimate the parameters theta as on the uh, likelihood function evaluator on the training data however we are also assuming that we have access to a validation data and this is typically used for parameter tuning but we would like to make um use of this validation data in a slightly different manner and more tightly uh, more tightly integrated with the training process itself and that's what we try to do in couple of our works um so one important point here is as we seek a subset uh, of the training data such that the resulting model performs the best with respect to validation uh, we would like to make sure that the subset selection algorithm is as fast as possible obviously you don't want the subset selection time to eclipse the overall training time um and also in the process can we show theoretical guarantees for such such subset sub sub selection schemes so how do we select the right data for efficient and robust learning so our approach is select a subset that maximizes the validation log likelihood of the model train on the training data subset so subset is on the training data whereas what you are measuring is the validation log likelihood the parameters are estimated on the training data subset and let's see how that happens so here in the inner optimization problem or inner um aspect we looking at theta as estimated on the subset of the training data but on what grounds are we identifying the subset well the subset should be such that the validation log likelihood or uh, is maximized that's the outer level problem um so well is this even feasible um <clears throat> well instead of validation we can also use a full training data set that's just a side note um the challenge is that the inner optimization problem can be very difficult i mean you need to solve this every time you identify a subset and then go back and identify the next subset uh right so that could be an issue solving the inner optimization problem can be very expensive um and uh, if you go to do it in close form exactly obviously you know or even attempt to do it in uh, to convergence it can defeat the purpose of selecting a subset for fasting faster training now there are some you know uh, reasonable forms you can derive when um, you're looking at naive bayes or nearest neighbor we don't talk about that but that's dealt in prior works that uh, rishab ayer has published but what we're going to do is uh, look at approximations for speed up that could hold for more complex and real world ish law, uh, uh, network models and objective functions and what what is that approximation well one uh, the first is online one step meta approximation so you take the one step gradient update single gradient step towards the training subset log likelihood ascent direction um that's the first uh and now based on this you could identify the subset every time again but then uh um, that also is expensive so just because you have plugged this theta here doesn't mean that the subset selection now is going to be fast so of course uh before we move to other practical aspects let's look at some uh, interesting properties so when the validation log likelihood function is a negative logistic loss or the negative squared loss or the negative hinge loss we have our optimization problems in instance of cardinality constraints or modular maximization in the special case of negative cross entropy loss we have weak submodularity which uh, we won't talk about here um 
And so I, I, we recall that submodularity has this natural diminishing returns property. And therefore, we can use this. And you can also use a simple greedy algorithm to find the data subset is. Right? But as I pointed out, um, this is also going to be expensive because you, uh, as, as I'm going to talk about next, the evaluation of this function for every element that you try and add is going to be very expensive, a greedy algorithm, right? So instead of working with this complex objective, how about a Taylor series of expansion so that you can further up approximate the optimization problem, ignoring higher order terms. And what you observe is now the, the influence of the subset is only in the second term. The first term is just the previous iteration of theta uh, used to evaluate the log likelihood and the entire validation set. So this is done at each iteration of the greedy algorithm. And uh, as you can see, this, this dot product, in fact, opens up many other avenues. Uh, one of them is, of course, that the uh, this greedy subset selection scheme now only needs to identify this dot product for every new element added. Um, so it reduces the basically the need for multiple forward passes over the validation data. That's exactly what we have now uh, gotten out here. Um, so this is different from, of course, uh, doing Taylor approximation upfront. We did this Taylor approximation after the one step gradient approximation. Otherwise, you would have just had a modular problem. So now, um, so what do you get because of this? Um, well, we can now do stochastic gradient descent on initial set, get the parameters. And on the new parameters, you can again do a greedy uh, data subset selection based on which the new set of parameters obtained. So alternate between the parameter updates for L uh, for a couple, number, a couple of epochs and uh, the subset selection. Um, so data selection is done every L epochs. There are further computational aspects in the interest of time. I just want to mention them. So we could select a subset every L epochs. Uh, we also uh, you know, think of uh, use engineering tricks such as large layer gradients only being used. And also stochastic gradient selection and R gradient selection algorithms are used for subset selection, um, which, which do pretty well in practice. Uh, so the, I, I, I didn't get the time to talk about multiple, diff, uh, you know, um, greedy variants implemented within some model lib. Um, but I you know some of them are as good as uh, the greedy in theory and some of them in practice turn out to be as good. So uh, what's interesting is that under certain condition, Glister online converts as optimizer uh, of the validation loss in uh, one by epsilon square kind of epochs. Um, and the upper bound that we get for the difference in the validation loss with respect to the optimal parameters has this interesting cost theta, which measures the dot product between the training likelihood gradient and the validation uh, uh, gradient. Sorry, Ganesh, uh, just to step in uh, deep apologies, but some of our panelists from our next panel have to leave soon. Okay. Is there any way to wrap this up in a minute? Yes, I, yeah? I'll be doing it soon. Yes, Thank I'm almost you. done. Yes. Thanks. Yes, so very few efficiency results. You know, you can, uh, the, the, the main takeaway is that we get almost uh, 3x speed up with no loss in accuracy. And if you're okay with little loss, um, uh, you, you can do better. And 10x speed up for auto ML, um, which is with hyperparameter tuning and no loss in accuracy. And uh, there are also robust results um, where you can, we again see consistent speed up. Um, the last component of our work, the distill work, which uh, I'm going to just talk about how it builds on cards, but there are many other things we do in distill. The idea is to cut down the labeling cost in a warm start setting. Again, distill is very easy to use. Um, what's interesting about distill is that we allow a whole bunch of active learning algorithms, state of the art uh, to be used, um, uh, you know, where the human can use that algorithm to identify the subset to be labeled next. Um, and it also makes it very easy to switch the active learning algorithms um, with different implementations of common deep neural networks. And uh, another very important thing is we allow for data augmentation, which often eclipses you know, any uh, uh, gymnastics you might do with your uh, you know, active learning scheme. So data augmentation is very critical here. Um, and and that, that basically makes you work hard on the active learning strategy to show its value. Um, and, and a couple of other engineering aspects here as well. And these are the 
algorithms implemented. Um, but specifically with the glister, which I talked about earlier, we do glister active, um, where you select a subset of points L epochs to be labeled and add it to current label set. So you basically uh, now you can use hypothesized labels in glister active instead of uh, working with the true labels. That's because now we also want to deal with unlabeled data points. Um, and yeah, this Glister Active has been uh, you know profiled here. Uh, but yes, you, you're welcome to visit our paper. And also, the takeaway message is Glister can achieve seven x speed up at ten percent, three x speed up at thirty percent. And you can see as you increase your um, law, uh, you know, you're okay with compromising on the loss, you get more speed up. Um, and that's all with uh, active learning as well. Right. I, I'm going to skip all this in the interest of time. And you know, a whole bunch of uh, leaderboards have been set up. Uh, and the, in, the most important thing is we've been able to make extensive use of uh, our work uh, in, in several applications at uh, both the IIT Bombay and, and elsewhere. Uh, we, we've had uh, you know, award-winning works on video analytics for the Indian uh, security agencies where we have made extensive use of efficient, effective data subset selection. Um, and we've been also working with uh, you know, Abacus, IBM Research um, on efficient auto ML. Uh, we made good use of this for uh, low resource language settings um, through for optical character recognition and machine translation, especially post editing for low resource languages. We made extensive use of Spear and Trust there. Um, and, and likewise for you know um, personalized speech recognition, we made use of Trust. And uh, uh, we have upcoming uh, very interesting use cases of all of these in biomedical imaging. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, I hope uh, uh, you'll all take interest in making use of uh, the libraries I talked about under data efficient machine learning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ganesh. Um, moving on, we're, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to the panel, Machine Learning the Force Multiplier. Uh, I'm Nandish, the Director of Product at Abacus and the moderator for the session. Uh, with me, I have the panelists, uh, Zingshu Liu, Fernando, Schwartz um, and Amit Shankar, who are the data science and machine learning leaders at their respective companies. Uh, to kick off the session, I would like to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, give some insights into their backgrounds, and tell us a little bit more about the application of machine learning in their respective organizations. Maybe we can go around in alphabetical order, starting with Amit, followed by Fernando and uh, Zinshu. Sure. Um, Amit Shankar, CIO at uh, USIC. Uh, it's one of the largest uh, underground utility locating company in North America, uh, about 11,000 field employees. Uh, and what they do is uh, they are marking underground utilities. So every time you see a paint or flag on the ground, uh, now you know what that is or who that is. They are working what the underground utilities are uh, before any kind of exploration activity can happen. Uh, and so uh, we collect a lot of data as part of that. And what we are trying to leverage within our environment is how do we uh, take that data to predict what our work time is going to be at certain job sites because no two excavation site that is different. Um, so uh, a lot of interesting things to share with this group, uh, but uh, I'll let the others go and introduce themselves and we can get into the rest later. Fernando? Uh, thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Firstly, Hi, everyone. First, yeah, firstly, thank you for making. I know you have to leave early, but thanks for uh, moving your meetings around to accommodate the panel. Sure, definitely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for the uh, for the invite and and uh, hello everyone. Um, excited to to be here, joined by by this incredible panel. Um, um, a little bit about myself. I, I work at ADP. Uh, we are a you know HR uh, software company, um, and I've uh, been here for about uh, three and a half months. Uh, so pretty new at ADP. Before this, I was. Um, leading the global data science team at Merck, uh, which is a pharma company, uh, large pharma company. Uh, before that, I work in different um, companies, uh, some smaller startups um, in healthcare, uh, based in New York. Um, and before healthcare, I work in online advertisements, uh, you know, making those ads that chase you around. Uh, and prior to that, I had a completely different uh, life 
Uh, I was in academia. I was a, a tenured, I became a tenured professor. I'm a mathematician by training. Used to study about the, I mean, early in my career, I used to study about the shape of, shapes of uh, black holes in high dimensions. Uh, and then from there, I guess it, it was a, 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 an interesting hop to looking at shapes of data sets in high dimensions, which is something that we deal with quite a bit as data scientists, right? When we look at embeddings. Um, and then uh, yeah, after that, you know, stint in industry, uh, and here I am now leading the uh, machine learning and data science team at, uh, at ADP. Super happy to be here, guys. Thank you. Zing Xu. All right. Hello, everyone. This is Zing Xu Liu. Um, I'm currently working with Macy's, um, and uh, I'm responsible for the enterprise data and analytics across the organization. I joined the, the, uh, the team about a year ago, and uh, actually we have uh, several hundred of data analysts, data scientists, um, and the other team members all together. So I'm responsible for the data governance, the data engineering, uh, data analytics, and uh, data science slash machine learning as well. So we're excited to be a part of Macy's. Before that, I was uh, actually uh, working in both the startups and the large corporations. I worked in uh, three separate startups, and uh, I was lucky that all three had a successful exit. But some of the exits, you know, went public in a few years. Some other exits got, you know, acquired. But after 15 years, right, it was um, quite a journey, quite a journey. So after that, I joined the large corporations. The difference between working the startup and the large corporations is in the startups, we have the uh, quite a dynamic environment, thinking about outside of the box and driving innovations. But um, within the large organization, I was able to see through the implementation and the integration of taking the solutions to drive the business value. We're excited to be a part of this journey within Macy's specifically regarding the machine learning applications. I would say we just started a journey. Um, but the good news is, number one, we have a str very strong business commitment from our senior and executive leadership. This is a strategic investment from Macy's for the long term. The second is about the culture, actually, thinking about the implementation of the solutions, uh, the openness, the openness to adopting the a, um, machine learning solution. That's a, such a key factor. And the third is really thinking about the, uh, the very quick, uh, the benefit of like um, seeing the results very quickly. That's part of benefit of the retail. If we do something right to our customers, our customers react very positively. So just so excited to be here to share, you know, some of the knowledge and experience with you all. Uh, thank you all for the introductions. Um, so the, uh, diving, diving a bit more into the applications of uh, ML, uh, we are curious uh, how ML has impacted different departments in your organization, uh, be it sales and marketing, IT or business uh, planning. Which departments do you think uh, has the most benefit from the application of ML in your respective companies? Do you wanna direct this to somebody or just uh, uh, open yeah, it up? Yeah, open it up. Yeah, we can, sure. we can start answering. Uh, I'll take that one because I'm unfortunately gonna have to maybe leave a little early. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and I don't mean to uh, be a, a, a microphone a hug or anything. Um, so at ADP, um, we really um, look at uh, HR. I mean, many, many of us, and even myself in the past, right, have been paid through ADP. And if you think about it, and you actually know the data, it's quite surprising. Um, the amount of money that cycles through ADP in terms of, of uh, you know, paychecks, um, accounts, I mean, if you put it in a, in a, in a scale in the world, it fits somewhere in between the GDP of Italy and France. So um, we move as much money as somewhere in between the GDP and Italy and France in the trillions. Um, so you can imagine that we have a ton of transactions um, that, that are happening in the back end of our systems. Um, but, right, there's always a but, right? These systems have been built throughout the 70 plus years of our, of our existence. So. Um, like, you know, it, like many companies that have been around for a while, these have been built through mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we had like on-prem systems and whatnot, right? So we're now sort of, I would say, you know, 
more than just started. We've already made some deep inroads into moving all of our data into some kind of central repo in the, in the cloud. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done to, to the point that, uh, that was made earlier uh, by Zingchu. This is a, just the beginning also of our journey in terms of extracting the value of the data. Uh, but if you ask me, where is the most value, right? So there's several areas that are of interest. Um, I think that because we have so much data available to us, which by the way, it needs a lot of work, right? Like all data that's worth something, it, there's, there's value, but you need to go dig a little and clean up um, quite a bit. Um, the data is where I think where the biggest value comes for us uh, in the long run, but there's lower hanging fruit that revolves around, hey, we have a very mature uh, product suite uh, with tools for benefits, HR, payroll. And within those, uh, within those, there's plenty of opportunity to, to add incrementally value uh, by using machine learning. So I would say that the two main areas are how do we incrementally improve our current product lines um, and to add some layers of, of machine learning into them. And at the same time, how do we leverage now this, this data that we're collating, right, uh, for um, other use cases. That's kind of where at least I see that in at ADP and it's, it's a fascinating journey. Uh, it makes sense, uh, Fernando. Amit and Zingshu, do you want to add something uh, here? Sure, yeah, definitely. I'm very happy to. Um, again, you know, I, I feel very fortunate to work in the retail industry, which has such a broad, um, portfolio of the machine learnings that can be applied to drive better decisions. This is really going from, if you think about the more of the fundamental decision of retail, do we have the right products? Do you have the right value proposition? Can we get it to the customer's hands in time, either through the store or through online delivery? So those are foundational. So we're talking about merchandising, assortment, pricing, supply chain, inventory, but that's just, just, you know, that's just a foundational piece. And we're thinking about the customer experience, thinking about the digital, the online, your mobile phones, thinking about the store operations, um, thinking about the, uh, the call center, the marketing, how do we outreach to our customers? All these decisions can be tied together and driven by the AI and the machine learning applications to really advance our thinking to drive that scale and the speed. Not to mention, you know, we also have foundational work in terms of, you know, uh, Fernando, I think you touch up, touching upon the HR, the finance, right? All these pieces are, are all tied together. So it's hard for me to pinpoint and say, this is the biggest impact. I see all are driving our agenda forward, but there are a couple of themes, I would call it out. One theme is about very much customer centric but the AI and machine learning applications enable a much deeper connection with our customers. Um, so in the past, if you think about Macy's has over 40 million active loyal customers, how do we be that the very deep connection, understanding each one of our customers, what really the right style for them to fit? What's the fit analytics, right? And how do we, what's the, what's the broader value proposition can we really bring to the customer on that individual basis? That's a such key unlock for the AI and machine learning to advance our um, the intelligence and knowledge and really building that the strong relationship with our customers. Yeah, makes a ton of sense. Uh, that's very insightful. Amit, do you want to add something to it? Yeah, yeah. for us, I mean, being a field service organization, right? I mean, uh, it's a hub and spoke thing where field service and field operations is our primary focus where we want to be able to leverage it. That's where uh, the, the rubber meets the road for us. Uh, but, you know, we, I heard of them talk about the HR component. I mean, for us, it's uh, just not looking at the 11,000 employees that we have, uh, looking at how we can leverage their, uh, be it their tenure, be it their training data, uh, to be able to better help them and predict on how and what we do in the field. And, uh, who could be most optimized for something like that, as well as even things like location and things of that nature. So, yeah, I mean, we are leveraging it across the board. I mean, including, you know, finance area, but a uh, primary focus for us is, uh, is uh, field services, which is where, you know, <laughs> where we collect most of the data and we find the most use for it. 
it make, makes a lot of sense. I think uh, all of you, all of you guys have mentioned, uh, um, like touched upon, uh, maybe Fernanda has briefly touched upon the importance of data, and Amit uh, also mentioned the uh, amount of data that you have. Um, and uh, Zinshu, uh, as you mentioned, like um, it's data that is uh, what is the most important uh, thing for driving the decisions here. Um, so in that context, uh, one thing that we have also observed from our experience with our customers is uh, the importance of the quality of the data. Um, for ML to be a force multiplier, we believe that the quality of data is extremely important. I mean, after all, the model is just um, as good as the data it is trained on. Uh, so in that context, like, uh, what are some of the best practices uh, that you follow to ensure that you have the best quality data for ML to work its magic on? Again, maybe uh, anyone can start. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's open for the panel. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, I, I think for us, the challenge is the amount of unstructured data that we get. Uh, we really have zero control over it because we are not the ones that the data is being fed from all the 50 states and our customers uh, in their own format. So uh, for us is how do we remove the human touch or, the or provide an engineered solution to data capture? Uh, and that's how we're going to get better uh, data at it, because if we are relying on someone to tell us what that is going to be, for example, for us, you know, capturing uh, the time that they spend at a work site, if we are relying on them to tell us every time or when, how long they spent, uh, I think that uh, is a recipe for disaster. And we see that every day. So we're trying to get more and more towards structured data, like how do we can, can we use their uh, mobile device data to say when they arrived and when they left and use that automatically to capture that information and potentially then validate that with the end users at a later point. Uh, but uh, for us, the challenge is certainly, uh, you know, uh, clean data is, what, is what's needed. We all get that. Uh, but how do we get to engineered solution to it? Makes sense. I if I may, if I may add something, um, we're, we're facing a little bit different challenges, um, I think. Um, just to just to add a different uh, perspective, I mean, I totally agree that having clean data is 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 paramount here. But I mean, some of the challenges we're facing is that um, we don't have ground truth sometimes. So um, or we and, and we can't even dream of establishing ground truth. And by this, I mean, like, for instance, labeling. Right. So so some of the some of the um, challenges we face are like, hey, we want to build machine learning systems uh, and we want to build maybe training sets for those machine learning systems, but we know that it's not possible to do that. Um, we cannot possibly build a good training set. So just to, I mean, throw some geekish examples, right? So suppose that you want to train, build a training set where, where you know, you have 10,000 labels, right? Um, or, or maybe more, right? So you would need to curate a data set, you know, that has, you know, a multiple of those many rows of data, right? To be, you know, with their correct labels, which would be like, a, you know, hundreds of millions of rows of data that need to be labeled maybe manually. It's not, it's very difficult, right? So there, I mean, part of machine learning actually can be sort of flipped towards building better data than again can be, you know, it's kind of a stacking situation where you, somehow use machine learning to build data to train models, right? Um, and so how do you do that uh, is, 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 a, is an interesting question. Um, and sometimes how, you, you, how do you calibrate, uh, even if it, sometimes you can't even build, you know, ground truth, but maybe at a certain aggregate level, ground truth has to be calibrated. Uh, so anyway, so th there's, there's super interesting challenges, I think that, 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 are, that are, you know, beyond sort of, Stop having cleaning data that, that we're trying to face, which also, of course, that's another challenge, right? But, you know, how do, how do you do that? Um, anyway, so more questions than answers here for me, at least. And also, um, I echo I both of you share in terms of the data quality. I think that the focus sounds like it's more focused on the, the raw data. Uh, I also like to offer a bit of framework thinking about uh, as a larger organization, and how do we think about the uh, various components of that? I would say the raw data is a component one. There's a second one is about connecting the raw data to the business use case. I call it semantic layer. And the third one is I call it intelligence layer, really having that uh, you know, AI machine learning application outputs back into the data and making it shareable. So thinking about raw data, 
this to me, this is about the data quality, about the scale and the speed. And at Macy's, we leverage in Google Cloud and BigQuery to really centralize a lot of that data doing the cleaning. But also from organization perspective, we have data governance team, we have data engineering team, really ensure the data quality, consistency, and accessibility. That's the step one. Then the step two, the semantic layer is so critical because we are where's the team, as I mentioned, your business functions in terms of merchandising, supply chain, marketing, digital, et cetera. Each team could define their own calculation using the data. That's where it's causing the inconsistency, causing the, the, the disconnect. That's why having so-called semantic layer to embed the calculation within that layer to empower the consistency then drive it in speed and scale. That's really the next level. Then we're talking about a true intelligence layer, really bring in the machine learning application and the output. Simple example is like a forecasting. If we're talking forecasting, if you think about you know, uh, Macy's business, this is the going from the top financial forecasting, inventory, the pricing, down to like, you know, the, how do we manage the fulfillment? How do I manage the store operations? We're granular level. That's gonna really cause a lot of challenges. If we say we're talking about tens of thousands of people using that results, then we need to really bring into the data layer as an intelligence to connect all the dots. That's how I think about as a closed loop, closing the loop to continue to feed our intelligence back to the data and really advance our you know, level of intelligence. Makes a ton of sense. Uh, I know Fernando, you have to leave in a couple of minutes. Maybe do you want to take the panel question? Like how do you handle privacy concerns on your data? Sorry, which, which is the, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, the question? Hey, apologies for that. Apologies guest for question, that, guys, sorry. I have to drop. Which is the question do you want me to look into, sorry? Uh, the guest question, how do you handle privacy concerns on your data? Oh, right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Sure. Someone put a, a question in the chat. Uh, and I'll, let me just repeat this. How do you handle privacy concerns on your data? Well, I mean, uh, this, you know, coming from healthcare uh, myself, right? Um, this is kind of a piece of cake, <laughs> I would say. Uh, privacy in healthcare is uh, a difficult, right? In the sense that um, you have, you know, there's so much regulation around uh, personal healthcare information called PHI. Um, well, the type, kind of information that we handle at ADP is called PII. Um, and so um, there are very uh, standard uh, ways to, to handling the data, data and making sure that, I mean, you know, God forbid you're, you're you know, attacked by someone, right? There's, um, there's, no, there's no way to, or at least, you know, the best possible protection to this data, right? So uh, we use like the state-of-the-art encryption, but this is, this is I mean, Generally speaking, right, safety um, about data um, and, and access to platforms is, is something that's top of mind. You know, everybody heard about the log4j. So we were we were stuck with dealing with log4j countless hours last year. Um, I don't mean to jinx it here. We, we I think so far uh, we're we're safe, but um, this this is this kept a lot of people awake throughout the new year uh, last year. Um, and I mean, that's just part of the equation, right? But specifically around the data, I mean, there are, there are standard ways to, to, to hashing uh, the, the private information, right? So we don't, we don't, we're not exposed to that. Uh, so like one way hashes and whatnot, right? Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, uh, but of course, regulation is, is changing. Uh, and, um, you know, I think that the biggest challenge is not necessarily around, uh, you know, privacy, is more around fairness, um, and specifically in the industry that I work in, and then that's an area that I'll topic that I just drop in there and just have to leave, right? But the EOC, uh, you know, um, the Commission for Equal Employment Opportunity, um, has some interesting thoughts. Or so how do you how do you make sure that that if you use machine learning to make to driving decisions that impact people's lives, how do you make sure that you're 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 doing this in a fair way? Um, and we as a collective are trying to figure that out as a society, right? There's no clear recipe just yet, but that's kind of where, where I think that the challenges lie more than in uh, privacy, which is, um, I think, a little bit more uh, better understood. Um, with that said, you guys, I, I, I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm so sorry to drop. This is an amazing panel and I have a call uh, to go to, uh, but they, you know, very nice chatting with you guys. Happy to, to, to come back any other time. And nice to meet you, Amit and, and Zingchu. Uh, thank you, guys. Nice meeting you too, Fernando. Thank you, Fernando. Bye-bye.
Cool. Uh, continuing continuing uh, with uh, Amit and Azinshu. Uh, so given that we have spoken the challenges of having good quality data, what are some of the other challenges uh, that you face when uh, implementing AAML solutions? And what are some of the techniques that you recommend to the uh, audience on how to tackle these challenges? Sure. I mean, in, in our case, it's our technicians, our field uh, techs who are uh, really consuming this data that we, are do, uh, that we are leveraging from ML, which is primarily uh, trying to predict, uh, you know, how long it should take them to do their work. Uh, for us, you know, we get about, you know, we can do about 90 million of them this year. Uh, and uh, the reality is that no two work uh, is the same for us. Uh, uh, you know, some can take a few minutes. Uh, to a couple of hours to a few days, and some may go on for months. Uh, so the challenge for us is uh, making sure that the, the, the techs who are consuming this data can trust this data. And, and it doesn't create this uh, feedback loop where they, they think that if the computer says it's 15 minutes and I'm going to take 30 minutes, am I not doing it right? Or am I doing it better? Uh, so uh, I think for us, what we are trying to do is how do we provide and collect feedback from them on a real-time basis, right? So if we think that it should take 15 minutes and the employees does it in five, we want them to be able to tell us why it worked the way it did and why it was done in five. And it may be something like, hey, I couldn't even get access to this facility because the gate, I, I don't have the gate code to get in someone's house or to, to someone's backyard. Um, Whereas, so I never completed the work, but I'll have to come back. And that's why it only took me a couple of minutes and not the 15 you thought. Uh, uh, and so by doing that, I think that brings that uh, they have some extra level of confidence that, you know, it's not there to monitor their work as much as it is to help them get better. And, and that's how we can plan their day. So, uh, you know, we do this collecting the feedback. Uh, good or bad from them, as well as uh, trying to see how well the machine uh, machine learning makes, yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I think sure. uh, Amiri kind of touched upon a, a few points. I, I totally agree in terms of some of the implementation, you know, and change management. Um, if I think about the in terms of uh, uh, implementing the, the machine learning applications, I, I can think of like three pieces are some of the key challenges. One is about the data sparsity. And it's probably surprising to say, hey, you know, this is a big data area. Why we're talking about data sparsity? But I'll, I'll get to that. Um, the second one is about transparency and understanding how the model works and how uh, how is it connecting. And the third is about the integration. So the first one the, about the data sparsity in terms of the if you look at overall data size, this is a huge volume of data, you know, for us to work with, but. Uh, if I use a Macy's or the retail specifically, we're talking about hundreds of stores, millions of products and tens of millions of customers. If you look at the combination of all these together and getting down to, do I have the right decision for a given location, specific product, a specific customer, the data is not as rich as you, you know, as you hoped. So that's where it's getting the right application. The also, taking the business prior, taking the business insights and having a way to ingest that. It's not solely just relying on what the data is available. Some of the data is not properly captured. That's a, such a key to address a kind of hybrid approach of not only using a, a science, but also art a combined approach. The second one is about transparency. They kind of connect to the first one. If when we're making the decision, the business need, users need to understand why we're doing that and how this is gonna really drive the business impact. Having that transparency, being able to explain what's the key levers, what's the key features and driving the end results. And then the third is about really implementing it. Is this gonna be implemented in terms of integration with business operations? Is it gonna be productionized? Is, is this gonna be automated? There are many different options depending on the business readiness, depending on the specific use case we're trying to solve. That's where we need to really uh, have a solid plan, but also thinking through the end-to-end -end till we see the business value and results, not only just building the solution itself. That's only a step towards the bigger goal. Uh, make, make, makes a ton of sense. That was very insightful. Uh, moving on to the next question, like given 
the importance of AIML, um, uh, all the importance of AIML. What is your approach towards uh, towards building or buying uh, the AIML solution for your organizations? How do you think of it in terms of the cost, the time to market, and the control that uh, you want over the ML platform? Um, and as a follow-up, if you choose to go with the uh, uh, buy approach, like what do you look for in a vendor um, as there are like hundreds of AIML companies out there? I, I mean, for us, I guess it's, there's no one answer to it. Um, I mean, we are a big believer in best of breed, right? And we also know that uh, it's not something I can build it if I can go and buy something off the shelf or or at least something uh, that exists today and leverage that uh, along with some other in internal integrations that we may have to build. That's the approach we have taken. Uh, so we are leveraging some third party tools uh, and, and, and inter using some internal uh, development as well. Uh, but um, I, I think it's gonna be different for each different environment as well. Yeah, I would echo that point that uh, there's really not a silver bullet. <laughs> it's, we got to really evaluate a case by cases, uh, scenarios. But uh, I think you touched upon some of the key components in terms of the speed to the market, in terms of the cost. Also, I would add to it is how does, how does that balance our short term goal versus a long term strategic benefit? Um, so that's where we also meet, need to make that decision. Also, in terms of AI and the machine learning applications and those solutions specifically, there's also a difference between generic and uh, where, where specific. Some of the solutions are designed to be a platform, which is enabling the speed and you know, the, the scale, but others are more targeted towards a specific business problem to solve. If I'm looking at a specific solution, I would be more curious about okay, who have been using the solutions? What's the success? How's, how's the benefit? How long does it take to implement? And what's the ROI? All those factors will come into that decisions, which is very different if I'm looking at a generic solution, it's, it's gonna be about how, what's gonna take for us to integrate, to implement, because that's usually a much bigger lift as we're touching many components across organization. Totally agree on that. It's very much dependent on a guest by case basis. I mean, you want to... yeah, and I think the speed to market is also another key, right? And I think that's where the buy option comes in handy, if, if that's an option. Uh, uh, so th that's a critical part of it. Um, and uh, Ling Shu, as you mentioned, you know, when you look at the ROI and all, and all of that, I mean, I think it's always going to be a combination of them. I, I don't think there's one silver bullet for this. Makes a ton of sense. Uh, so I'll, I'm, I was looking at like a couple of uh, messages in the chat and people are asking about career advice. So maybe my next question is slightly related to that. Um, so in the context of hiring AAML talent in your organization, uh, what do you look for um, in the hires that you make and how do you structure your teams to achieve the best results? Yeah, I can uh, take a step at it um, and I may feel free to uh, share your thoughts as well. So in terms of looking for candidates, they're like a, more of a broader, broad uh, quality we're looking for in terms of being a team player, you know, being resource driven uh, and uh, the ability to solve the problems like independent thinking. And there's a lot of that part of expectation. And coming specific to the machine learning uh, candidates, where I tend to look for is less of the specific application experience because the, the technology has, has been advancing so at a, such a fast pace, you will never to get hold of all the cutting edge technology and applications. It's more about your foundational understanding, your training, your experience, and be able to well, be comfortable to take a new problem and be able to translate it from a business context to a more a, a machine learning abstract. And then coming up with the solutions and building back to uh, to have that impact on the business as well. So that's where I would be more kind of leaning into and in understanding the candidates, uh, you know, the, the quali qualification on that. So. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree with you there as well. I mean, I think it's not uh, uh, feasible to try to get a candidate with a certain skill set because that skill set may not be <laughs> pertinent to you tomorrow uh, or the day after for sure. 
but what you're looking for is someone who's going to be uh, who's who can connect the dots between the technology aspect and the business aspect. For me, that's critical, is looking at people who can, who are willing to get their feet wet and understand the business aspect of it. Technology piece can be learned. Uh, that marrying both of them and finding real value in it, that's where the uh, true talent lies. Totally agree uh, with both of you. Like, uh, I mean, this is something that uh, I have also personally observed. A lot of, lot of data scientists focus on uh, like building the best models, but uh, uh, hardly focus on like connecting the dots between the business and like the solutions that need to be built to address the challenges. Uh, that was that was really really insightful. Um, I think we have three more minutes. Maybe I'll ask a futuristic question and then leave uh, any uh, give you, give you guys a chance for any closing comments if you have any. Um, so. What are your views on how AIML would shape your respective industries in the next five to 10 years and how are you preparing for it? And you can also add some closing comments uh, alongside this. Um, in our space, I think it's gonna, it, it's not just the AIML, but overall technology and the IoT is gonna totally transform this industry in this space, which is basically you now we are looking for where the uh, utility is underground at any given point before an excavation can happen. And as uh, the data for that underground utility gets better and the IoT devices that we are using to capture that uh, can collect the information, the relevant and per uh, pertinent data, I think that's what's going to enhance it. And that also goes on to my earlier comment about how do you uh, uh, get this data uh, where it's not coming from a human interaction, a human isn't trying to capture that data, uh, whereas you're systematically capturing it. So I think it'll completely transform, at least in our space over the next you know, five to seven years. Uh, but I think key is always gonna be, how do you get insight from all the data that you collect, right? And that's where the AI ML plays in. Yeah, I, I was, um, yeah, I also agree with your point, I mean, also thinking about from the retail and, and just a broader industry, the data analytics, machine learning will play a more important role every day going forward. And for, for Macy specifically, we're looking at, um, we call it a, a profitable lifetime relationship with our customers by embedding the data, anal data and analytics in everything we do. So this is really taking us to the next level in terms of as I mentioned earlier, you know, how do we build that deep connection with our customers, building that the you know one-on-one -on -one, uh, relationship? One of the uh, recent um, key initiatives uh, as part of Macy's journey is that we are launching a so-called personal style. This is really enabling that as a you individual, as a business uh, Macy's customer, we want to empower you to to build your own style. That means in, in terms of data and intelligence, we've got to really understand who you are, what's your value, and what really makes sense for you to, to define that style, right? And then building intelligence and machine learning on top of that to advance our, our, our capability. But thinking about the scale of that problem, right? We're talking about tens of millions of customers and uh, talking about millions of products. How do we combine those together to really define the style with our customer? And also thinking about in terms of our, you know, the, the digital experience, the marketing experience, the supply chain and store, these are all for the machine learning to play a key role as we're thinking about more of the, the not only the granularity of the decisions to be made and also the speed and scale. This is where really the machine learning is playing such a key role as we're going forward. Um, and uh, I will say really uh, from the retail perspective, I cannot imagine a better time than now to be part of this journey. This is just a, such an exciting um, opportunity for there's a tremendous, tremendous, you know, growth and tremendous impact we can make going forward. And uh, as a, you know, machine learning professional, uh, we have uh, so much growth and so much impact and uh, really exciting journey. Definitely looking forward to much, much more improved uh, shopping experience at Macy's. Thank over you. the next few years. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Amit and Zingshu. It was, it was amazing having you as part of this panel. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'll hand it over to James for the next panel. Thank you, guys.
Thank you, Nandish. Okay, so for the next session, I'm joined by Mohamed Qureshi, um, an assistant professor in systems biology at Columbia University and an expert in the intersection of machine learning and biology. So before we get started, I'll wait for our wait for our photos to come up on screen. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Always strange to start an interview with disembodied voices, but uh, no. hello, Mohammed. So hello, I thought, hello, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you. Um, so I thought let's uh, start with one of those intersections. So uh, uh, protein folding. So uh, for the sake of the audience, could you tell us um, what is protein folding and what does machine learning have to do with that? Sure, uh, that's a pretty bad question, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give it a shot. Um, so, so maybe even before before asking that answering that question, just say what proteins are. So proteins are essentially sort of the working working machines of the cell. Right? So in any in any cell, um, we have molecules that perform functions like transporting molecules or doing cat catalysis, um, things of that sort. And, and and all those machines are essentially powered by proteins. So the proteins are really kind of the building blocks of those machines. Um, now, the way proteins sort of carry their function, at least is in part determined by their structure, by what they look like. Uh, so different proteins have different shapes, and that shape essentially kind of determines the, the, the function of those proteins. Um, so protein folding now to your question is sort of this problem that's been going on, going around for about 50, 60 years, uh, which is asking, you know, can we predict the structure of those proteins, what they look like, uh, essentially based on their amino acid sequence. So on a molecular level, right, a protein is essentially kind of a chain of, of 20 possible amino acids types. Um, and, and it's that sequence that essentially determines the structure. So if we're able to kind of go from the sequence to the structure, we'll, we'll gain tremendous insights into potentially function and, and, and so on. And, and so it's been sort of an open question for a very long time, but there's not been a sort of an easy, simple recipe that describes how that structure comes from sequence. And that's, that's where machine learning comes into play because it sort of potentially allows us to, uh, to build a map that goes from that sequence to the structure. Got it. So yeah, can you tell us, um, so um, can you tell us like, wh when is it that we'll know particularly a sequence, but we won't know the structure? of a protein, when, when does that come up? Um, all the time, I mean, essentially all the time. <laughs> uh, it, it just so happens that determining the sequence is actually fairly straightforward because that comes from, from the DNA, right? So, so genome sequencing, which has been sort of a, you know, now it's a well-established technology has been around for decades. That essentially gives us a, a pretty good idea of, of what the protein sequences will be uh, in, a, in a given genome because we can just read them off the DNA. Uh, structure on the other hand requires much more sophisticated experimental techniques that uh, can be very expensive and, and just very labor intensive. So you know, it used to be that, uh, well, you know, probably 30 years ago, it used to be that the single structure could be a Nobel Prize. <laughs> uh, until recently, a significant structure could be a PhD. Um, and, and now increasingly, obviously, becoming something almost routine. But, but, but on the experimental side, at least, let's say, it, it does remain a, a, a sort of formidable kind of experimental challenge, at least for certain classes of proteins. Okay. So as yeah, so super important if you can, as you say, go quickly from sequence to structure. So uh, I think in the title of this talk, we, we mentioned alpha fold. So let's maybe uh, let's talk about that. So like, you know, what was, you know, what is alpha fold? Why is that significant? What was before? What's after? Like, you know, what was the alpha fold event in protein folding prediction? Sure, sure. Um, so like I said, I mean, this, this is the field that's been going on for a long time. You know, it's, it's not something that's new. People, people have been working on this problem for, for decades, really. Um, and, and in fact, it sort of got formalized in, in, in this sort of competition called CASP, uh, which happens every two years, where essentially groups try to predict structures, um, it, try to predict the, the structures of proteins that, that they don't know. So it's sort of a blind prediction task uh, using computational techniques. Um, and I think it's fair to say that for much of the 2010s and, and certainly the 2000s, the field was somewhat stagnant. Not, not much was really happening. Uh, machine learning sort of began to percolate in the space in the mid 2010s as deep learning sort of became, you know, kind of broadly used in computer vision and other areas. Um, but it wasn't until uh, sort of, well, so, so there was certainly a lot of progress, but I, I would say it wasn't until kind of DeepMind's entry with the first alpha fold in 2018 and then the second alpha fold in 2020 uh, that we really saw the, the kind of the, the conceptual innovations materialize into sort of practical improvements. So, so, so I think there were, there were many ideas that, that were sort of floating around. But so DeepMind managed to kind of put them together in a way that was very effective. Uh, and that really, um, I would say, moved the field from being kind of an, an interesting 
method development exercise, something that, that's of interest to specialists, but not maybe to the broader the biology community and the biomedical community, to now, I think, being of sort of fundamental interest uh, to, to, to the biomedical community. So the methods now work well enough that they're actually interesting for people who don't just care about method development. And that was that was reflected in the fact that I believe it was um, Science Magazine that, that picked putting such a prediction as their breakthrough of the year last year across mm -hmm. all the fields of science. Yeah, so, so you mentioned now that, you know, potentially the, uh, the performance of uh, the uh, structure prediction is sort of good enough that it's, you know, it's no longer about the methods. It's like, okay, well, now we can apply it. It's like now, what do we do with this? So I guess the question is, so what, what is, what has that opened up? What is the new level of performance opened up that we weren't able to consider before? Well, it, it's actually, it's almost hard to say because it's such a broad, you know, I certainly wouldn't have expected this to happen in the next 10, 20 years in a way. So, so I think it, the, the, the the opportunities are so vast that sort of you know, it's almost like you know having the internet all of a sudden like what, what can you do with it and and we, we could we could see what we could do with it in the next few years but I think the really exciting applications will only begin to emerge in the next five to ten years um, but in the immediate term I think that there are sort of obvious things so certainly we would we will be able to now or we already have in a way uh, predict the structures of essentially every protein that we care about um, that will give us insights into their function potentially, right? Because as I said earlier, structure sort of determines function, or at least is related closely to function. Um, so this means that for many proteins, so you know, whose function we didn't know before, suddenly we have some idea, or we, we may begin to have a better idea. This is both useful for my biomedical applications, where you know that may give us something, some insight into the nature of, say, a disease. Um, but it's also potentially interesting for bio, for biomedical or say, bioindustrial applications, bioengineering applications, where one is able to kind of mine protein databases for proteins that could be used in all sorts of interesting, say, chemical, um, you know, uses or even uh, agricultural uses, for example. Um, and on, on the drug discovery side, there's some immediate applications in terms of uh, using these protein structures, these predictive structures to begin to uh, develop drugs that, that bind to them. Um, th this is by no means the kind of the entirety of the drug development process. But at least one key piece of the drug development process is being able to uh, selectively bind a single protein and modulate its function. And having those structures is critical for that purpose. And so this, this, this begins to allow us to do that in a much more systematic uh, way as well. So that, those are some of, some of the immediate kind of applications, but, but, there are, but there are many other ones actually as well. Okay, so if those are the immediate ones, uh, what, are the, what are the blue sky applications? What are the like, you know, 10, 20 years away versions or? Is that is yeah. that too far away to speculate? Is that <laughs> well? I, mean, I, I think I, I, there are there are probably stages. Yes. I mean, I think even on the say the five year time frame, there, there are going to be applications like protein design, where we, where we can potentially design new proteins that have uh, sort of bespoke function that, that we aim for, that we that we intend uh, for intend for them to have, and, and and that I think is going to be sort of a really explosive field in the next few years. Uh, it's already very much a, a sort of a very active and thriving field, but I think this this breakthrough will allow us to to go much further than that. Um, on the longer time horizon, say five to 10 years, I think what would be really interesting is, is going beyond structure to, to dynamics, to be to able to understand the motion of proteins, um, how they come together to form larger complexes and how those complexes essentially begin to carry like carry out cellular function, like I said, as a, as a molecular machine. Um, beyond that, then, then I think, you know, one begins to really think about cell simulations. Right? Can, we, can we take some of the principles that now we've sort of proven out in the context of individual molecules and begin to think about larger assemblies subcellular compartments and even entire cells and, and actually begin to, to simulate their behavior. And that, that I think would be a sort of the 10 to 20 time, 22 uh, year time horizon. That sounds like cool stuff. What, what could you, um, if you can simulate a cell, I mean, like, you know, one of the great scientific achievements, uh, you know, what, do you, what do you do with that? What, if you can, what happens, what can you do? What, yeah, basically what, can you do, what happens next? Right, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so certainly, I mean, there are, let's say, basic science questions, right? That, that will presumably give us much deeper insight into how cells work. I mean, I think, I think on a fundamental level, we don't really understand cells as computer programs. We, we don't really have a kind of a, a clear distillation of their, of their behavior as, as a, from the small to large scale. And th that's just for, for pure science is, is very interesting. Um, but then there are many applications, right? So, so I mean, there are many diseases that are essentially cellular diseases, including, including cancer, for example. So being able to understand how cells work and, and, and get dysregulated uh, will give insight into how, how to modulate their behavior in a way that, 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 that um, reverses disease or stop or, or at least prevents disease. Um, synthetic biology is another application, right? If you're able to, to engineer cells and, and if you understand how cells work, then you can begin to engineer them rationally 
to have new behaviors, for example, breaking down pollutants. Mm -hmm. I think that, so that wouldn't be a bit possible today. Um, even, you know, looking maybe a little bit beyond the 20-year horizon, but even thinking about engineering plants, right? And, you know, so going beyond sort of what we today consider so sort of genetically modified, uh, you know, organisms, but, but really having a kind of much more rational way to potentially come up with all sorts of new organisms, all sorts of new fruits <laughs> or vegetables that, that we sort of can conceive of. Uh, even sort of in the kind of synthetic meat space, that could be really interesting. Coming up with ways you know, in vitro meat that 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 that's sort of much more realistic and, and um, um, uh, that that's much more realistically emulates real meat. Um, and, and there are also interesting uh, areas in sort of you know kind of like you know um, CAR T therapy th things that have on the biomedical side where, where people are beginning to think about ways in sort of engineering cells as cargoes or delivery mechanisms of drugs. Uh, again, in kind of very limited fashion today. But if we're actually able to simulate their behavior, that would give us the capability to engineer them in a kind of much more precise and ambitious way uh, that, that we could currently do. So, so it's, it's very much feels like I, you know, the way I look at it is like you know, when software was in the '80s and '70s, uh, I, I, you know, sort of it, building a new platform that's not that's not sort of tied to silicon uh, substrates, but really kind of integrates very very natively with with the organisms with life. That's an interesting, yeah, interesting parallel. That's um. You know, essentially, if we're just working on proteins right now, but you know, we can then scale that up to larger systems as we're just like, oh well, you know, let the let the compiler deal with that protein. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, okay, that's very cool. Um, so you know, I mean, so maybe sort of coming back to this sort of a smaller time horizon. So you know, potentially we're saying you know we can accelerate certain sort of processes such as you know drug discovery and that sort of thing, um, but. Uh, that means we can also accelerate maybe other processes that are sort of maybe um, less beneficial for the world. So I think, uh, like, what are the, what are the risks associated with this technology, um, or these new capabilities? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think if you had asked me this question a couple of weeks ago, I would have probably said, you know, it, it seems to be one of the the less dangerous sort of applications of ML. Okay. Uh, although just a week ago too, I think there was this interesting paper, you know, a simple and but clever idea where. Uh, there, are, there are these models that try to predict essentially the toxicity of a small molecule, and they typically use it in a way to optimize you know, small molecules to behave in an untoxic fashion, uh, you know, to be used as drugs. Uh, but, but you know, it's not very hard. You know, essentially, you know, you, you, you reverse the gradient in the other direction, and instead of optimizing for uh, low toxicity, you optimize for high toxicity, and yeah. then you suddenly create some you know very dangerous drugs. And you know, th th that particular paper sort of garnered a lot of a lot of attention. Um, Proteins being molecules, you know, have that same same property, right? So, so you, one could imagine sort of generating proteins that that um, that, that are toxic that have also sort of you know unintended intended or un unintended consequences that could potentially be dangerous. Um, certainly, as one begins to to think about engineering organisms and, and things of that sort, which are potentially autonomous in various ways, uh, that's obviously going to, to to raise some very critical questions, right? I mean, and we, we'd have to not just think about them obviously in isolation. But in terms of the environment in which they exist and in, the, in which they, they interact with other 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 uh, organisms, so it will be interesting. I mean, I suspect for the foreseeable future, much of sort of bioengineering and bio industry is going to be constrict, you know, restricted to sort of vats that are that are producing things in controlled environments. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get good enough at this to feel comfortable releasing these things in the wild. Um, but but still, there's been discussion about you know genetically modified mosquitoes that might you know might, might sort of help with you know various kind of uh, epidemics and such. So. Um, like any technology, I think I think I think it's certainly a double-edged sword, and, and, and particularly in the hands of people who are maybe not so um, uh, altruistic. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so, yeah. So, um, I think that sort of really sort of sort of sets the scene for like you know what's possible here, right? Um, but maybe let's uh, talk a little bit about the sort of machine learning side of it. So, you know what. What are the what are the methods involved in the latest and greatest um, protein structure prediction methods? Like what what what's different these days? Yeah, so and I think that this is you know protein folding is, is instructive in that I think it's a it's a window into wider world that I think uh, is, is beginning to open. Right. So so you know in the kind of the, the let's say the whatever the, the, the early 2010s to mid 2010s the kind of first generations of deep learning methods. Uh, much of the focus there was, you know, was on these sort of canonical problems in computer science, things like computer vision, natural language processing, speech recognition, things that people sort of recognize as, as critical, crucial problems for sort of kind of basic uh, elements of, of computer, computer cognition, uh, but, 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 they were, but they were very much tied to these kind of, you know, like kind of classical problems. 
what I think has happened in the last couple of years is, is that there's been sort of growing awareness that there are scientific problems uh, that are really interesting, right? And that, that, that have tremendous you know, benefit to society potentially. Uh, and that, that could both benefit from machine learning, but also derive machine learning in sort of interesting new directions. And I think quitting folding is definitely one of those. Um, so, so, I mean, to your question about what's different about it. Well, um, at a high level, right, what, what's different here is that you're trying to, at least in principle, um, not just have methods or architectures that are able to learn from data, uh, but that are also simultaneously able to reflect prior knowledge about what we, what we understand about these systems, right? And, and this, I think, is, is in some ways fundamentally different from, from things like human speech or, or vision or what have you, where we don't really have a sort of a strong theoretical understanding of the kind of the underlying phenomena, right? If you're seeing you know, images, I mean, images are just such a diverse type of modality. It's really, it's really hard to, to create a theory of, of, of images, right? Uh, but with things like proteins, you know, we actually do have pretty decent biophysical models of what these proteins, uh, how, of how these proteins behave. Um, in some ways, I would say maybe the disappointment if, if, for somebody who's looking in the space is that the, the kind of the leading the machine learning methods haven't used as much biophysics as one it would have thought is possible or could could be done. But nevertheless, they, they are certainly uh, they, they certainly have done so to some extent, right? So, so AlphaFold 2, for example, has all sorts of elements in its architecture that um, you know, captures aspects of, of, if not protein physics, then at least protein geometry. Um, and, and that, that uh, is at least partly responsible for the fact that they work as well as they have, right? So it's really kind of given machine learning in this new direction that, that I think makes it much more, makes it less about general learning and more about sort of being able to kind of maximally extract information out of well understood domains. Interesting. So I was wondering if there's um, maybe a slight parallel there. You, you mentioned, um, say, you know, computer vision, like at least so the initial methods, absolutely, there were, there were no constraints. Like it was just, you know, here's an image and then very generic looking architecture to process it. Um, but I guess more and more people are turning to simulation as a source of data. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, potentially, you know, using simulation for inputs to vision systems have any parallels to the idea of like using sort of the knowledge of physics um, as applied to um, other systems or is that not a parallel to draw? No, no, I think it's an excellent parallel to draw. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, well, <laughs> in some ways it's, it's, you could argue it's already been applied to some degree with AlphaFold 2 because w one of the ways in which AlphaFold 2 was trained was using, using the, the self-distillation procedure where, um, you know, essentially an, an early vision of the model was used to make high confidence predictions uh, of certain proteins. And then that was used as data to kind of train the model. So, so you know, data augmentation using sort of self, self distillation, but that was already kind of a, 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 an inkling of what could be done with using these sort of approaches. Um, I think where, where simulations will be, will be really exciting is actually on the dynamics question, right? So, because we do have models, um, you know, and, and simulation methods that are effective, at least for small proteins. Uh, to simulate their behavior over time, right? to simulate how they move, how they might interact with, with small molecules, for example. This is particularly important for drug discovery. Um, these are very expensive computations. So, so these are not things that you could sort of kind of, you know, turn the crank on. But nonetheless, um, it, it sort of, it, it proposes a way to essentially turn compute into data, right? And I think once you have that, that's a very, very powerful paradigm. Because if you couple these sort of expensive computations that are generating data in, 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 in silico data, but still data that's quite, quite useful to then train a machine learning model that's potentially much more efficient in terms of doing service inference, uh, then you can have, you can potentially have a sort of a, a really kind of virtuous loop, right, cycle that, that sort of keeps driving this towards kind of ever higher heights in terms of its, in terms of accuracy and, 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 and quality of prediction. So uh, it hasn't happened yet. This is not something that, that, that's really been kind of broadly applied or tried. There are, there are significant challenges, but I, but I think that is where the space will, will, will move in the next few years. Okay. So, I mean, again, maybe on the theme of sort of the intersection of uh, science and machine learning, I mean, what are some other sort of uh, threads in this space that you're particularly interested in at the moment? There are many. So, I mean, certainly in kind of, let's say in my backyard of say biochemistry, broadly speaking. Um, so uh, yeah, within protein, there's protein structure prediction, but there are, but there are kind of uh, proximal problems, things like you know, the inference problem, can you design proteins? Uh, can you predict interaction partners? Can you predict you know, things of like that? So, so related to proteins. 
Um, but then you go a little bit further out to chemistry and, and it gets very interesting right away because there the question then becomes, you know, can you predict, for example, the properties of different chemical compounds? Uh, can you predict their toxicity? Right? As we talked about earlier, can you predict whether they're going to modulate a protein? Are they going to bind it? Are they going to inhibit it? Are they going to, prom to promote its activity? Those are all really interesting questions. Um, lower down on at the, sort of the quantum mechanical level, the, 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 there's been a lot of progress on essentially kind of speeding up quantum mechanical calculations. So, so those are calculations that are, again, based on sort of very well understood theory, but that are, you know, inordinately expensive to, 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 to do. Um, so it sort of limited the applicability of these kind of quantum mechanical systems to, you know, very, very simple, you know, atomic systems, you know, a handful of atoms or really even ha a handful of electrons. Um, but, but what machine learning has managed to do is, is sort of um, boost this so that one is able to, uh, to train models that, that are, that are as good as these very carefully constructed physical models, but that are orders of magnitude faster. Um, and, and so, so that, that's sort of, you know, that's, that's one, one example, which I think will have um, tremendous applications, not just in, in, in sort of biomedicine, but even in things like designing, you know, small, um, sorry, designing new molecules for things like, um, you know, energy applications or, or new solar cells, or, you know, types of types of new, new chemistries, essentially kind of material science type of applications. That I think is, is, is really exciting um, as well. Um, and then beyond that, certainly not my areas of expertise, but I mean, there's been you know, quite, quite a bit of work in, in, in physics and in other areas. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, DeepMind actually, they published a paper on essentially controlling a you know, fusion reactor, um, you know, a small fusion reactor using, using sort of reinforcement learning techniques. Um, so my sense, I think this is true for DeepMind, but maybe perhaps even for the broader community as a whole, is that kind of hard science is being increasingly seen as a really interesting place to go. Uh, both because the, the payoff is higher, but also because it sort of exercises machine learning in, in new ways. Um, and so I, I expect the trend to continue. That's it's very exciting stuff. I mean, personally, when I hear things like this, I, I get a little bit more optimistic for the future and maybe, maybe in terms of climate and that sort of thing, where there's, there's maybe there's still a chance that we can tech our way out of this. Like, I, I know, what's, your, what's your view on that? Are we, are we going to we're going to create some new organisms that you know, eat up what we what we don't want and produce what we do. Like, like, what, what are the, what are the, what, are the, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think it's very hard to predict, right? And, and partly because I think it's so. So certainly, it feels to me like we have the the the, the building blocks to create technology that is potentially very transform transformative, right? For for all these various problems, you know, climate, uh, disease, etc. Um, but at the same time, I mean, there are, there are challenges, right? Both sort of in terms of just kind of timing, right? so, you know, the, the speed at which the climate potentially is changing, but also more sociological problems, right? I mean, things like bioterrorism and so on, you know, where, where okay, you create new, new toxic materials that could then potentially be quite problematic, right? So it's a bit hard to say what, what, what will win. And I think it has as much to do with, with technology as it does with sort of, you know, the way we've arranged society, if you may. Um, and and th th that I think is, is, is sort of, again, like very unpredictable. But I, I do think in terms of, you know, if we were able to sort of marshal our resources in a kind of a fairly ideal way and, and kind of coordinate across, you know, across within and across countries, I suspect the technology certainly is there. I don't, I don't think that there's a kind of a problem that's not insurmountable given what we have and given what we know. Um, it's just more, more a matter of, of, of all the kind of the, of all the pieces falling in the right place at the right time. And, and that I think is, is hard to predict. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, do we have any, yeah, is there any, um, do we have any measures? Like, are there any sort of like, concrete sort of observable effects of like um, machine learning applying to science? Like have we seen accelerations in certain scientific areas or is it still sort of at the like possibility excitement stage? I think so. I mean, I think it was at the possibility stage, you know, up to a year ago, year and a half ago. I, I think what we've seen now in multiple areas, but 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 I, I would certainly pick protein folding as maybe the, the, the kind of the clearest shining example. Right? The, the, this is one area where it's a problem that's been a knot for decades, right? And, and I think would, would have remained a knot for at least another decade or two. Uh, it, it, it's something that we thought maybe in, in 2040, we'd be able to kind of compute our way through it using kind of brute force. Um, but we saw this kind of massive acceleration, uh, you know, using, using machine learning. So, so I, I, this, I mean, you know, like I said, a break, breakthrough of the year. So the, clearly something kind of Nobel prize worthy that, that was done. Um, and, I, and I don't see any reason why this cannot be replicated in other areas. The stuff that I mentioned in infusion, those areas, again, not my area of expertise, but I think it's a bit more, say, early days. Um, but, but the ingredients, at least for the biochemical applications are there, right? I mean, it has to do with, you know, with data. Um, it has to do with sort of, you know, having some understanding of the underlying, uh, like I said, kind of biophysics um, and having the, the will to sort of, you know, build these models. So, so all of that is there, I suspect. Uh, so so I, I do think, 
things proximal to this space. I mean, I, that, that I, I can say with, I think with certainty, we'll see, we'll see substantial improvement over the next 10 years. I think the field will look dramatically different, almost unrecognizably different uh, in 10 years from now. You know, the field be, being, you know, anything having to do with molecular biology and, and, and you know, sort of related areas, uh, because, because this will just kind of percolate through all those various problems that haven't yet been solved, but we can just kind of see the answers now, uh, given, given the breakthroughs in protein folding. Uh, actually, maybe speaking of like, so some of those that maybe areas of problems where we haven't quite got the answers yet, but we can sort of see a path forward. What, what are the, um, what are your, what are some of the most interesting, like open problems still, like, you know, what, what can't we do, but we're real, this is probably the next thing to work on. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, so one class is sort of other types of molecules. So it's like RNA, for example, you know, we, we know RNA takes on a three structure. Uh, we, we know it's functional. It also behaves a bit like proteins. In fact, we think that early life relied on RNA as it's sort of work, you know, as workhorse machinery. And it wasn't until later that proteins actually evolved. Uh, and and, and we, we, see, we see evidence of that in our, own, in our own genomes where, you know, for example, the ribosome is, is actually a kind of a riboprotein machine. So it's comprised, uh, comprises both RNA and, and proteins. Um, so being able to do the same thing for RNA as proteins will be, will be very exciting. Uh, it's, it's more challenging uh, in part because we understand a lot less uh, of, of, sort of RNA biophysics, but also because we have a lot less data. So while in the, in the, in the protein case, we had maybe something like 50,000, say unique protein structures uh, that, that were very crucial for, for training these models. Um, on RNA, it's probably more like a few hundreds. Uh, so, so it's a much more of a low data regime kind of, kind of task. Um, and the protein problem itself, there are really interesting questions that still remain kind of outside the preview of alpha, alpha fold. So, so one that's of sort of kind of immense biological uh, importance is the impact of genetic variation, right? So, so you know, we simply know that that our bodies differ in terms of their um, proteins. Uh, we, we know they're called coding regions, and those regions have have genetic variations in them, both kind of just natural variation, but also sometimes somatic mutations that are, that arise in in the uh, course of life, and that could lead to disease. Uh, but we, but AlphaFold can't yet, and, and none of the, really, the current methods can model how a mutation is going to impact the structure of a protein, not, not reliably anyway. Uh, okay. and that, that would be very useful, obviously, for, for biomedical applications. So that, that's sort of an obvious next step that I think a lot of people are interested in. Yeah. So when you say it, it um, struggles at that moment, um, what, 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 is the, what is the failure mode or like why can't it get at that, so, you know, the impact of a mutation? Yeah. So... It, 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 it has in part a little to do with how it actually works, how AlphaFold works. Um, and, and, and many of those methods, not just AlphaFold, but essentially a good chunk of the, the field relies on this idea. So, so the idea is that you, you're going to predict protein structure essentially by looking at what's called co-evolution. So, so you look at um, similar proteins to the one you're interested in, and you observe how different amino acids in those proteins co-evolve, how they change in conflict with one another. Uh, but by doing that, you, you're able to essentially kind of infer um, correlations across evolutionary time that correspond to correlations in, in the 3D structure itself. And then there's that kind of mapping between evolutionists and 3D structure that, that allows them to predict these structures reliably. So the reason why I mention all this is because in the, con so, so the, the key kind of requirement to make, it, to make a reliable prediction is not only that you have the sequence of interest, but that you have many other sequences, all of which are related to it across sort of evolutionary time. Um, so in some sense, the predictions are, are like an average across all those various sequences. They're, they're kind of averaging, those, averaging this data to extract a single structure out. Um, so so you know, that might give a hint as to why the genetic variation thing doesn't work. Because now if you, have a, if you have two sequences, which vary by a single amino acid, but that somehow suddenly have a very different structure as a result of that, that sort of is, is kind of, that falls to the cracks, right? That's outside the purview of the model because the model is essentially trying to kind of average away all these differences to get, to get at the common core. And, and so, so it's not sensitive to these kinds of changes that are really, um, that are really consequential, but they're consequential in a kind of very sensitive way. And you know, sort of a single change just, you know, have a dramatic effect on the structure. It, it, it's, it, it tries to avoid in a way those kinds of signals and, and, and focuses on the, on the kind of common signals. So by construction almost, it's not really suited for this task. Got it. Okay. So, I mean, can we view that as maybe like it's sort of, um, sort of too inclined to predict the usual and hasn't quite fully under, like, hasn't quite fully mapped out the full probability distribution of like the rare events, or is it, is that, isn't that not the right parallel to draw there? It isn't, it isn't. It's, it, so, it is partly about rare events. That's very true. I mean, and many of these mutations are, in fact, quite rare. Um, but it's also, I would say, it's sort of a, 
it's a, it's a kind of sampling of the space and a kind of mapping of the space that is not quite exactly the, the problem you want, right? So you're not, in, in truth, you're not really mapping from individual sequences to structure. You're mapping from kind of constellations of sequences to structure, right? So, so the, the kind of the, 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 almost the, the framing of the problem is different, right? It's, it's, what we want is something that goes from a single sequence to the final structure. What we have is something that goes from a, a family of related proteins to the structure. That's fine in, most, in, in many applications, including like the ones we've been talking about, but specifically for the application in which you very much care about those kind of sensitive changes, this kind of breaks down because, because it's the single sequence becomes kind of the key, the key determinant of the structure. Got it. Okay. So, and I'm just, we've got a couple of questions coming in. So let me just take a look at some of these. So I have one from Jan. Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, this might be a future looking question, but maybe there's a, a near time variety of it. So the question about, you know, could you, could you write, uh, could these systems uh, potentially take into account all, you know, medical data that we might have about a particular person? So I, I think what we're getting at there is, you know, sort of personalized medication. Is that, is that something that's more opened up by this sort of technology looking forward? I think so. And, 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 I, and I think it's the kind of application that, it's one of those things that I, I talked about earlier. It, it's a, it sort of begins to point toward things that are maybe possible, but that we hadn't even sort of considered before because they just so, they were so out of the realm of the possibility in a way. Uh, but I think it's, it's definitely an interesting idea to think about. All right, well, now that I have the kind of the, the full complement of human proteins, and I could, well, so, so again, you would need this, this bit I talked about. You would need to be able to not just look at the average structure, but you need to understand the specific sequence in an individual. But if you get to that, and I think we will get to that, you know, soon enough. Uh, I, I think we would have a much richer sort of representation. Uh, upon which to build kind of uh, uh, upon which to build precision medicine, right? I mean, it, you know, it, it's it's already being built on the kind of the genomic picture, and, and that's quite rich. But maybe it hasn't quite given us as many insights as we as we would liked. Um, but, but but I think the kind of the kind of the protein level is is yet another is yet another degree of sophistication that is much closer to things like disease. It's it's, it's not obviously quite the same thing. You still you still some distance away from that, but you're much closer to it than you would with just pure genetics. Uh, and, and so I, I do think just purely from that perspective, this will certainly have, have, have a, a positive impact. And, and, but, but it's early days. It's not, we're not there yet. And, and I think, you know, off fall, obviously, I mean, it just became publicly available like four months ago. So it, it still remains very much kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a work in progress. But, but that's why I see things moving in the next few years, I think. Very good. In the follow-up to their question, they uh, say, you know, could, could such a system even, you know, give it recommendations on what to eat or that sort of thing, which, you know, I'd, I'd certainly love if finally we could settle a debate about, you know, what diets are actually good. Um, but I imagine that might be, uh, that's going to take a, a little while, I would guess, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that stuff is closer. But. Yeah, th that has probably less to do with the human genetics. I mean, at least I think at that level and probably more has to do with things like, you know, micro microbial, uh, micro microbiome and microbial sort of environment in, in one's guts. I think, um, I think this will help in that in that in that task because it, it sort of again gives us a better way to kind of reason about microbes than we had before um but but it's certainly yes i mean certainly a, a, a few steps to move because the things like nutrition and foods are you know a result of sort of interactions and and, and uh, phenomena that sort of is dependent on proteins but obviously kind of goes much much further down down in terms of the complexity ladder so so so, so that that i would say is still some time out okay uh, interesting uh yeah, the two word question here, but I think evocative certainly. The two words are longevity, proteins, question mark. Uh, so do you have anything to say on that in relation to all this? Well, so, I mean, uh, yeah, possibly. I mean, this is not, this is not my area of expertise, but I, but I would say again, I mean, somewhat generic answers, but, but I, I will kind of try to customize them to this question, which is um, one, this will give us insights into, into protein function and behavior and therefore, um, ways in which aging may be sort of grounded in proteins. And at least in SOFA, I mean, it's, it's almost certainly the case that aging is grounded in many factors, but in SOFA, it's grounded in proteins. This could potentially give us some insight into that. Right? So that, that, that I think would be useful uh, from, from, from that perspective, but it won't be the full picture to be sure, but it will be maybe part of the picture we didn't quite have uh, before. Um, the other aspect is, is more on the therapeutic angle, guys, which is that, um, you know, if we're able to synthesize new proteins that have new functions, that could be could ultimately be a you know a powerful weapon in kind of the fight against aging. Right? So, so if, if we're you know if we if we begin to understand which proteins sort of become 
um, maybe less effective at their function over time in, in the human proteome, you know, can we supplement with sort of new proteins that, that sort of, you know, that, that, that cover for them, that essentially kind of, you know, that, 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 that try to fill in what, what these proteins have, have uh, left gaps. Um, so, so it's in that sense, which I think this, this will potentially be useful, but, but this really is sort of at a very high level. It's certainly not something kind of very specific to the aging question. You could say this about any disease, essentially, or any, any kind of health problem, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got um, another question here. Um, so talking about um, quantum computing. So, so you mentioned that uh, you know, techniques like ML techniques are being used to uh, being applied to simulation of quantum mechanical systems. Um, maybe turning this around, it's uh, are you obviously? I presume there is research into if we get quantum computing really going, how it could be applied to, for example, protein folding. Um, is that something that you follow? Do you have some thoughts to share on that? So quantum computing or quantum chemistry? Uh, so we've got computing here, but I'm interested in either. Yeah, so with, with, with quantum computing, it's a little bit hard to say because, because there again, the, the algorithms are fairly limited to what, what you can actually apply them to. Uh, the area where I think people have been excited, so, so there, there, there's actually a bit of subtlety here. So, so I said quantum chemistry, but, but even with quantum computing, there's the idea of being of saying, okay, can we actually simulate quantum, quantum mechanically systems using quantum computers, right? So essentially, essentially mapping the behavior of a quantum mechanical system using quantum computers, right? Um, that is a potential interest, certainly, for, for things like protein folding, or at least, say, protein small molecule interactions. Uh, but my sense of where quantum computing is and where it needs to be to be able to, you know, sort of a sufficiently high, large scale to actually inform this question, I think that's, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty, we're pretty far away from that. Um, but, but, but that would be, that would be the, the one area where I suspect um, the, so this class of problems could be useful, essentially as quantum mechanical simulations, you know, quantum computing as simulations of nature. Um, so that, that's, that's sort of one bucket. Um, the other thing I kind of, I, I alluded to in the very beginning. So, so like I said, there's a lot of interest in using machine learning to, to do quantum chemistry better, uh, not quantum computing. And, and there, I think, I think that is very, very promising because I suspect um, for certain problems, particularly things like say, interactions between small molecules and proteins, uh, where there are things that happen that are sort of difficult to model using classical approaches. For example, some molecules covalently bond to a, a protein. So, so they actually change the chemical structure of that protein. And those are the kind of things that are very, very difficult to do with what are called kind of classical methods that are very kind of cheap computationally, but they are not sensitive enough and not accurate enough to be able to capture that. Quantum chemical methods are, but they're very expensive. Uh, so if we're able to use machine learning to kind of speed up their, 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 their application, um, then they could potentially open up sort of new, new, new uh, opportunities in drug discovery alleys, certainly, and I think material science that are not possible today. Uh, so so, so, so that, that, that direction, I think, is, is much more immediately kind of um, applicable in still the next few years, I would say. Okay. Um, I'm just looking through the question. Actually, I mean, <laughs> this one may be uh, anyway, a little bit off topic, but I mean, of general interest and maybe, I mean, I think maybe of interest to people like interested in the field. So someone just remarking that maybe traditionally biologists tend to use the programming language R more than maybe data science firmly entrenched in Python. Um, with ML being applied in this area, um, are your students switching languages or uh, um, basically people well-versed in Python and all the data science uh, ecosystem, could they come and work in uh, the application of, of uh, ML to biology these days? Or yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I would say, you know, my work and, and, and the, the, the field as a whole, the, the, lesson, the kind of field of machine learning applied to, to bio, that's, that's been sort of Python native for a very long time. Uh, and none of us really are sort of R people. Uh, the, the people who do rely on R, it's not untrue, are people who are generally doing kind of more statistical analysis. People coming from genetics, from population genomics, in those areas where, 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 you know, they're not really doing machine learning per se, but they, they apply kind of quantitative and statistical methods to, to questions in, in, in biology. Um, Despite them both being kind of quantitative and say computer computer savvy, let's say that these are <laughs> kind of disjoint populations somehow, uh, for, for better or worse. Uh, there, there's maybe one kind of common common subgroup, which is people who are doing kind of Bayesian 
uh, you know, based on parametric models, people mm -hmm. doing probabilistic programs who are maybe say trying to kind of model population structure, things of that sort, and who could maybe are maybe bilingual and kind of speak with, with both populations. Um, but at least people in kind of my space, people who kind of thinking about say supervised machine learning, kind of classically apply, you know, deep learning, those kinds of things, um, um, we're, we're also, you know, Pythonistas, I would say. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm glad I asked. It's good just to get a feel for these things sometimes. Yes, yes, sure. okay. uh, all right, and I think uh, we're coming close to time. So, I mean, we've got four minutes left. Is there anything that uh, is there anything that I haven't asked that you really want to like let everyone know about in this area? Or, well, one thing I will say. I mean, I kind of alluded to it, but I don't think I quite said it. Um, what I think is exciting about these problems, right, is that they, they are exercising machine learning in sort of new ways that I think maybe doesn't get exercised in, in like I said, computer vision and those other fields. So for example, you know, low data regimes, right? You know, I, I refer to problems where we have a hundred data points or even 10 data points, right? Uh, where potentially one can, can leverage a lot of prior knowledge, uh, but, 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 but fundamentally the kind of the specific problem is really very constrained on the data side. That's one area. Um, another is, is again, kind of the prior knowledge, right? So this prior knowledge is not, not simple. This is very structured knowledge. It often has mathematical structure, especially in the case of molecules, where you think about you know kind of group theoretic constructions, you know things that are ideas from physics about the the kind of the symmetries that you see in space and things of that sort. So so on the whole, I think this opens up sort of new directions for ML research that that, that are not sort of available or that are not necessarily maybe kind of leveraged or needed in kind of classical areas. And so so if, you know if you're an ML person and you're thinking about sort of interesting domains that are not just about taking the latest kind of, you know, network architecture, the sort of latest variant of the transformer and applying it to, to your problem, but really something which kind of leverages and um, sort of deep expertise and, and, and sort of pushes the boundaries of what you could do with ML. I think, I think sort of molecular, molecular problems in general and, and bio ones in particular are, are a really good place to be. All right, we have, I think we can fit in one last question. And I'm picking this question because I don't understand it. So that's a Nice deep one. So, do you see ambiguous results for tertiary structure predictions owing to conform conformational changes in macromolecular structure? For example, NTP ASES or EGF receptor? Yes, I mean, that, that's definitely the case. I mean, and that's one good thing about Alphold, right? Is that it, when it makes predictions, it predicts them, it gives you a confidence, right? It gives you sort of a, an uncertainty, um, you know, um, self assessment of every residue of every region of the protein. And, and it's certainly been the case that the ones that our low confidence seems to be highly variable and, and, and do undergo conformational changes. Um, I think what's challenging right now is that we don't quite, you know, we don't have a good way of, of really um, characterizing the distribution of our kind of conformations that emerges from those, from those predictions. And that's, I think, one other kind of key, key next step is being able to kind of not just represent a single structure, but really a distribution of our structural ensembles or, you know, conformations. Great. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, with that, I think we will hand over to the next speaker. So with that, Mohammed, thank you very much for your time. And fascinating. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. All right, I think we're now handing over to uh, Bindu and others for, yes. well, let's Bindu introduce. Absolutely. Thank you so much, James, for uh, that great session. And so uh, in our uh, next session, we always do the session as part of our uh, a virtual conference. Uh, I'm always excited for it. Uh, it is about AI and ML platforms. We have an excellent, fantastic panel. I know all three of these gentlemen really well. So thank you, all of you. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for coming and thank you for participating in our uh, uh, conference. And uh, so let's just kick this off. Maybe each of you can spend like two or three minutes introducing yourself uh, and telling us a little bit about uh, you know how, uh, how you've been uh, kind of involved in the AI ML space, we can do alphabetically if that makes sense. So that will be Alan, Miguel, and Jishuan. Z. Hopefully I'm getting your name right, pronunciation. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Bindu. Um, so I'm Alan Armin, I'm in Seattle, Washington, and I'm a data scientist with the target owned delivery service company, Ships. Um, I'm in my fourth week at Ship actually, so I'm, I'm pretty fresh here. At Ships, I lead and manage a data science team responsible for predicting of the fulfillment time for different stages of our driven orders. Um, so shipped, you know, if you think of like Instacart, uh, DoorDash, uh, for shipped, you know, we have both shoppers and we have drivers. And what I'm responsible for is on the driven side and understanding how do the different um, legs of that journey uh, work and how long does each one take. Um, before shipped, I previously worked at DocuSign and customer success operations, developing 
uh, recommendation engines um, and A-B testing systems. Expedia, I worked in ad technology. I did an experiment design and developing uh, machine learning models that helped optimize uh, the ad experience. And before then, uh, the majority of my career, which almost is like another life now, uh, was with the Federal Reserve conducting macroeconomics uh, and policy research. Welcome, Alan. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Vindu and Abacus, for the invitation. Uh, pleasure being with you, Alan and Juan. So I'm Miguel Barez. I'm a VP of Data Science at uh, Albertsons, and I've been with Albertsons since October, so just recently. Uh, before that, I um, I, I was in Peru working for uh, one of the largest conglomerates uh, with uh, 10 different industries within their portfolio. So banking, fishing, hospitality, mining, healthcare, insurance, et cetera. Um, just creating teams and creating value uh, with AI machine learning within the portfolio. So very much like a private equity fund and trying to just not do uh, value potential analysis and throw machine learning models at interesting uh, problems. Uh, I had a lot of fun and then moved back to the States uh, just recently. Um, at Albertsons, we're basically trying to um, just create value for our customers through just machine learning, data science, and around the lines of personalization, around the lines of supply chain optimization, predicting out of stock, the usual things one does in, in retail. And I'm um, excited to be here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Xi Chen. Uh, I'm senior manager for the recommendation data science um, at Home Depot. Uh, so I have been with Home Depot for almost seven years um, in July, in June. Uh, so I have been working on recommendations since then uh, as an individual contributor. Now I'm uh, the senior manager on the team. Uh, and my team is responsible for the recommendation and the personalization algorithm that powers HomeDepot.com. Uh, a lot of interesting work um, uh, happening in my group. Uh, I, I would like to share that uh, in the later panel discussions. Um, before I joined Home Depot, I was a um, senior um, engineer in, uh, at Qualcomm in California. I was um, uh, had the opportunity to play with deep learning very early on and uh, doing many uh, exciting research on computer vision uh, at Qualcomm. Uh, yeah, so that's my experience. Well, welcome everybody. Let's get started. I'm always excited to talk to practitioners. Uh, you know, it's one thing to talk to researchers, the other thing to talk to practitioners and practicing and applying machine and deep learning is always like, I would say, to, uh, you know, uh, is the hard, is the hard problem, right? Let's start actually with uh, uh, Zishuan. Uh, I know Home Depot is uh, one of those very, uh, I would say, um, strange unicorn-like companies in the sense that uh, you guys are applying deep learning in production. Uh, and you're doing it for what I think makes a lot of sense, right? Personalization and recommendation and search and stuff like that. Uh, I do the, uh, so I, we would love to hear about what got you started on that journey to the extent that you can share. Uh, why is it effective? Because, you know, generally amongst data scientists, deep learning has a bad name. I'm sure <laughs> you've heard that too, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, and why at least uh, in these areas, it's, uh, you know, it, it could potentially be slam dunk to apply these techniques. Uh, yeah, a great question. So, uh, yeah, as I said, I, were, I was very fortunate uh, to be one of the first to play with deep learning. So at, in, at Qualcomm, uh, 2013, and I went to the NIPS 2013, that's where um, uh, I think uh, uh, Hinton was presenting the AlexNet work and uh, Yang Lacon was hired into Facebook and uh, Ma uh, Mark Zapper was it appeared in NIPS trying to recruit uh, their scientists to Facebook. So um, yeah, so I was very lucky to play with deep learning, but I wasn't very sure deep learning can be used in enterprise uh, setting. Um, because it's very computational expensive. Uh, but luckily, uh, Google published one paper about you know, how YouTube used deep learning to, uh, to power their recommendation. I was like, wow, uh, this, this, is gonna, uh, this is gonna work. I mean, it works at a YouTube scale, it's gonna work at Home Depot scale as well. Um, yeah, then I, 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 look, I uh, started look, uh, reading that paper and looking about relevant uh, technology can make it happen. Then I noticed that, yes, there's a technology. It's, it's not, if you want to just do deep learning as it is, no, it's, gonna, it's not gonna scale. 
you have to do in a smart way. There is the technology that enable deep learning uh, can be used in enterprise uh, in an affordable way, right? So this is from technology perspective. But from business, we always have always have this need. Uh, at Home Depot, um, because when you have a use case that dealing with images and the text, and you want to understand the semantic meaning of the text, I think you probably, deep learning is the only option for you at, at this point to dealing with them, right? So it's um, a necessity. It's not just luxury to have, it's a necessity. And it's very like Home Depot, like we have some use cases, we do need to understand the image and the uh, text in order to uh, serve the better uh, recommendation for our customers, right? Uh, so yeah, we, we you it's deep learning just necessity. It's not a luxury or good to have. Um, the other uh, reason is uh, a better customer service. That's that's very uh, true to the heart to Home Depot. You know, Home Depot when, when Home Depot was a brick and mortar store. That's uh, Home Depot's uh, secret to be successful as well. The customer service in store. Uh, but in the e-commerce era, uh, how do you do customers online? Right through so search recommendation, those digital uh, customer service. Uh, those are problems are hard. Like you're dealing with human problems, right? How how do you serve a, a, pe a person in a you know intimate way, uh, right? Like uh, customer intact with Home Depot um, through different touch points, store, um, website, app, uh, right? The, the different channels, then have different interactions. Talk to associate, you know, call to call center. Click on a product, you know, purchase a product, uh, search some uh, words on your uh, uh, on your website. Those interactions, so many types, and they are their interaction are very nonlinear. How do you figure out? How do you distill signal, useful signal, out of those multimodal complex interactions? I think probably today only deep learning is only viable technology to do that. Uh, therefore, I think, yeah, yeah, deep learning is very useful to help people at this point. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Uh, what you're saying is it's going to be inevitable, probably like all every company everywhere is soon going to adopt it because there's no choice between language when I mean, you have language data or vision data. And it also is performant, right? In, in, yeah. in the cases of personalization and things like that, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Uh, OK, let's uh, kind of switch tracks a bit uh, and I'm um, like trying to actually really kind of go into your a uh, little bit into your backgrounds and like uh, ask questions which might be relevant. So let's go to Miguel. And I know Miguel was kind of leading up um, AIML at a very large bank in Latin America, he decided to come to the US and join Albertsons specifically. So Miguel, what made you decide on Albertsons? I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting that we have Home Depot and Albertsons, <laughs> similar but so different. So, uh, you know, uh, what attracted you to Albertsons? Huh? Yeah, uh, so I, first of all, I, I was excited to join a company that had a purpose that I could align to. So Albertsons' purpose is to bring people together around the joys of food and to sp inspire well-being. And I really like that. Uh, purpose. And I think finding a company that you can align your purpose to is fundamental because you really like will bring the most to it. Right. And, and, and you'll just find that you're working towards something. So I really like that. Um, the concept of well-being is something that's very important for me. Right? So the question of how can we uh, uh, promote and foster well-being for our customers being a grocery chain, which we also have pharmacies. Uh, that was really exciting. Second, uh, joining a company that is transforming itself and pushing to transform an industry. That was also very exciting. Um, Albertsons is investing heavily and has been investing heavily in technology and digital and customer centricity um, and data science. So just joining a company like that was super interesting. Um, and finally, I just was very excited to join a company whose uh, leadership team has both vision and ambition, like the, the ambition we have to transform ourselves and push uh, the boundaries of the industry are, are big. And that was something that I was very excited from the CEO Vivek to Chris Ruff, Daniel Kropp, um, everyone there. Uh, in general, I like being a part of, of change. And while I was uh, at this uh, conglomerate in Peru for eight years and working on different industries and different in, uh, use cases, so not only banking, but insurance and all the different companies I mentioned, um, I, was, I never worked on retail. And it was very exciting to, to think about coming and joining a retail company because you have first party data and you can really get to know the customer well, right? So figuring out what people buy, what they consume, what they eat, that's like very, very 
um, a, a great way to really get to know our customers and be able to create and adapt our value proposition for them. So that was something else that was very interesting. Um, and, and I think uh, we do, I, I can probably share a couple of things we're doing. Um, um, in, the, in the context of what I mentioned of really getting to know our customers, uh, one of the most important things I think is personalization, right? Because what is important for our customers varies. And so getting to know them, getting to understand their behaviors, their spending behaviors, what they eat, what they prefer, how often, et cetera, um, that is super interesting. And we can really use machine learning for that to really personalize our offer, to understand those patterns. Uh, the other thing that we're working on and is aligned with our, our, our mission is how can we help our customers, if they want so, to live a healthier life? So how can we infer what their dietary preferences are? How can we help them plan their meals? How can we help them suggest what are products that could be more aligned with their objectives, right? So, so everything around nutrition and health and, and, and food, uh, we're working on that and we think we can really leverage our position and help our customers. Fantastic, fantastic. And Alan, you and Jishwan actually have been practitioners, uh, you know, quite recently. So you know kind of all the troubles uh, and the pains of data science. Uh, what do you think about uh, data science? Uh, and both of you moved to management, by the way. So my first question is, okay, so, you know, what made you uh, make that jump, A, and B, uh, you know, what are like the, no, the highlights, lowlights of being a data scientist? Yeah, I, I can go first. So uh, in terms of what make, made me make that jump, um, I love helping people. I love, you know, uh, thinking about what is the strategic move we can make? How can we, uh, as managers, as leaders, prevent our direct reports from being as randomized and stressed? Um, how can we move forward in it as a team um, and, and drive business value? And, you know, I love being a practitioner too. Uh, I love getting my hands dirty. I love solving a problem. And, you know, going back and forth and uh, I was actually a manager earlier in my career too, um, and I recently decided that I really just missed um, that more strategic leadership level uh, work. And luckily, I found a role uh, with Shift where I can I can get my hands dirty and be a leader at the same time. So and, you want any thoughts? Oh, sorry, um, pros and cons of data science because you know oh, that's like yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, um, you know, I'm. The, the, the pro is you can be up at midnight looking at the data and the con is you can be up at midnight looking at the data. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it's funny. I, I actually look at, uh, you know, some of the stuff that we do with our customers, uh, you know, I, 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 I enjoy it a lot, very honestly, because there's secrets in the data, right? Unlocking that could be interesting. So I couldn't agree more about looking at the data in the midnight, pro and con. Jishwan, what about you? Yeah, yeah, I think data science, uh, you know, I moved from individual contributor to manager doesn't mean manager is a better job than individual contributor. I think data science is a very good job. Uh, job, And also, I think doing machine learning in industry, uh, I personally think it's more fun in, 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 in academia uh, because uh, the problem are very fresh. And, and the very diverse, especially in, in retail e-commerce. Let's just, I, I would say this is the best arena to do data science. It's just the type problem, very diverse image, tax, uh, you know, cu uh, customer behavior, uh, conversation. So you name it, all, all kinds of like fraud. We also have fraud pro problem as well. So it's just any type of problem we have it. Right? In the industry setting, not only problem that were real, very fresh, but also we perform A-B tests. Right? In the A-B tests, you can see the incremental value your algorithm contribute to be the organization, organization quantitatively, right? How, how, how rewarding that can be, right? You, you, I think it's really hard, like in many jobs, you, 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 you maybe can contribute to organization, but you don't know how much, you don't know how much, but it, I hope you hold you know how much it is. We do A-B tests, very scientific way of, uh, to prove, uh, prove that, right? And also, um, and also it's, uh, it's about um, team collaboration. We have all, like, we have all kinds of, uh, oh, another thrill is just very simple. Like your algorithm is powering one experience. You can point to your friends, your families. I know how I know how this works. It's just very exciting. I I, I talk I, I talk this way to one of our uh, my candidates. I just show them 
uh, show him the the the, the feature I, I I create in my on my website. That that, that kind of we hire <laughs> because nothing is more convincing than that, right? And another thing is the environment is very good. So we have all the you know um, uh, engineers, product managers, user designers, right? All work together to make a product, uh, you know. Um, Beautiful, useful to customers, right? You you can learn other um, other professional as well. So it's just very rewarding experience for a data scientist working industry in e-commerce in retail. So I I, I totally recommend this uh, job to everyone. Um, manager is uh, is different. Is um, I felt like it's it's really good job and uh, data science job, and they can play a huge impact to uh, organization. But the, if I just work as an individual contributor, maybe I can develop myself or grow myself 10% more each year, but that's just 10% more, right? But if I, I can lead a team, I can lead you know tens of people, I can multiplex myself uh, to that level, I, I, I can, multiplex my impact to the company to the society you know 10 times right so um, when i'm a manager manager right so you can see that that impact can can go exponentially so i also do recommend uh, manager jobs in data science as well uh, but i just want to summarize one one sentence is i think uh, finding a uh, i have to speak about our challenge now Finding a good data scientist can make real world impact is challenging in this job market. But I would also say- Couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah, I, I would also argue like finding a good data science manager is even harder, yeah. uh, right? Uh, so uh, I, I just totally recommend both jobs, but uh, uh, I, I probably encourage more people to become manager of data science to educate and culture uh, more data science uh, that can uh, play bigger impact. Yeah. Okay. Pros and cons of data science. Sorry, I asked two questions in one shot. <laughs> uh, yeah. Pro, I I haven't seen a con. You haven't seen a con. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's of data. Great. It's just a very exciting every day. Um, haven't had time to think about what's bad about it. Uh, okay. And the uh, home table has very good uh, work uh, life balance, right? So. Um, you do take care of your family. It's not like <laughs> your work okay. uh, very, very it. stressful. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. So let's change tack a bit. I was hoping that you guys would say one of the big cons is how long it takes to like actually build good systems and models. I was like, okay, please set me up. But having, a, <laughs> having a, you know, saying myself that like some of the issues I see as a data scientist, because I do a lot of practicing myself, I agree with Alan. One of it is like data wrangling. The other, of course, is it takes. I think quite a long time to put models in production. So Miguel, I'd like to hear about what your experiences have been so far in terms of like, you know, what's like time to production. It feels like if you're a software engineer or if you're a software engineering manager, right? You, you can give somebody like um, a sprint or like two sprints and say, okay, this can get done. And if you're a good software engineer manager, you know who your team is, you know, in those two sprints, things will get done. With machine learning, I don't know. It's like a coin toss almost, feels like that. So what do you think? Huh? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, Mindu. Uh, so I, I think the biggest problem for data science is how do you create value? How do you go from models to actual business value? And, and, and between both things, there's this thing, which is like what you're saying, like what are, the, what are the ways which we bring that to reality? And it's like the data wrangling, but then it's putting into production. The putting into production, I think, is very hard because... Um, this is a fairly new field in terms of like scaling yeah. it, right? So I, there's a ton of people doing models and there have been many years of people doing models. The question is, how do we find a way of scaling it? If, if we find ways of scaling it, I think here's where the opportunity for platforms come in. One can really like, um, and, and like Shishwan said, like one can really multiply the effect yeah. of one's team and one can have a smaller team, medium team, whatever, but one can really get the value across the whole organization. So I think the objective is how do you provide AI as a service within your organizations, right? And, and move from a, mo uh, from a piecemeal model production or model development and deployment of models to like establishing and creating products and services. You can't do that without a platform. And um, 
And that's actually something that is is probably our, our the biggest area of interest right now for companies like Albertsons and others. And we're right now we're thinking of that. We're thinking of architecture. We're deploying like we're talking to different people, and we're just trying to figure out what is the correct way for us that we can actually get these things we're developing, the modeling into the hands of the users. And many times you don't want to put them. You definitely don't want to put the models. Many times you don't want the users to even know there's a machine learning or AI model. You just want to incorporate what you're doing into the decision-making process, right? And, or replace their decision-making process because there's less uncertainty. So you just want to automate things, right? So, so that they can do other stuff. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so, uh, you know, to uh, Jishwan, you said there are no cons, which I think is a, is a way of saying you loved your job, which is great. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you got, uh, to the extent, again, you, you can share, like, how did you set this up? You guys obviously do a lot of models. You have you have this at scale working quite well. What can you share? Because I'm sure there's lots of people in the audience who want to be as productive maybe as Home Depot has been. And then you also do research, right? I mean, you've got a few papers out there. So tell us more. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so uh, I say no con doesn't mean there's no pain points in data science life, uh, like data wrangling is, uh, yeah. but uh, but what do you do about it, right? People talk about data science to spend 80% of time in data cleaning. Yeah. But then what do you do? Like, do you accept that, right? So, so thank you for the opportunity for me to talk about data leadership in data science. I encourage people to uh, take more leadership uh, uh, roles in data science to push the field further. So we, when we heard about 80% of data wrangling, uh, that's true, but that's for a new use case, right? Okay. For, right. But uh, we, because of that, we established a platform team within data science team, right? We were trying to make, uh, change that. Uh, for the first data science, look at the first uh, new use case. Yeah, it's true, 80% of the time. But if another data science also look at the same, similar use case, right can that data science reuse the existing work, right? If you don't allow that happen, yeah, everybody 80% of the time. But if you can't allow people to reuse, then it's not 80% of the time, right? That's when we talk about leadership in data science. When you see some uh, uh, pain points in your everyday life job, mm -hmm. can you change that? It's not like uh, accept it, can you change it? So the next generation data science, they will not suffer this, right? Um, so yeah, so we, we do have platform in the team very early on. This is before machine learning ops. It's, it's not because we're smart, it's just we we don't we cannot bear the the, the pain in our uh, job. So we, we create that uh, organization. So platforms are essential. Alan, uh, what about you? New company shipped, is that also a platform friendly company? Yeah, I, I would say we're very big on uh, building out internal platforms from what I can see so far. Um, there's a lot of, you know, massive ambition uh, in terms of tooling, um, both actually both internal and external. Um, and, you know, to kind of echo the point about the 80-20, it's not, you know, from my own experience, it's not just new use cases, it's also new hires. Um, if we all kind of think about our experience as being new hires, especially on the practitioner side, and we're going through a new project, um, our time is often consumed by simply trying to understand what the data even means. Uh, we go through so much documentation if there's, if we're lucky enough to have documentation. Uh, we probably Slack message people we don't even know across the company asking what is this field, where is it coming from, what is the business context for it. And then we spend time looking through data warehouse source code too to really understand uh, the how that, how that field is populating. Um, and so, I mean, there's just so much time there on the data discovery side that I think we spend as new hires and 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 then into new use cases. Um, and there's so much room, I think, across the industry to close that gap uh, with platform type technologies. And I think um, for an ML platform, especially on like the just before model development or at the model development stage, uh, there's a big opportunity there to help surface data issues uh, to the user. Um, like showing the distributions for every feature or saying, hey, maybe there's data leakage going on yeah. that you don't know about. 
my top feature right now. I mean, of course, uh, I mean, I think most people in the audience probably know uh, this is, of course, from Advocacy AI. We are a machine learning platform. But whenever I talk to, uh, I mean, what I've seen, and I, I just give you like a quite, uh, you know, the backdrop or the background here. Uh, when we first started, very many, pe very many people were convinced that they don't even need a platform. They should just basically build notebooks, go and like dockerize these notebooks, and that's that, right? Now I think pretty much everyone is convinced that there needs to be some sharing, some infrastructure, some platform. And then, uh, I will just uh, mention to you recently, uh, I had a chat with uh, Dropbox uh, and Dropbox is very well known. This is public. Uh, they don't even use the cloud, not because they're not tech forward or something. Uh, they went to the cloud and then they turned off cloud because it was much more expensive for them to use AWS than not. And now guess what? They've written their own data warehouse as well. They don't even use Snowflake or BigQuery or anything. So my question is around build and buy. In the ML platform space today, I see quite a few people going you know, in one direction and I think a significant number going in the other, meaning there is no winning direction here, right? Yet, it feels like. A lot of people are building in-house, some people are choosing to buy. Uh, what do you think? I mean, how do you think this will allow, uh, evolve? Let's start with Miguel on this, like, you know, you. You know, how do you think it is? I mean, am I summarizing that correctly today? And then, you know, what's the future going to look like? Hmm. Yeah, no, I totally, uh, I think you're summarizing correctly. I, and I think it's really dependent on the baseline of the different companies, right? And the, the capabilities they have. Um, and I think it, many times it has to do with time to value. Like some companies like could develop it internally, but they, the time to value of acquiring a part of a platform, because I think the ecosystem around or the platform, the conceptual framework of, ML ops and in general, uh, what you need to really deploy ML and AI is big, has different far, parts, right? Um, and I think one has to be smart and figure out what parts could be developed internally, what parts could be outsourced, what parts can be outsourced and then uh, brought in internally. And it, I think it's it's uh, it's a time to value question. Um, so we're, we're looking at it like that way. We're looking at what we can do internally, but we are probably going to be heavy, be uh, heavily dependent on partners just because we believe that, um, at least in the beginning, a lot of uh, what's out there can really help us, uh, change what we're doing now. And we need to move quickly because in the end, the, like the customer needs certain things that we can't necessarily provide. So therefore that's why we need to move quickly. And the question will be then how much are we spending and the alternative of doing it internally, what's the benefit, what's the cost, um, the, the cost benefit of doing that uh, versus working on some other value uh, opportunity. I think that that's, that's kind of like the framework we have at least. Makes sense to me. Alan and Jishwan, how, how do you guys think about it? Yeah, you know, I think the question in terms of build versus buy also goes back to customer versus user, right? The, cu the customer, right? The business leadership, operational leadership, the user, data scientist um, and the business and operational leadership, you know, they think of low code or no code solutions that deliver on business dates quickly um, without necessarily like, you know, scaling to so many data scientists or to so many engineers to support that. And then, you know, it also reflects on the customer side, data scientists who want cutting edge tools to accelerate uh, their work, uh, such as the infrastructure work workload, um, but still allows them to get their hands dirty and feel like they're being technical. Um, and frankly, like there are some data scientists that I know that very much prefer to build everything from scratch, but, um, you know, I'm starting to see a shift to mentality. How many practitioners use SK learn and don't write the underlying code for random forest themselves, right? Um, there's a reason these tools are useful. Um, and at their best, they allow the data scientists to focus on the cognitive non-routine work, the art of crafting that model at their worst though, these tools, um, they may be workhorse tools and libraries, but they can sometimes make us fly blindly um, if we don't have a strong theoretical foundation. And so, you know, more and more, um, I think data scientists are going to have to realize that conducting data science research doesn't necessarily mean that you wrote any of the code for their algorithm yourself, but it does mean that you know how to use the tools and not misuse them. And on the flip side, on the, on the business side, um, you know, the business leadership needs to know that in order for this tool to be used well, it has to be a data scientist at the steering wheel. Okay, yeah. makes sense. Yeah, so uh, my thought on this, uh, first of all, yeah, I agree is, uh, you know, uh, speed to market is uh, the most important thing. Um, but it doesn't mean, you know, uh, buying from vendor is the 
the way to uh, you know, uh, shorten the speed to market because you know uh, sometimes wonder can be slow as well right <laughs> for, for certain certain uh, certain certain things okay. right so, so right uh, so, okay. so it's the in-house and the vendors. That, that's why both both methods are used by each company, uh, because the, the, each company is trying to speed uh, the, the speed to market, shorten the speed to market. That, that's why com different company choose: should I use vendor faster or in-house faster? Right? So I think uh, um, this has been uh, talked about. But I want to talk about two other aspects. Is I think this is very healthy. Phenomenon, right? That means you know, you know, AI is uh, is bring value to a society. Therefore, everyone want to contribute to it. There are different solutions. Uh, that's great. A very healthy phenomenon. Uh, another point I want to bring up is actually, I think data science is very still not mature uh, profession. Uh, we we don't know what we need eventually. Uh, so that there's some involvement uh, down the road. Uh, right now, we focus on might not be the, the, the we need in the future. So there's a little bit of uncertainty on that as well. So that's also cause, you know, in-house uh, vendor and different vendor solution, et cetera. Yeah. I know that makes a lot of sense. I think the uh, just generally AIML is very much in its infancy. I think almost everybody agrees. And then the data science too has like, is kind of like trying to figure things out. And therefore you have all these different tool sets and people are like, oh, should I build, take get on a whole platform? Should I get like, you know, what layer of abstraction and so on? So at least we are all agreeing that we do need shared infrastructure, which is a good sign. And now the question becomes like, what does that look like? And that's early on uh, and it's early on in its evolution. That all makes sense to me. So so, I mean, let's talk a little bit more about the platform versus uh, kind of like, um, you know, we're, we're basically having this build versus buy debate, uh, which I think uh, is a good one to have. But one of the things I have, uh, you know, at least experienced, at least from, you know, kind of my, uh, I used to uh, work at Google and Google, as you can imagine, is just a build, build, build company. <laughs> there is no buying, right? And then if you look at Netflix, uh, it's actually a much more modern company in some ways. Uh, and they're a lot more like a buy, buy, buy company, weirdly, right? I mean, they they built everything on um, AWS, and so um, so I, I do think the DNA of, of each organization is different, and that makes sense. Uh, I guess the question for all of you guys, because at some level, all of you are data science managers, right? Uh, so the question is, why uh, there's so many people right now, like trying to adopt and learn and become data scientists, yet. I think everybody here, at least maybe there's somebody here who's disagreeing with me, but let me know, agrees that it's super difficult to find a good data scientist, right? How do we, like, why is that? Why are good data scientists hard to find? Uh, and, you know, how will the world solve the problem? Is it going to be tooling? Is it going to be AGI? Or is it going to be that we'll end up having really good data scientists in the future? Let's uh, go around the room, I guess. Uh, maybe, Miguel, you can start us off. Sure. I, I think I would take a step back and ask, what is a good data scientist? And I think what is a good data scientist is, is, is dependent on where that data science needs to be, right? Like a good data scientist is probably different at Google, at Facebook, at Albertsons, yeah. et cetera, right? I think there's different dimensions of, of where one is good technically in terms of soft skills, in terms of like the, the, the values and character they have, the, uh, the purpose they have, et cetera. For us, like what we're looking for is data scientists who obviously the minimum, uh, like there's necessary conditions and there's sufficient conditions, right? Necessary for sure. You want people who are really good technically speaking, correct? But then you want, like, I think many times data scientists are not good data scientists, not because they're not good technically, just be, but just because they have not learned or they don't like to work in teams, I'm not generalizing, um, and or they don't necessarily see the importance of value and time to value, right? So, so in their objective function, that's not there yet because they're very focused on um, just like optimizing and getting that extra AUC or precision or whatever. So. Let's if, if if I say that a good data scientist has all the qualities that we as a company want, I would say it's so hard just because there's it's such a hot market. There's such a need for talent. And, and I think that just requires organizations to really understand what it is they need and how do you search for them. Now, once you bring them in, um, the question is, how do you enable them to create the most value? And I think that's where that's where having tools that you can independently of in-house, out-house, like whatever, like having tools that they can use kind of like Jarvis, kind of like Iron Man, like, uh, like what are the suits and the tools that you can give them to really multiply what they're doing and 
scale it and have these network effects within the organization. Okay, yeah, makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, is it Sean or Alan? I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm having like an echo. If I am, I'm going to be. Yeah, I think I heard a little something, but uh, yeah, I can go next. You know, I think one reason uh, it's you know very difficult to hire, you know, to say quote unquote good data scientists is uh, the fact that even with a strong academic background, you still need a lot of years of experience to go through different projects. I think as Miguel was getting at going through and getting that business sense uh, for how to interact with stakeholders, how to communicate your results effectively to both technical and non-technical audiences. Um, and financial investment, they have a formula uh, that relates to, you know, what a financial investor uh, can achieve or like how, how talented they are. And it's a function of the square root of how many projects they've managed, how many investments they've gone through. Um, and the same is kind of true across other fields too, like data science. You need more and more projects under your belt to understand what you learn in academia and how it applies um, and what, you know, what sort of nuance has come up in the real world. Um, and, and that's so hard to get just, you know, um, and having, having somebody come in uh, with that background is invaluable, having them know how to look for those nuances uh, for those, you know, for those mistakes in the data, as we talked about, like data discovery, that requires maturity, a big, a big level of maturity to do right. Um, yeah, so uh, from me, I think uh, uh, I have three points. First of all, like data science is hard because what you do is trying to use the algorithmic way you are to change the world, right? You're trying to make a business impact in a certain area, right? It's hard, like making a real impact is hard in general, no matter data science or whatever, it's just hard. Uh, therefore, the, the bar for the, the, the talent is high. So therefore it's, it's just really hard to find good talent can solve uh, putting a uh, real world problem in certain domain, right? So that's one aspect. The second aspect is uh, the data science, um, uh, and also it's probably uh, data science. You know, today it's not like data science is Superman can do anything. Usually, it's you need to work in in a team to make things happen, right? So therefore, the you know th this is not necessarily taught in school. There's no such environment for for student to be in, immersed in that environment. Like how do you work with totally different thing? Like the UX research usually they from our school or something. It's just, it's not, not uh, intact with your, your student life, right? So that's also make it tough. Uh, the third point is probably uh, from industry as well. Uh, there is a barrier between academia and the industry. The, the industry has certain problem, but uh, for various reasons, they don't want to disclose their problem. Therefore, academia don't don't receive those problems solved. So academia, they, they can't find their own problem to teach their student, which is not necessarily align with what the industry need, right? So there's a gap there as well. So I'm also working on an uh, effort, uh, actually next week is uh, uh, to talk with some university uh, people to how to uh, establish the relationship between, you know, make bring the gap to get, uh, smaller, right? How, how do we, uh, co-educate a student, how do we increase uh, research collaboration with universities? Uh, yeah, I think that's the, another piece uh, uh, could, could, could contribute to this um, phenomenon. Problem, yeah, no, makes sense. I mean, what you're saying is data science is hard. The academic programs aren't really like equipping, equipping them for real life problems. Uh, and so, and then in, in general, that just makes the whole problem much more difficult. Uh, so let's get a little bit more kind of like um, into uh, like the kinds of problems you guys are solving in your organizations. Like the, com I mean, I like calling them common enterprise AI use cases. Maybe common, it may be specific to you. Uh, and I think a lot of people talk about like, you know, when you look at uh, the AI community, we're all talking about like, like uh, NLP and vision and whatnot, but then real world problems, a lot of times I've seen at least have to do a lot with like structured data, right? Churn reduction, huge benefit to the company. Uh, personalization, super huge benefit. So um, I, I think for each of you, like what are your five top AI applications? If there are not five, you can go with whatever number you've got. Um, in, in your organization or in the past, which you think will be kind of the big move Movers and shakers in terms of the bottom line. Uh, Miguel? 
Sure. Uh, so maybe this time we go Miguel Zishan and Alan. Change it up. <laughs> so um, I, I think all across the uh, uh, customer relationship uh, journey, right? So acquisition, um, correct risk or pricing. Uh, so so how do you, where do you find your clients or customers? Like how do you price correctly if you have a service or like product? Uh, how do you uh, um, increase wallet share? Like how do you create more value for them so that they will give you more money? Um, how do you retain them? And and I think uh, if some leave, how do you win back? Those are kind of like the the five that we have, uh, and I've, I've had in the past as well. Like just like how do we just get our customers, make sure they don't leave. And then there's like other stuff around like uh, customer service, right? How do we use NLP and vision and like uh, uh, audio? How do we really learn what our customers' pains are and what are we what are the pains we're generating on them in terms of customer service? And how would we really mine that space to be able to really change our offering for them? Uh, yeah. So for me, I think I think uh, personally, I think you know I haven't seen a like a industry area that any area like doesn't need revamp or re, re, redesigned by by AI or machine learning. I think is generally I haven't seen a case uh, AI or machine learning doesn't apply. So that's the first thing, right? Second is, I think it's different uh, area. The enterprise has different priority, right? You, you, you probably more certain area more, more important for you. Uh, so for Home Depot, I think, uh, you know, research and implementation, where I think digital customer service, that's very important, right? In store, you have a social that can help customers, but the online with a two dimensional screen, how can you do a customer service? I think right now it's you know search recommendation, uh, personalization. Those are the two uh, approach we use to do digital customer service. Uh, then beyond that, marketing, right? There's always information gap between people, p to people, company to brand to people, right? Then how do you bring that gap, uh, uh, information gap? That's also important. A supply chain, right? Like how do you use the most efficient way to um, distribute um, goods or resources to the society, right? Very, very important topic as well. Um, and also, um, uh, and also like uh, for Home Depot, like in-store environment, you know, how do you lay out the store? Uh, how do you uh, serve customer better in the that store environment? And also human management. You know, you have limited uh, associate in each store. How can you allocate the resources so that the customer can feel they have more support from associate, right? So that's also important. And the many other areas, I think it can be used AI and machine learning, but those are five I, I can talk about. Got it, Alan? Yeah, you know, I think some great use cases have already been covered. One, one that comes to my mind that hasn't been mentioned is next best action. Uh, so if you're thinking about, you know, enterprise, uh, you know, especially like B2B or SaaS, uh, knowing what's the next best action to take that's going to optimize the likelihood of retention or the likelihood of upsell, that's that's going to be so important. It already is important. Um, you know, for those of you on the call that, you know, don't, uh, haven't thought much about next best action, it's really like, what, what action can I take with the customer? Send them an email, call them, anything in your action space that will increase the likelihood of conversion or retention. Um, and I think one big issue that's being faced right now by the industry is how you prevent that next best action engine from being siloed within a specific division. So if you think about like customer support, right, they can take an action uh, based off a customer support ticket. If you think about adoption and marketing, they might send an email to drive adoption. Uh, the big risk with siloing is that they might both decide to take the same action with the customer and a customer gets duplicate emails about the same matter. Um, so it's really important in the orchestration not to be siloed. It's also important in the model estimation stage not to be siloed too and, and include a more comprehensive action and event space. Perfect. Okay, lots of really great applications. We need a platform. All sounds reasonable. <laughs> so but, let's- uh, really, oh? I, I just really, I, Alan said it's saying, I think it's super important. And I think the, okay. if you have a platform that's like it de-risks. If you if the organization is working on a platform, basically you will prevent silos. That's the idea okay. of having a platform, right? That's right. Great, great insight. 
No, that, that, I totally agree. Uh, and I think uh, the tools have catching up to do, but I think we'll be getting there. I think let's go to a couple of audience questions because I think this one seems like a really interesting one, which I've wondered about as well. Uh, a question in the build versus buy debate. How much do you think system level technical debt plays a role? Does it flip the decision to buy? Uh, you know, I, I think this is kind of really real, right? I mean, if you're inside an organization, you want, you go off and build something, and you're like, oh, I'm very excited, I'm building something new. Uh, and then once it's built, there is the maintaining, there is the UI, there is the catching of bugs, you know, it goes on and on. So, I mean, how do you, how do you look at technical debt today? Anyone want to, want to take it? the question? Oh. So I'll, I'll talk about my previous experience. Like technical debt is like the skeletons in the closet, right? It's like this thing, like nobody wants to talk about and like we just push back and but it's so real. Um, and I do think it is, a, a, I think it's an, it's underestimated and many times not really uh, risk assessed when one is thinking of uh, build versus buy. And I think sometimes uh, the if companies have had a really bad experience building systems and technology, that technical debt is kind of like this, this uh, it's in the background and many times will influence their decision of what to do, right? Got it. Um, let's see if there's anything else. Yeah, I would just add to that real quick. Okay, sure. It's not only on the infrastructure side that there's technical debt, it's on the modeling side too. And it's going to be pretty hard to divorce that technical debt from the data scientist team. But with a platform, with an ML platform and tooling, you can really reduce the scope of it. And you can enable much quicker action with much less effort to address technical debt that comes up with the model specifically too. Got it. Let's see. There's one interesting question here. Isn't I am doing my master's in machine learning. It's great to hear from you guys. One of my biggest quandaries, how much uh, work is model researching versus using out of the box models? What should as a student, what should the students focus on the most? I think this is actually a relevant, I mean, I think if you broaden that question out, it is kind of talking to, uh, speaking to what Jishwan just said, hey, like the academic programs are not kind of really up to speed in terms of real world problems. So what should students do, right? What, what are your like suggestions for them? Because uh, I'm sure if, you know, if they could use real world data sets, they would. But short of like collaborating with Home Depot or Albertsons, which frankly speaking is very hard to do, uh, any ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't have answers. I'm trying to figure that out as well. It's just a very challenging problem. Uh, I think uh, my suggestion based on side, uh, current situation is intern, right? Find you know, uh, intern. That's right? a good idea, yeah. Uh, go to a certain company and intern and get the real uh, feel of uh, that particular domain. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, and, and also just uh, do more like a cable competition. It's uh, you know, all kinds of a, pro a problem over there. Uh, practice more, um, do more, yeah. And learn from, learn from the best people. Like, uh, oh, oh, another oh, great idea is go to data science conference. <laughs> I, 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 I'm telling people don't, uh, don't have like just search on Google top data science conference and go to those conference. I think this is one of the benefits from COVID is you know all, all the data science conference become virtual or, or at least have a virtual option but well, the ticket is 100 200 bucks right go there and uh, listen to the best in the industry what they are working on what their challenge i think this is very direct very very effective and cost effective way of uh, learning uh, learn uh, be, be more uh, prepared for industry jobs yeah, I think there are kind of two parts to this question for the out of the box versus the researching. Um, yeah, you know, the more the more and more you progress in your career, you're probably going to start saying this out of the box model is going to do the trick. It's going to lead to a good V0 or V1. Um, and then as we see business value from that first iteration, we can go through additional cycles. That's what you start to see more and more. In terms of, uh, you know, how you can ramp up and become more experienced, one, one great um, experience that I had early in my career was going to meetups. Uh, there are some meetups where people get together for a couple hours, 20, 30 uh, aspiring data scientists and tackle problems. Um, one problem that, the, that I did that I loved was uh, how, to, how to optimize routes for a local transportation, a public transportation system. Um, that kind of, those kinds of problems are so edifying. You do code reviews with people. 
it's really like uh, that team experience that people were talking about earlier. That's an important uh, part of maturing as a data scientist is working on teams and going to meetups and having that kind of experience is great. Okay, fantastic. Any parting thoughts? We're a little over time, but uh, any parting thoughts to our audiences in terms of like, uh, 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 in terms of like advice to them, what to do, build versus buy. Mine is very simple, use Abacus AI, but what's yours? <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, one concluding thought is, you know, about the benefit of ML platforms like Abacus. Uh, one big thing that you encounter is confirmation bias, right? As we go through model development, we all want the model to do well. Um, and you also see a lot of varied practices for model evaluation across different data scientists. Um, and one, one wonderful thing about platforms like Abacus is that you can start to align on standard practices, best practices. And it's a forcing function for team members to apply them and manage a common, uh, a common approach to evaluating models and take some of that confirmation bias out of it. I, I, I would just add, I think one of the benefits of, of, of options like, uh, like you guys can do is like the knowledge you guys bring and, and, and other vendors, like in general, I think the experience, the knowledge just creates a lot of time to value. I would say to the audience, like uh, put the burden on uh, the partner. Right, because like you guys are eager and, and you guys have been really good with us, like trying to do POCs and really demonstrate with data, being very data driven, like we can actually help you create more value. So I'd say like put the burden on the on the partner, have show like do a POC, just look at the data, do an experiment and just figure out are we really gonna create more value with this versus not? I think that's that's probably one of the best ways one could approach things. Experiment, yeah. That sounds great. Any parting thought, Jishwan or yeah. Yes. So uh, I think uh, we are we are a little bit biased. We all everybody come from industry, and I was very uh, promote you know industry uh, data science job. Probably I will <laughs> say some same nice uh, academia <laughs> as well. So so like there there are many professors. They are really great. Great. Okay, yeah. They they see a problem very deeply. So they are solving some very fundamental problem in AI and the machine learning. We, I really appreciate their research. I know you know I'm working with many of them uh, to help uh, help my organization to uh, to make machine learning approach more practical, most robust, is actual. So if you have that um, um, inspiration, want to pursue a PhD, find a good uh, PhD advisor, uh, pursue academia, it will be very fruitful to you as well. Uh, but then for um, uh, for industry data science job, you know, I just felt a uh, personally I like it a lot uh, because you can make it really really more impact uh, problem where it worst. I, I, I would highly encourage you to do uh, data science practitioner in industry. Uh, the final thing is data science leadership. You know, I would say AI is very naive and data science is very naive at this point. Uh, yeah. I, I think uh, everybody should take the data science leadership role to make this field more robust, um, theoretically, practically, uh, you know, uh, ethically, every aspect. Uh, yeah, please help to make this domain, uh, this professional real, uh, data science professional uh, real. Okay, with that very thought, we will wrap up and also. Just to talk about research, uh, we've got our head of research, Colin White, now uh, leading a session. Uh, so Colin, uh, please introduce our next guest and thank you very much, everyone. Hi, uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm Colin, head of research at Abacus AI, and I'm very excited to kick off our final session, Automating AI with Neural Architecture Search with uh, Debadeep Today. Day is a principal researcher in the reinforcement learning group at Microsoft Research Redmond. He received his PhD in robotics at Carnegie Mellon University. And his research includes automated machine learning, reinforcement learning, robotics, vision, and planning. Day has had many impactful research papers uh, throughout his career. And he regularly is an area chair at conferences such as NeurIPS, ICML, and ICLR. So, Dave, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Colin and Bindu, for having me here. And um, uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Quite excited to be here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And to all of our attendees, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'll, I'll be looking at Zoom and YouTube for your questions. So please ask questions throughout this uh, session.
All right. So, um, so Dan, I wanted to ask, uh, so I guess you, earlier in your research career, you were more on the robotic side. So I was wondering how you, uh, what, what's, what sort of your research progression and how you got into, uh, automated machine learning and neural architecture search? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, uh, I was actually like, you know, really intensely deeply in the middle of robotics research, right? Like I was writing papers on drone and self-driving car autonomy, planning, intersection of perception and uh, planning throughout my um, CMU years. And then um, even in the first couple of years at MSR, I think what happened was um, MSR has this like, you know, um, very gigantic mass of really excellent machine learning researchers of, uh, of in, in almost all areas of machine learning. And um, you, I got just pulled in the gravitational wave towards more and more on the machine learning side. I think what happened is, I, I, mean, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was purely an accident. I think um, even during my thesis years, like my, th my thesis title is predicting sex and lists, and it's actually about using submodular optimization for uh, in, um, and in, in, in machine learning and, and um, applied to some robotics problems, of course. Uh, but uh, none of the techniques are specific to robotics. In fact, I haven't wrote like papers in computer vision using the same ideas and extensions. So um, I, I actually did some soul searching when I, after the first couple of years at my MSR is that if I really want to do, meaning robotics as a mission, right? Like, you know, where you are saying, uh, meaning there are, I have many good friends who are, intensely passionate about like, you know, oh, I want to just be, uh, see self-driving cars come to uh, real life, right? Like I want to realize that dream, be it self-driving trucking or drone autonomy and, 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 and all that. They derive immense pleasure, like, you know, and are immensely passionate from seeing robots work in the real world, doing useful things. Um, and and, and uh, nothing uh, excites them more, right? And I had and I was like, okay, am I the person who wants to see robots work in the field at any cost? And, and, and that's like you know the mission. So is, is uh, should I work backwards from that mission, or do I am I more interested in the fundamentals of uh, sequential decision making and and be it applied to any domain? And being at MSR, I think there was this uh, because. I, I saw that at MSR, it's much easier to do the latter than to do the um, uh, earlier thing. Um, and so it was, so I had to make a decision. I was like, I, I either go to a place where I am in the midst of the next revolution in robotics, which is also happening right now. Uh, and by, by right now, I mean like 2016, 17, and then it's still happening. Um, or I um, actually leverage Microsoft Research for its strengths, right? And, and um, the way uh, AutoML Research started happening is, um, well, very frankly, I was, I was um, visiting John and, and we were talking about some research paper that I had written and some paper that um, called Anytime Neural Networks and um, I was co-author on and, and he had been writing some paper on boosting for neural networks. And we actually were going through the citation list of his boosting paper and we saw that, hey, this is being used by a lot of NAS papers, right? Like, you know, they were the ones citing it. And so it actually caught us by surprise. It was a, um, so it's like boosting and okay, I, I can see that, like, you know, how that is, that is uh, useful to NAS. And, and also at the time, um, uh, I found, I meaning both me and John found that it was incredibly, we could not make sense of like why an architecture looked the way it did. Like, you know, was this famous table, like, you know, I, I remember in the, sitting in the conference room in, in MSR New York, putting up the dense net table, right? And, it, and I think that year or the previous year, it had won CVPR Best Paper Award. And we were like, how would we come up with this table? And, 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 and I thought like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a newbie here, relatively speaking in machine learning terms. And, but it was, it was also like, you know, interesting to see John was like, I have no idea how I would come up with this table and, and why this particular table or why this table of magic numbers. And, and I also talked to uh, like other people who uh, were doing research in machine learning at the time far longer than I had. And, and the, you know, they, they all said like, look, this is empirical trial and error. Like, you know, yes, there is intuition, you build up and everything. And, and to me, that seemed like a very unsatisfying answer. I was like, I'm never going to, 
I don't know what this magic intuition is. I don't have it clearly. Everybody else does or uh, around me. So, uh, but uh, so, so I think that's how was the motivation for AutoML because I personally found that I'm terrible at writing model.py by hand. I don't know what model to write down here, right? Like, you know, sure, I can download ResNet and fine tune it and whatnot, but um, that does not seem a very uh, fun research thing to do research in. But, but uh, thankfully, I also had background in like things like re uh, reinforcement learning, contextual bandits, online learning, and, um, so from an uh, uh, combinatorial optimization. And these things were the ones uh, oftentimes that gets used in um, uh, neural architecture search, right? Like, so the math remains the same. Um, and, and it's just that your, your uh, function evaluation space changes. So these, these was like, okay, you know what? I don't have to do actually much learning differently, but it's a new fun problem. So it was also, uh, refreshing for me, and and at, uh, strategically, it just so happened that I happen. Uh, Microsoft Research is situated inside a massively large company, and and, and that makes it very. Um, uh, I could see firsthand how uh, much the demand was there, like you know, like from every data science team to be like, okay, we saw your tutorial on us, we read your paper, you were talking about it. In, in that forum, but we want to try it on our data set. We draw on, we, I want to do try NAS or AutoML on my thing, right? And then how do I go about doing it? And uh, so I could see that there was, that this is going to be uh, big, right? And, and I, I could see that this is also probably the future. Like, like there's this quote from John that um, really inspired me. He used to say that, you know, back in the eighties, we used to all write decision trees by hand. Nobody would ever think of writing a decision tree by hand today. Why are we writing uh, neural architectures by hand, right? So I, I think within five to 10 years, uh, probably even sooner, meaning, and you know this uh, as well, Colin, uh, I think we will no longer be using PyTorch or TensorFlow the way we do now. Or, or that is what at least my hope is that we that we would not be writing model.py by hand. We would just point our data sets and um, uh, to NAS or AutoML libraries who will and compute and then they will give us back uh, answers. Got it. Yeah, that's a very interesting answer. It sounds like a combination of many things. You. You were a bit of a, or you worked on a few different types of things uh, earlier in your career that were more general, and then realizing you're at MSR, where and and there, there's all these applications, and neural networks are getting harder and harder to, the harder and harder to find the best architectures by by hand. Uh, yeah, I, I really like that. Uh, I, I often use the same motivation, which I think I got from your talk on neural architecture search on YouTube, which is uh, like the, the dense net architecture, one of the one of the, like, the most prominent architectures back in 2016. Uh, if you look at the diagram, it's it's like really complex and convoluted. And that that's like that, yeah, it would have been very hard for humans to keep coming up with these state-of-the-art architectures. And that that's really when the, the trends transition happened to now now algorithms are creating the best uh, architectures and uh, yeah and actually just uh so all the audiences on the same page uh we're, we're talking about automated machine learning which is like any all types of auto all that like any part of automating the process of performing machine learning and specifically we're we're also talking about neural architecture search or nas as day has been saying which is uh, using an algorithm to design the best neural network for a given data set. And uh, yeah, I think it's a uh, really interesting what you're saying uh, that, uh, yeah, like if we look in the 1980s, people were writing trees by hand and now, now people are starting to, uh, and then of course it, it's been automated since then. And now, now the same transition is happening for neural networks themselves. Um, yeah, so um, maybe you, you've already started talking about this, but can you describe uh, the progression of neural architecture search technology at Microsoft and how it's helped uh, different applications in, improve over time and what are the best, the, the highest leverage applications today? 
In terms of highest leverage, I mean, uh, so as you can imagine, right? Like, you know, um, Microsoft is also a, uh, not only a very large company, meaning, uh, but it's also a very diverse in its businesses, right? So uh, we do everything from Azure to cloud and, and services on top of Azure to video games, to email, office suite. Um, so um, Xbox, so uh, there are, uh, HoloLens. So there are quite a bit of like, you know, applications and diversity of applications and almost all of them use neural networks in some uh, manner, right? And, and many of them also have real-time constraints and uh, well, there are constraints on almost any application, be it call, uh, even if they are not in terms of time or latency uh, or throughput, but in terms of like total cost. Um, especially if you are going to use uh, uh, these, if, if there is high amount of traffic. Um, but without going giving you specific uh, details, what uh, almost all of these applications, we, we saw tremendous um, demand for AutoML, right? Like, you know, the number of times I have received emails, uh, chats, people back pre-pandemic, people just walking up, uh, uh, after a talk or, or some meeting and saying like, hey, I want to try NAS on, on my application and I am the program manager who manages this service and uh, we are really struggling for COGS and whatnot, right? And then this is, this is a story which I believe if it is true at Microsoft, because in some ways, Microsoft is so big that it's almost a microcosm of all enterprises. Like, you know, if we know that if this is a problem we are facing, we are with, with high probability, this is probably true of at least all other large enterprises of similar size or even smaller. Um, so I think um, everything that you can think of, Colin, that would be like, you know, from vision tasks to NLP tasks, uh, these, are, these are obviously like, you know, uh, proliferating everywhere uh, inside our services. And this, this is um, very, and these are all very high value. Some of the services have, billions of use uh, like you know calls a day uh, or to a month and um, with, with hundreds of millions of users so um, this is, is extremely important that we scale extremely important that our uh, latencies and user privacy is all uh, confidentiality is maintained and at the same time we keep the cost of like you know scaling uh, under control um, so uh, uh, the number of hardware endpoints is also massive. Uh, some services running on an ASIC FPGA, some services running on, you know, commodity uh, Xeon CPUs, some, some services using uh, GP, uh, GPUs uh, of a certain SKU, right? So, and, and, and then, and they want to move to like, you know, oh, we have the new version coming out and we would want to move from this server to this server. Um, so how do we do that, right? And, and um, is this the best model still? And I think this is, this is what, what where AutoML and NAS are perfectly positioned to um, uh, make this problem like, you know, easy. Got it. Yeah, totally agree about what the, the last part of your answer where NAS is especially useful when you have some architecture that, that, that works on some hardware and then you need to transition to another hardware that maybe has different constraints. You can use, you can use NAS to like automatically find the best architecture that, that fits those constraints. And also, yeah, I guess your, your main point is also that it's useful everywhere. Um, although I do have a, a follow-up question about that. And mm -hmm. I think my question is about like the, maybe the trade-off between like getting more data or higher quality data versus getting a, a better architecture through neural architecture search. And specifically, like I, I have come across some, uh, some of my friends in research who say like, oh, like uh, is neural architecture search really that important? Like what if we just get more data? And I think especially uh, like I've, I've heard this this kind of thought in, in like, for example, in natural language processing, where I think uh, with, with like GPT-3, as, as I remember, Bert had this like, by this like more interesting type of architecture, or I guess you could say like more interesting loss where it's like bi-directional training, but then GPT-3 moved back to a simpler approach and yep. just used more and more data. And of course that uh, outperformed Bert. So, so yeah, I guess my question is like, yeah, data versus architecture and also like whether 
some applications like NLP or vision or more, we get more bang for the buck for uh, one of these two. So um, I think data is always going to be extremely important. Like, you know, so um, uh, perhaps it's data versus architecture perhaps sets up a false competition because I don't think NAS or, or any auto ML method uh, releases any data science team from the burden of creating high quality, relevant, like, you know, ethically sourced private data and, and all, all those other good stuff, right? So, so in some sense, uh, there is uh, that problem, I don't think NAS fixes, right? So you cannot eke out performance uh, when, when you have bad data and, and whatnot, right? And, and we see that like, you know, when we interact with product groups, especially uh, if you think of like live services where the data set is changing almost every day or all every week, right? Like significant parts of the data become stale and, and new data comes in and, and, and the data, data sets are, uh, li unlike in like, you know, when we build NAS not benchmarks and, um, and, and acad academic benchmarks that we often fight our <laughs> academic battles over, uh, a lot of like, you know, product group data sets are evolving. They're living, breathing beasts, right? And, and there's logging in the application and, and it's, it's generating more data. Some of that data is noisy. Um, and, and then there are like, you know, data science, there are scripts and whatnot, which are like, you know, weeding out noise, trying to figure out what part of the logs to not trust, what parts to trust and whatnot. And I don't think AutoML actually really, um, at, 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 at least right now in the, in the style of like, you know, NAS research that you and me uh, primarily take part in, I don't think that fixes those problems, but I do, see that there are interesting research problems that come up with like, you know, like for example, I was actually just reading um, uh, some modular optimization papers, which try to do core set data set distillation. And I think that's a very promising, um, you know, where the, where the main idea is that like, imagine in NLP, right? Like, you know, where the data sets are getting ridiculously big, right? Like I went by, um, and if you imagine like what a product group at Microsoft could have, like, you know, it looks, way bigger than what you would have in an academic or a public setting like the pile or something right and and this is and these data sets if you were to do just one epoch over them will 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 cost a very pretty penny for even small to medium models right um, uh, so it becomes important like is all this data important like how do we clean this data like i think auto data models are is is something we need to auto meaning other under the umbrella of auto ml we need to do auto data as well, right? Like in where we do data set cleaning or um, uh, distillation, data set distillation, subset selection, all of these fun stuff, um, either separately or in conjunction with our like, you know, model optimization, auto ML. Um, so I think th this is uh, a very, very important point, meaning, and, and of course, all the other things like, you know, your uh, uh, fairness uh, and, uh, ethics part of your pipeline, like, you know, because oftentimes people are like, well, I, I did auto ML. I took this very famous auto ML library and I ran it and my job is done. It gave me a good model, right? Like, uh, no, your job is not done. And even though you may have satisfied your model constraint and latencies and performance constraints, um, all the other parts of machine learning still remain right now. Um, and, and I, and I do think that's a very, um, but perhaps it's the, the onus is on us, Colin, to, to make sure that people don't think AutoML is a silver bullet, right? Like I often write in my new RIPs ethics statements that this is not, there is always this danger that people will be like, well, it's an automated method. So I get to be absolved of responsibility because I ran an automated method, right? Like that's not true. Um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I guess, uh, AutoML and neural architecture search are one, one very nice tool in our toolkit of many other things like uh, getting higher, like uh, better data cleaning or, or, or even just finding more data. Uh, yeah, I also thought it was interesting what you said about subset selection, especially for some of these applications where the data sets are getting really massive. And, and I, I think that actually goes hand in hand with neural architecture search because if we can find some like subsets that are very much smaller and representative, then we can also rapidly find 
automatically find the best architecture too. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And this is why this was my whole vested uh, ulterior motive in, in, in reading these papers, because if you imagine mm -hmm. even running like, you know, uh, your famous bananas or BOHB algorithm, right, on, on um, uh, any of one of these methods, right? Like, you know, you, yes, you can, um, on any one of these data sets and tasks, uh, yes, you all, all the, the, the efficiencies of the method are good and, and, and de desirable, but it's still not enough because as I said, even doing one epoch over the data set is, is, is nearly impossible, right? And so uh, th th this is, uh, and this is tough, like, and, and, but I do see promising avenues in that line of research to, to speed up NAS, right? Like for higher data set selection, especially for NLP. I'm not really sure about vision yet, um, uh, I'll have to think harder, but for NLP, I see this very slam dunk thing, like, you know, where, uh, I don't know if this would be worth writing a paper, but especially if you can prove that, like, you know, my Spearman rank, I'm going to select a subset such that the Spearman rank correlation of my architectures is preserved, right? Um, that would be quite a powerful, uh, statement to be able to make, right? And 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 how or or how the Spearman rank correlation degrades as my subset becomes smaller and smaller, smaller uh, with respect to this uh, larger data set. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It def definitely seems like a very promising avenue for future work, especially uh, for these applications with massive data sets. I think that there is a bit of like initial work on it, but still there's. So many, uh, so many refined tools from like the subset selection community that that can still be imported here. You're right. Um, yeah. So uh, we have, I see one question in the chat. Um, are NAS techniques susceptible to overfitting? And if yes, are there any general techniques to avoid them? Um, they can be susceptible to overfitting, but I don't think they are any more or less susceptible to overfitting than regular supervised learning, meaning as long as you are careful in, um, um, you know, uh, setting up your data sets and, and, and making sure that you are not optimizing over the test set and whatnot, and then you have a reasonable uh, validation set um, in that respect. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, all right, so um, one thing I wanted to ask, uh, how do you, th I guess we've already, sort of touched on this a bit, but how do you think uh, as the field of AutoML and neural architecture, neural architecture search progresses in the future, how do you think it'll like change the dynamics of how companies hire data scientists today? Like, will, will AutoML just completely remove the need for any data scientists in like in 10 years from now? Or uh, yeah, how do, you, how do you think it'll play out in the future? Yeah, meaning to uh, to add to my like you know previous things of like you know that AutoML and NAS doesn't like you know really release us from the burden of the entire pipeline, um, being and and all the other associated things like data as we're talking about is that uh, oftentimes and then this is you you can see in like you know like uh, Salima Mershi at uh, uh, MSR has this very uh, fantastic paper on like you know ML and software engineering intersection on how data scientists uh, work uh, with software engineers and the end-to-end -end life cycle of like you know an industrial enterprise uh, feature that uses AI uh, or pipeline like you know how it, how it uh, progresses and when I read that paper um, uh, it actually I learned a lot because I often uh, live in slightly an ivory tower of pure research. But one of the things that I uh, that uh, st struck with me stuck with me was that actual modeling in a pipeline is actually one of the least amounts of work. It's everything else that is the massive is dominates like data set gathering, cleaning, infrastructure for logging, infrastructure for serving. Uh, making sure that your systems, uh, all the systems engineering to make sure that it's up and running. Um, those are the things that actually dominate. And um, so I don't think data scientists jobs should, should feel any amount of threat from AutoML or NAS tools, right? So I think this is uh, my, in my point of view, this is, if you are, if you are a data scientist and you have a high business value uh, pipeline that you are in charge of, and you want to develop some model, 
my thing would be hopefully very soon instead of writing or or fine tuning a model that you download from the uh, from model zoo and or a famous model the first uh, the first thing you do is okay i'm going to first just run a nas algorithm or an auto ml plus nas algorithm on my data set and go grab coffee right and or, or or maybe go to sleep and come back tomorrow morning or whatnot and and see what it gives me like you know in many ways i want it to be a very as as once the one of the earliest strongest things you can do right so um uh, and uh, and and gives you a very very good baseline and a pareto frontier right like and i think the pareto frontier is very important in in industry because people are going to for every point on the pareto uh, curve there is an associated cost and then there is an associated customer satisfaction so that trade off unless you have a pareto frontier you don't get to see so i think th these are uh, tools that we should make available to data scientists but yeah no i don't think data scientists are going away anywhere soon anytime yeah definitely yeah it ma makes sense with the pareto frontier and that's something nasa is very good at and yeah of course i think data scientists can like go to higher and higher levels of this abstraction but we still uh, need yeah. the data scientists yeah. mm -hmm. so um what do you think are the most uh, most interesting recent developments in automel or neural architecture search or the or the most interesting potential uh, like like future like yeah most interesting potential future directions in in the area so from all, all, reading all the papers, right? Like, you know, so I will begin with like, you know, uh, actually what are some of like, I would say the anti-developments in a, in a way where, which is there has been in the past four or five years, this tremendous exponential interest in the academic community in NAS, right? Like both, both from industry researchers and academia and, and you very well know all this, uh, Colin, and that, it has become very difficult for anybody, not just to keep up, but for anybody to even understand what NAS method should I try first or now, right? Like, so it's almost as if we have gone from what, what is the first model I should begin my modeling with to what NAS method I should try, right? On my, on my like, you know, if you, if you are in an ML researcher engineer, this is what you are thinking about probably now, right? And, and it's a, it's a dizzying array of methods which are just like you know going around in papers of various qualities, and um, I find that like you know uh, what Frank Hutter and you and others in the community are the kind of papers that are almost needed right now are almost like papers which are like let's bring sanity back, right? Like let's examine. Uh, like like the paper like Amit Talwakar and Liam Lee's paper on like reproducibility and random search in NAS, right? Like you know, it's such a very inspiring paper, but it's an, it's almost like an anti paper, right? Like it's saying like, look, these are the things that matter if you look deeper, and these are the things that don't matter, right? And um, or NAS evaluation is frustratingly hard, and and now your paper on NAS evaluation is surprisingly easy. I think in out, we have all these like you know. Uh, fits and jumps that the auto ML community is doing, but we I think we are overall still in expectation, make taking gradients in the right direction. So um, so I would say that more like I'm, I'm very I feel auto ML and NAS is promising right now because we have these kinds of papers now because which are uh, or like local search is state of the art, right? Like so this this is uh, brings back. Uh, like, you know, hey, let, let, before you do something complicated, have you done all the simple things, right? And uh, I think this is key also to NAS getting adopted by data scientists everywhere in the world. And I think this is uh, that we don't hype it up with complicated pipelines, uh, but, but actually give out the simplest, like, you know, OCAMS razor solutions in a very honest, brutally honest manner. And uh, so, so that's one. I would say one meta development with direction, which is very, which is very good. Um, and then reviewers are getting like you know more and more uh, aware that you, hey, we shouldn't just buy any hype that is being sold to us. We should we should um, look carefully. Um, secondly, I think uh, uh, in terms of like you know research, uh, I think we, we 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 are still doing sort of local search around 
existing model families, right? Like which have been developed with domain knowledge and expertise, which is which is probably great and, and, and is a good thing to do. But uh, I do think we, we, we need to be able to think about how we are going to devel develop the next transformer, right? Like, you know, let, let's, whatever it may be called, uh, but via NAS, like, can we discover that today? Um, I really like, like, for example, this NeurIPS, uh, Misha and Amit's paper and Chris Ray's paper, um, at least these were at least the a subset of the co-authors on uh, better, like, you know, more interesting general search spaces using kaleidoscope matrices. I thought that was a good idea. I think uh, uh, as, a, as a good first step towards more interesting search spaces. Um, I think more than search algorithms, and, and I'm and because I think there is this tendency for people to like, oh, I want to have my new search algorithm, but I think search is very mature, right? Like you know, search. Meaning, the, the, if you if you open uh, like you know the the introduction to AI book by Russell Norvig, it, it, it's all about search, right? Like, you know, it's 90% of the book is about search algorithms. And, and, and as, as both as a computer science community, which also, which is way bigger than um, uh, machine learning community, uh, search has, has received, has, has been extremely well studied. And search in the context of NAS is also, we are starting to handle it. But I do think like, you know, search spaces needs uh, a, a better look because I think there's a lot of papers which are going uh, are still low hanging going after low hanging fruit and which is useful and, and and we will have that and we need to have that but I do think there are certain some researchers should take a step back and be like how do I come up with a search space which is very interesting and where we can develop uh, interesting uh, things I like the primary easy paper uh, or, uh, from Quackley's group at Google um, but um, uh, which which tries to like you know just do program synthesis, uh, and and they did find some very interesting artifacts which seems to generalize in different uh, across almost all kinds of transformer um, uh, based architectures and tasks. Uh, but I do think uh, even then they had to seed it with the transformer architecture as one of the things. Um, so I think there's still like you know uh, uh, a lot of design. Uh, power left on the table. And I think it would be great to uh, brainstorm how we can make the search spaces more abstract. Yeah, couldn't agree more with both parts of your answer. First, first is uh, the meta direction of bringing sanity back to, uh, to NAS research. And also the, the uh, yeah, we're, we're sort of like really just uh, getting diminishing returns on improving the search part of NAS. Whereas maybe we should start focusing a lot more on the search space part of NAS. Of course, data means uh, what, anytime we start to do neural architecture search, first we have to define a large set of neural architectures that we're searching over and then run an optimization algorithm. So a lot of papers are sort of refining the optimization algorithm, but really we should go back to, the, to step one and think more deeply about which architectures we're searching over. I think... Okay. A, yeah, I think it would be really cool if uh, the field of NAS has some like really big win where we come up with like the new like transformer or something for for some other new type of task. Absolutely, yeah, I, I okay. think so. I think we have a bunch of like silent wins, right? Like you know, like uh, people are increasingly downloading efficient net and um, instead of ResNet, right? Or or they're downloading. Um, uh, NAS-based model checkpoints, uh, uh, but we had yet to discover a new complete class by ourselves, right? Like, you know, that, oh, this is a completely different beast, right? This is not an RNN, this is not a transformer, this is uh, not a CNN, um, yeah, uh, with, which, which would be, um, yeah, good to have. Yeah, right, yeah, it would be really cool when, uh, when this starts to happen more. Yeah, of, of course, for NAS, uh, there's always the trade-off between like injecting human bias into our search space versus like ha having more efficiency in our in our search. But but yeah, maybe as as the techniques get better and as hardware improves, we can really have much less human bias and then really start to discover more novel types of architectures. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, another question from the chat. Can, can you comment about explainability in NAS today and whether it's a good area for future, future research? 
Um, yeah, I think I think that's a, a slam dunk. I think that needs to happen. Like you know, um, uh, our uh, I think uh, Ma- if I'm not mistaken, Marius Lindor at, um, in has uh, uh, papers on interpretability and NAS intersection, and and might there might be a survey on it uh, out to it. Um, uh, but yes, uh, absolutely. Like I think that that's uh, that needs to happen because. Uh, the architectures from NAS can get, get even weirder, weirder in the human sense, not weirder for a computer, but I think that's um, explaining uh, decisions based on models you find from AutoML. Uh, it's probably even more important. Definitely. Yeah, I think some of the motivation for that too is also to, so like data scientists can trust these techniques more since it seems, uh, it seems more common than you'd expect that uh, people are still just like doing their own, writing their own grid search code by hand rather than like downloading ArchAI or, or, or something. Uh, yeah, so definitely ex- explainability can, uh, can be really beneficial. Um, yeah, we're, we're actually almost out of time already. Um, I, see, I see one question in the Q&A I guess most of this uh, or the, the session's been more on AutoML, but Day is also a very accomplished RL researcher. And the, this question's about RL. So let me see. It says in the field of biomedical control systems, um, such as neural prosthetics, the controller needs to continuously adapt throughout its life um, to changes both within the biological system and environmental interactions. Um, unsupervised ML, such as reinforcement learning, looks attractive. Can you please indicate any recent approaches to accelerate the rate of learning and RL control? Um, so, so, if I understand the question, uh, like you know, for, for these motor controllers in neuroprosthetics, uh, the question is, can can that online adaptation be made more efficient? Yeah. Or, I guess also maybe the, the question is asking like any interesting latest approaches and uh, yeah, the most efficient RL algorithms. Um, I mean, yeah. for the specific domain, uh, I don't think I, I would, I, I would mm. know any because there are domain specific optimizations and whatnot that mm. can be done. Um, but like, you know, but anything like SAC or, or um, PPO variants uh, are, are SAC, especially for offline RL, like if you meaning, which may be important for you uh, to do in, in terms of like, you know, if you don't want to online adapt in a very mission critical, safety critical environment. So offline RL al- algorithms uh, like SAC and variants are probably your your first uh, go-to. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, but at this uh, PPO, if you are if you are willing to be uh, do things online is, is not a bad thing to start with. Yeah, but I, I, I guess like, you know, for anything more sophisticated, it would depend upon the domain and then what exactly is how the data comes in, how it varies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, actually that reminds me of this uh, maybe newer field in uh, NAS for RL. So I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I saw a few papers on this, but uh, yeah, it makes sense that it can be quite domain specific. Mm-hmm. Meaning there is the auto RL uh, survey paper by Frank and others. Um, so that may be a good mm-hmm. starting point to see how not, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, let me see. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask, uh, do you have any uh, exciting project that you're working on right now that, that you would uh, you want to talk about? Um, uh, so we are, we are excited about like you know doing all the transformer backbone search using proxies and and um, that's one thing. Um, but at the same time, um, like you know, I think we are spending a lot of time right now, including my uh, my time, on building up uh, Archive and uh, making it more robust, documenting it, uh, adding more capabilities, especially that uh, we see demand for in Microsoft. Uh, within as well as like you know outside, um, so um, so I would say like right now I'm in this weird phase where I'm trying to not push more paper too many new papers out at the moment as as opposed to 
building the platform, which is actually very interesting to me because I'm learning a lot of software engineering. I'm working with very accomplished software engineers who, and I'm learning software engineering from them. And, and they often like, you know, try to be very nice at my design suggestions and not laugh too hard. And, <laughs> and that show me how the, they would do it and why it's better. And so it's, it's, it's a very fun thing for me to, to learn that. Um, as well as like, you know, uh, push a platform um, or, or a GitHub uh, or a tool, like, you know, to, and make it more mature. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And then, and then I'll, I'll probably swing back to more research, uh, researchy things in, in some time. Yeah, got it. And, uh, and Archive is all uh, open source, right? In fact, maybe one, someone can uh, post it in the chat later on. Yeah, yeah, um, I can post a link, but um, yeah, it's it's all on GitHub, Microsoft, uh, mm -hmm. slash github.com slash Microsoft slash Archai, A-R-C-H-A-I, and it's MIT licensed, and yeah, everything we do is there, and and in, in various branches, but we'll we'll merge into main. So, mm -hmm. great, yeah. All right, I guess, I guess we are over time, but uh, any any parting thoughts about anything we've discussed? Well, I would like to ask you, what are you excited about in, in, in NAS, uh, Colin? Because you are quite an accomplished NAS researcher yourself, an AutoML researcher. And what, what do you want, uh, are excited about right now? Um, yeah, one, uh, one, one thing I often say is uh, NAS plus HPO. So I guess uh, there, there's been so many papers on, on finding the best architecture for a given problem. But, uh, but typically, we... Typically, a lot of people have this assumption where all the hyperparameters are fixed, but uh, but actually, this is like quite a lot of bias in like what architectures will discover. For like uh, earlier, we were talking about um, about like uh, yeah, NAS finding some truly novel architecture, and maybe maybe these novel architectures like we need to change the learning rate a lot or the batch size a lot to get them to 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 outperform the state of the art techniques. So yeah, I think. This is a much harder problem, so maybe that's also why it hasn't been explored nearly as much. But this could be a very promising avenue for for the future. We'll chat, chat more offline because I think this is this is probably going to limit us, as you said, like you know, to what architectures we will. Because if our mm -hmm. optimizer just throw NANs just because the architecture is too weird and wonky, but it's it's, it's just that a different mm -hmm. optimizer would have optimized it perfectly, right? So we we might be like. Uh, somebody told me like a very senior ML person that the architectures we are discovering is probably co-adapting to SGD and its variants, right? So, so mm -hmm. we don't even know what we are leaving on the table. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, but uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for having me here. And I know we are over time and, and it was mm -hmm. really fun chatting with you. Yeah, th yeah, thank you. And thank you very much again for joining us. Uh, it was very fascinating session. Thanks, Colin. See All right. You. Yep. Thanks. <clears throat>